some people found this application weird, while some find it magical. However, the results can be controversial with uh, different people having different opinions about the technology. Deep learning, a sophisticated form of AI, can now be used to solve highly complex uh, problems such as human level control, big data uh, analytics uh, and computer vision. Deep learning has advanced to a level wherein creating software that can pose threats to national security and privacy, uh, this is likely possible. The deepfake algorithms, as you can see here on the slide, have the capability to create fake videos and images that make it difficult uh, for a human to determine whether it's real. Consumers need to be aware that fraudsters continue to leverage technology to steal data such as credentials, personal information or money by either attacking the victim's bank or communicating with the victim directly. Um, when we are faced with a video recording of an event, we can generally trust uh, that the event happened as shown in the video. But that may soon change or has already changed due to the deepfake videos that use machine learning technology to show a real person saying or doing things they haven't. This technology poses a particular threat to marginalized communities. If deepfakes cause society to move away uh, from the current seeing is be believing paradigm for video footage, that shift may negatively impact individuals whose stories society is already less likely to believe. What makes video so powerful? It's because seeing is believing. Two people might interpret a video two different ways, but they've generally been able to take for granted that the footage is true. And it is an accurate record of something that really happened. Analysis to date, mainly in the US, suggests that the spread of deepfake may also affect disadvantaged groups in two respects. Firstly, how much we can still believe video evidence, for example, about a crime. And secondly, how to de develop the media literacy of disadvantaged people not to believe everything they see. But let's look at a more positive development, and that is the NFT and the participatory art that is also discussed in today's conference. An NFT or non-fungible token is a digital asset that represents the ownership of, uh, of media, often digital illustrations, pictures or music. NFTs can represent real world items like artwork and real estate. NFTs are changing how art is bought and sold and giving digital artists the ability to monetize and authenticate their work. NFTs are designed to give you something that cannot be copied, ownership of the work, so the artist can still retain the copyright and reproduction rights just like physical artwork. To put it in terms of physical art collecting, anyone can buy a Monet print, for example, but only one person can own the original. With any sale in NFT, Buyers receive a digital certificate of authenticity on a blockchain. This proves ownership and preserves the artwork's provenance. Why is this interesting for marginalized groups? Last year, the Forbes magazine wrote even about the diversity, equity and inclusion potential of NFTs. Marginalized artists see NFTs as a financial solution because non-fungible tokens on the blockchain, these creators have control over the sale of their art and how it's distributed. In a sense, they, oh, they are a, they own agents and gallery owners as well. Traditional art spaces are notorious for being homogeneous, with US museum collections consisting of more than 80% white and uh, more than 90% uh, male artists. 
Through NFTs, a more diverse range of artists are able to gain exposure without having to, having to go through traditional gatekeepers. NFTs are providing an opportun opportunity for diverse artists to make a living from their art. A gallery owner in Miami uh, said that we shouldn't be afraid of technology. The more diversity there's in the early NFT space, the more potential there will be historically marginalized communities to close socio socioeconomic gaps. Art is meant to reflect the time that the artist is creating in. And if in our current society there's a lot of virtuality going on, a lot of technology, we need to embrace that because of the future. With close to 300,000 subscribers on her YouTube channel, Nath Fianzas has be become one of Brazil's best known black social media influencers by teaching personal finance to people who, like her, come from low income backgrounds. On Instagram, Ana Paula Sanzani has amassed more than 200,000 followers by talking about everything from talking uh, racism to fashion. And with over 2 million followers, Bianca Santos is a huge success on TikTok, where she provides makeup tips, for example, with people with darker, uh, for people with darker skin. Influencer communities have revolutionized representation for marginalized groups, giving them, when done well, a direct and authentic voice. Influencers brand everyday personal content with marketing communications, producing advertisements deeply intertwined with everyday lives as lived. Originating from ostensibly do-it-yourself media practices, influencer economies have gradually formalized. The proto-influencers practices included mom bloggers founding advertising networks and flash and bloggers attending runway shows to lend hipster credibility to high fashion houses. The wider influencer ecology, ecology now includes TikTokers who are the latest platform dependent creators to ink deals with big brands. And when it comes to diversity and inclusion, what is and isn't said often sets the tone within social media communities. Brands and their influencers are in a unique position to contribute towards diversity and equality online. It can be not only an effective way to marginalized groups to represent their group, but it can also benefit companies. With the help of EDI influencers, those brands can market to more niche groups, build effective, inclusive marketing campaigns and reach a wider audience. An essential element of the large AMES project was the Roma Cultural Influencer Training initiated by Professor Carpati and by Corvinus University of Budapest. The Roma Influencer Training is innovative in many ways. By bringing the opportunities and benefits of visual education to a digital platform, it gives young people from disadvantaged backgrounds the chance to strengthen their community and identity by showcasing their culture and reaching out effectively to their peers. This and other social changes brought about by art will be discussed in today's conference session. Finally, with respect and gratitude, I thank Professor Andrea Carpati and her colleagues for their persevering work, for coordinating the MS Research Community and for the opportunity to host you here today at the Corvinus University of Budapest. I wish you a meaningful conference with new results and a forward-looking perspective. Thank you very much. Now it will. OK, so thank you very much for being here. And may I ask our first AMAS presenter group, the University of Lapland, 
to come forward and bring the presentation. And let me use this one of you who want to come, please come. Or many of you, uh, Amna Kereshi is going to present. And let me use this opportunity in terms of our virtual uh, audience, so to say, to greet most cordially our chief investigator, Professor Satu Mietinen, Dean at uni the University of Lapland, and our, yes, and hello, Satu. I don't know how you see me. And most cordially, from Australia, uh, seeing us, Melanie Sarantu, the best research manager ever. <laughs> yes. yes, hi to both of you. We are sorry you're not with us and hope to see you at later events. And now let me give the floor to the University of Lapland. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having us here. It was such a, I think my mic is going to be, is it fine? Do you, okay. So thank you so much again for your warm welcome. And it is a pleasure to be here in person and really thankful to be a part of this project. And I've like, you know, met such nice people here due to this project. So, and also I want to um, pass on um, Tatu's greeting to everyone here. Unfortunately, she was not able to join us due to some uh, health issues, but um, I'm sure she will be following up with the recordings and everything. So, but the ULAP team is here and a few of them are also online. So we'll just get started and we will talk about the Northern stories and the outcomes from the Amas experiments. And I will specifically talk about the experiment, which was named as Engaging Youths Through visuals in context of visual literacy. So since the Amas project serves as a basis of uh, for the discovery of uh, margins and the challenges in the various European regions, um, I argue that the field of visual literacy among children and uh, youths uh, has not been well studied and uh, also what tools and what uh, kind of methods um, can be employed to refine this form of literacy. And uh, this experiment was implemented in the Finnish Lapland uh, in the beginning of the year 2021 and up till now. And it is also um, still an ongoing research. So um, the gist of the experiment is uh, stated in this um, direct quote. Uh, it is a publication from one of the research cycles uh, mainly on understanding the concept of visual literacy and how it can serve in the terms of formal or, or informal uh, learning. I can read it out. Um, visual literacy can serve as a powerful tool in helping young people to develop their creativity and mental flexibility, which can facilitate their growth as expressive and creative thinkers. So in the beginning of the experiment, uh, the target population was mainly only youth, but then we realized that it was important to see uh, the gradual development uh, that has been like, you know, that has taken place uh, during their growth. Uh, so the young children were also studied in the later stages of this uh, research. And as you can see, the experiment was divided into four research cycles and the participants and the given age and the gender. Um, though I believe that this is still a small amount of um, uh, population that has been covered or targeted in this uh, research until now, but um, since it is an ongoing research, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there gradually, step by step maybe. And all these research cycles that you see, uh, one of them is published and the rest of them are forthcoming publications, uh, which I will discuss in further slides. And for methodology, uh, having phenomenology as the guiding philosophical approach, um, the study utilizes this uh, arts-based research strategy by using arts-based methods such as mandala making, uh, art installations, uh, workshops, um, note-taking, interviews, 
uh, for different kind of a data collection. And as an analytical approach, the research developed and tested various framework based on the attributes of the creative processes. So, yeah, among the case studies uh, conducted in this experiment, uh, which specifically focused on the Finnish youth's uh, visual literacy in Rovinami, uh, which is um, indicated the necessity of having an arts based um, learning in formal and informal education. And it was found that the youth services provided by the city offered many opportunities for the inclusion and well-being of the young people, but they lack uh, this uh, aspect of art involvement from the visual literacy's perspective. So, um, the following research questions emerged. I think I need to just, yeah. Um, the first one was, can visual literacy in youth uh, enhances mental imagery, visualization, interpretation and problem solving. And the second most important research question that emerged was that how can visual thinking contribute to the meaning making processes of the young children and youths? So there were four vital uh, research outcomes that uh, were identified. The first one was that Yes, we, visual literacy is an important form of literacy and that children and young adults uh, need to be encouraged to learn and to develop throughout their various learning settings and stages because it fosters introspection. Then the second was that in addition to enhancing creativity, um, it was also established that the progressive arts based collaborative processes, they can facilitate idea sharing and um, uh, understanding among the youths. The third outcome was uh, also seen that the empowering youths, uh, that they, it, it actually empowered the youths to engage in social innovation through creative processes, and it can also help them become positive agents of change in the society. And the fourth outcome was about the reflections. Uh, the reflections shared by the children and the youths demonstrated the need to supplement formal and informal learning uh, with with an open dialogue and the reflections also assisted in um, expressing the content of one's imaginative expressions so moving on to the research cycles i can explain one by one what was achieved and what was done in each research cycle in the first one, which was called, which was titled Meaning Making and Interpretation through personal mandalas in the context of visual literacy. So basically, this study explored uh, the significance of uh, creative freedom and self-expression through the artworks uh, produced in a workshop under the theme called visual literacy again. And the focus in this research cycle was to illustrate the youth's uh, perception, interpretation and meaning making. Uh, that can stimulate their creative thinking. So they were, they draw, they drew this, these personal mandalas. The second research cycle was titled Documentation of Reflective and Interpretive Representation of Youth. It is a study through rudimentary photographic close ups in the context of visual literacy. And this provided to be the most um, you can say valuable part of the research because it provided tangible ideas for how to use interpretive and reflective processes to refine your creativity. And it also confirmed um, that such introspective creative uh, processes generate powerful emotional experiences, guiding the manner of seeing and thinking and ultimately uh, leading to awareness and a sense of self just through these photographs. So the third research cycle was titled Flags, uh, Shared Horizon. And uh, OK, so this installation was made by the youths in the Agora Hall of the University of Lapland uh, right after the COVID restrictions were lifted to some extent. <laughs> and the word flag was used as a metaphor uh, that um, looks beyond the obvious challenges that the youth, uh, the youth faced during the pandemic, and it helped them portray their diverse understanding of he, uh, of hope, of fear, of their needs, of what they want to do in the future. Uh, 
So this R space method open up a new horizon for them. That's why it's called flag uh, shared horizon. And the objective of this workshop was to um, provide these youth with the knowledge about pluralism and how to apply it in their redesign thinking skills. And the fourth research cycle war is about improving children's visual literacy by fostering visual design thinking through our space methods, and it has also been displayed in the next hall, uh, these mandalas. Well, uh, in this research cycle, 16 children uh, between the ages of 10 and 12 participated in a summer workshop uh, conducted in the University of uh, Lapland with the help of the collaboration of the Faculty of Art and Design and the Faculty of Education. And uh, the participants were asked to share uh, their reflections on their experiences of making um, mandalas using objects uh, found in nature. And through these art space methods, the study um, provided a better understanding of the need to integrate visual design thinking uh, with the art space methods uh, to assess the children's existing visual literacy and determine that what can be done to facilitate it further. So basically, <laughs> so visual literacy inspired um, art space methods and that can help achieve new paradigms, I think, in in educational policy making, especially when it comes to the STEAM models. So that was something uh, to think about, to work on further and find more solutions. And to conclude, uh, youths of the city of Rovaniemi uh, can become more creative through frequent uh, engagement with the visual literacy. That that was the that was really found. And although this experiment was conducted only in this specific region of Europe, but I think it can be adapted in other parts of your uh, European regions to to analyze and interpret youth's creative expression. So and I need and I end my presentation with <laughs> in eight different languages. I hope I got it wrong, right. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. <laughs> Kaina Kostio is going to present yeah. with a work by Slatu Mietinen and herself. So uh, I'm Taina Kontio and I'm an artist in Amas and uh, I've been working with Slatu Mietinen, Professor Slatu Mietinen from Lapland University for quite a while now. And I'm sorry to Miss Satu for here in here that she is not uh, commenting. She has all this research side of knowledge and papers and everything. And uh, but we'll go with this. So I have uh, more of an arts side of approach. And let's see, yeah, I can go further. That's where we started. We started to work with Melanie Sarantu, Professor Melanie Sarantu, and with Sato Metin and with the Sun Youth in South Africa. We were designing the futures uh, with the filmification. We, we used film methods and storyline methods. The link, link for the paper, Hero's Journey, is, uh, is here, but we won't get to, uh, get to it now. But that's, that was the starting point. And from designing the futures uh, with young people all over, also in uh, the Indian nation, in uh, states and in Australian Aboriginal people, we went to re-visualizing and reclaiming the past. It somehow seemed for us uh, logic <laughs> to come from future to the past. And the first trip, the first journey uh, for reclaiming and revisualizing re the past was to uh, Sami Nation, Tana River. 
And we traveled with Hanna Kutturm, who is a Sami research in Helsinki University. And she had uh, all the all her family came and participated. And we were talking about the river, about the connection to the river, Tana River, which uh, is situated in uh, North Norway uh, or in the border of Norway and Finland and used to be Sami. Uh, all, all of it used to be Sami and now it's kind of um, uh, they, they all the time now uh, have to um, uh, argue with the Finnish government of about the use of the river. The Tana River will, uh, flows to the Arctic Sea, and we also visited Arctic Sea. We were talking to people, swimming, and uh, retracing, and and starting to hear the Sami forefathers and maybe foremothers too. That was quite amazing. What happened really uh, when we stayed in touch with the Sami people and their impact on on this project was was really huge i think in this process uh, compared to the african process we scaled down we scaled down to listen more and and this term of rivering i will open up soon but uh, that's what we did uh, and I think it was uh, because of the COVID, of course, the scaling down. But also it seemed that after working very intensely with the big groups in Africa and United States, we loved this approach. So rivering <laughs> comes first from James Joyce, and it means to travel with the flow of waters, where the waters like meet and they travel together, moving in confluence, experience, experience in retreat alongside or upon the waters. And the um, politics of this Tana River was so, so big that all we really actually have to do the involve the people was to go and swim in it. That's only what it took. They came and they talk and it was really political. And uh, uh, I think the outcome uh, in uh, uh, Tana River was uh, interesting so that um, the Women came and they were glad that we swam because they were forbidden to, because it was um, too strong currents and too everything. The, it was really male dominated, the river. But the women came and sw swam with us. Even the children who never had swam in a Tana river before came to swim with us. So uh, what actually stayed in Otakoski community, I think it was the swimming and the women who took over reclaimed the river. And Hanna Guttorm, who uh, was working with us um, then on, um, wrote a paper also about the connection of earth in earth and waters of Sami people. That, that was a wonderful outcome of our first journey too. Then Pieta Kuttorm, Hannas, uh, for Hannas, uh, um, our old, um, I think it, Peta was Hannah's dad's grand, Hannah's granddad's 
uh, brother. Pieta also uh, came and wanted to share all the Sami history of the river, and that was really important for all the process for everybody who came to swim. Uh, I am uh, kind of um, putting here the method cycle from the perspective of arts here, and that's how we started with the seas and the rivers that we visited and at the, at the um, and also in archipelago uh, in Finnish archipelago and the northern rivers other rivers we started to discuss with the sea and the rivers so after that the discussion with women and the community came really naturally they came to us and we collected texts and we collected film and photographs reflecting the discussions on arts and performance. The performance art was our means. Uh, maybe after the swimming performances, somehow the performance art and the social action was our method from then on. We discussed and uh, collect stories. And then we took the visual information to other communities and starting over with the cycle. Uh, so there's a lot of film material, photo material, and there's a lot of uh, uh, performances that actually the community took on. They, they also performed and this is Finnish archipelago, the photograph of the, of the performance that is based on the story of the female Viking warrior's grave. That was an important story in Vanna uh, archipelago, as uh, that was a small fishing community where we worked and the women also uh, in that community uh, uh, didn't identify so much only for themselves but they ad identified through the fishing men the male who fished for fishing <laughs> sorry for my english i hope the right terms but anyways that that was interesting that after our performances the women and the community have changed the identity of the community in Vana Island. It is no longer uh, identified as a fishing community as there is also no longer so much fishing but it's the women um, they um, became to uh, make become uh, became to introduce arts and now they have, have an art gallery and uh, they have a small art community and they talk about the identities more so the outcome was quite wonderful in Vana archipelago and now we go back to the river and uh, this is a uh, this is one of the uh, of the swimming performances and one of the stories underneath uh, is uh, what came out. Uh, there, there was um, a mom who became a river and very, very many uh, stories about how female, uh, how the river was identified as female. So the identification of the river also changed up in Tana River. Here's Pieta Kuturm and uh, one who ruled <laughs> the rivers, the elderly Pieta is now gone and we he he was 90 when we were filming and performing he told about the river how, 
how it was ruled before, and he was the postman who traveled up and for the river. There were no roads, and he said that he was glad there were no roads because only Sami people could and knew how to travel the rivers. So the Finns could not get in unless the Sami took them in. So Pieta remembered that time and he, he said that it was a good time. But he was really friendly with us and he uh, helped Hanna in all of her reclaiming efforts, took her to Seita places. Seita is a, a place where Sami people worship nature. And even though he he was really old, old already at the time and tired, see he took us all around. And the Arctic explorers uh, were the next next step from for our journey. We were revisualizing personal and common histories, and we took our fathers and grandfathers gear because they were adventurers. We we saw we tried the gear on and we. We uh, tried to find the uh, adventurous size of us. We we wanted to change the uh, male explorer's image. And we explored at the backyards. But at that time, when we were filming with Satu, this is Satu Mietinen, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and Melanie Sarantu too, it was uh, 30 degrees below zero. And we were <laughs> exploring the backyards and the big lake Narvajärvi also. And uh, I think this uh, is also a photo that tells a lot of where we come from. And I, I also feel that now that um, I'm in Hungary. I'm I'm like a polar bear. <laughs> I'm really suffering. <laughs> that, that's the habitat where I live. So, so I I mean I love Budapest. I have been been here before, and I I love Hungarian people. But but the heat is not for my metabolism. That's where I roam. And and the results of of this um, second exploration was was really this explorer photography and the identities of uh, former explorers that were then uh, uh, changed to female explorers. We have a lot of photography of it. And here is also Satu and Melanie. And the gear that Melanie is actually um, wearing here, the belt is my grandfather's main reindeer's belt. All the big knives and everything that we wear is, is our heritage. This, this was in Narvajärvi and really 30 degrees below zero. <coughs> we, um, me and Satu, <laughs> we were uh, uh, in, in this deep lake, in the lake and it was, the snow was like meter, meter deep. And this is the situation where Satu just lied down and said that I can <laughs> because I will sink in the snow and I'm thinking at this point how, how will I ever get her out of there. But uh, this uh, photography, photo, photos were then uh, uh, mixed with 
photos of Andre Explorer, Andre August, a Swedish explorer who tried to reach the North Pole with the uh, air balloon. And uh, his uh, 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 journey explore, exploring a career was tragic in a way that he never did. All, the, all of them actually died in uh, uh, Spitsbergen, Norway. But the photos were found after after that. The, that was 18, uh, uh, in the 1880 something that they tried to reach the North Pole. And so we uh, connected the photos to the male explorers. Faith. We touched something there. I think we touched something. The revisualizing the history was an important part. This is Melanie and also 25 below zero. Uh, they were supposed to also uh, film um, in uh, outside, but it was so cold for the ladies that they went on and filmed the female spaces in sauna. <laughs> Very good decision, I think. And these photos are uh, taken and this project, sauna project and the female spaces is Satu Miettinen's work. And I was hoping that she would she would be with us commenting on them. So I'm sorry not to have any comment on on the sauna photography, but you can see some of them there and the sauna project. I think you will hear later on then uh, of the outcome. Uh, is there something that you want to ask or? Discuss. If, you're, if your talk is over, then I invite everybody to put questions. We are all teachers, so you can yell. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, moreover, we can also uh, give you the microphone. I ask An Amna, please come to the stage because we are going to ask questions about both presentations that we heard from the University of Lapland from Amna and Taina. Yes, so um, whoever. Yes, please, Sophia. Yeah, good question. So uh, repeat yeah. the question. Yeah, well, uh, I think the, um, the male community uh, from the history already that that was long long time ago that the river was so strong that's that that the current was so strong that the women and the children were denied to go to the river and the explanation from Pieta we asked that and why why don't you swim that that was the only explanation that we really got that it was too dangerous but they were really glad to start swimming. <laughs> and uh, then the other question was about the Finnish government. What, uh, what they, do they, what they want, want to, to do with the river. The river. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, um, they uh, are trying to, uh, um, sorry, and <laughs> uh, protect the fish, uh, fish, the salmon. And in protecting the salmon, they are denying, denying the Sami indigenous rights for the fish. And that's, that's the battle that's been really ongoing and really political in this river. Still now, very recently, another legislation came for that. Good questions. Thank you. Thank you for your. Thank you for your answer. Does it work now? Thank you. <laughs> I pressed it.
Kálmán egy picit tegyél a Kálmán. Kálmán egy picit tegyél a kettesbe. Egy, kettő. Nem, nem, it's working. It was so touching the heart, your presentations, both of you. When we started a project, me coming from education and science, I thought, well, indigenous populations, do we have them? Do we still have them? Or are our Roma, the gypsies in Czech, uh, Czech Republic in ourselves, yeah. Yeah, are they considered indigenous? Well, anyway, they are in danger. So yeah. uh, I'm very happy that we could see how you shared the rights and rituals of yeah. these people. And speaking of rights and rituals, Anna, I would like to ask you who your population was, who did the mandalas? How were they on the margins or not? Actually, uh, I did um, explain this in the recent cycle. There were like four different recent cycles. And each research cycle uh, focused on specifically starting from the youth. And then later on, we realized that we can't just do research only on the youth and that's not until we know the background that how did they actually evolve and how uh, they, the visual literacy was added in them through their early uh, learning or education. So that was the point. So basically the youth and the young children. I know, yes, were they on the margins? Um, in Rovinami, yes, because of the fact that uh, I did some research, um, the uh, city council, they do uh, teach and they do give some opportunities for art education and everything. But from the perspective of visual literacy, it was a little under margin and that was found in the research. And that's what we are, I am trying to do. I'm trying to speak up louder. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, OK, thank you. So in your case, it was art education, really, that yes. was in on the margin. Yes. And this is an interesting uh, new take on the on the Amas problem that art education as such and the arts as part of our existence, they are marginalized, being marginalized in Hungary. Uh, the um, students aged 17 and 18 don't have compulsory or optional art instruction starting September. And of course, we are outraged because these are the two years, 17 and 18, when many of them choose professions, will use visual literacy as future engineers, medical scientists or whatever. And at school, there will be no art instruction, not even optional. So yes, yep. art education is being marginalized. Yep. Well, mm -hmm. I thank you both. Any more questions from the audience? Yes, Mari, please shout. The rivering comes. I'm sorry, I, I, I do have, have the reference, but I don't have it here. And it's it's quite old writing. The rivering. It is also the term that is used otherwise. Not only choice, but but that's that's the first. I think he was the first kind of use it publicly. The river term rivering. Yes. Excellent yeah. question, though. I'll I'll find it for you. <laughs> we should we should have. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And you are in a city divided by river, oh, by yeah. the river Danube. Yeah. Yes. And it defined the fate of the city on the Buddha side. That was those, always the living quarters and and the rich and rich and richer people uh, housing estates and villas and nice quarters, while Pest was the financial part, the industrial part and the ghettos. Here where we are in the ninth district is one of the biggest Roma or gypsy ghettos of the city and the most expensive apartments on the Danube embankment including the Ludwig Museum of Contemporary Art, the Bartow Concert Hall, 
the National Theatre, all of them here, and the ghettos, and river is flowing by. I could see someone raising a hand, Marion Stalzaha, or one of the reviewers of the Avas book. We are very pleased to, to, to see you here, Marion. Um, and you're getting a microphone now. I would like just to point out what Andrea says to, said to you, Amna. Isn't there an another possibility for the young people to do arts or to um, increase their creativity outside your research project? Is that really a fact that um, arts education is marginalized? Do you understand uh, what I mean? It's about art education for your girls. Which for your girls, yes. yes. I don't know if it works, yes, but... It was heard. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, the bot. Receive art education. Yeah, Some the, the children. The, the children the, with whom? Not children, yes. but yeah. yeah, yeah. The children with whom you did the mandalas. Yes, exactly. So basically, what we tried to do was in the last research cycle that there were like 16 children actually, and boys and girls and everyone. So uh, we just tried to see that since art education is not really um, taught from the perspective of visual literacy again i'm repeating it again and again because this is the, the the gist of the experiment itself so we just wanted to see that which level they are on already and how it can be um, uh, seen from their perspective and when we see that how do they see and through their eyes you know how we can um, make it much better for them and how we can make it how, how we can facilitate it further in uh, you know in her in their learning settings so there was something yeah. which we tried yeah. to do <laughs> so no formal art education but informal In enhancement was given by the amas project yeah. okay thank you university of lapland team and let me invite to the stage the university of malta team the presenters and thank you for for your work and while they are coming up and starting their presentations, I tell you whom we are going to hear. Rafael Vela, who is professor and senior investigator for the University of, Lap of Malta team for Amas. We have Isabel Gatt, who is senior uh, researcher and uh, Milos Rykov, Associate Professor and Marguerite Poulet, senior researcher too for the Amas project, a very colorful team. My, um, my colleague Milos Rykov, an assessment specialist, and we have artists, theatre artists like Isabel, and we have educators of art teachers, teachers of teachers, mentoring teachers. So this, this group represents Amas really well, and let me then give the floor to you. I don't switch off this mic because now it's working. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, good morning. Um, so uh, as Andrea said, we are going to speak about the uh, projects which were carried out in Malta. I will uh, start by talking about two of these projects and then my colleague Isabel will talk about three others. And then my colleague uh, Milos will be talking about the evaluation of these projects. And finally, uh, Margarita will be talking about the management and the different issues involved in managing projects of this sort. Um, so as I said, we had five experiments in Malta. They were very different from each other. There was a big variety in, in relation to the types of participants uh, who uh, we worked with and also a variation in relation to the artistic disciplines which we use and also the different data collection strategies which we use which were qualitative quantitative and also arts based so let me start but with the first one, the first one was called Suitable Citizens. This is a project which I led myself with the support of three other artists who helped me out. The title actually comes from the Maltese Citizenship Act, uh, which states amongst the criteria for eligibility for Maltese citizenship that uh, anyone who wants to apply for Maltese citizenship uh, needs to be a suitable citizen. So one of the questions we were asking was what makes you suitable or what possibly makes you unsuitable. Uh, 
Uh, but on a more uh, kind of research side, uh, the main research question we were asking was how can a participatory art project help migrants in Malta integrate better in society? So as you can see, we're working with uh, migrants, especially you know, sub-Saharan um, uh, migrants uh, in Malta from different countries. We used uh, a number of different methods, uh, like uh, well, from the arts perspective, we use photography, screen printing, also sewing and then stenciling and other uh, media as well, but then we used also interviews, focus groups and uh, other methodology. And uh, amongst the outcomes, um, uh, we could see that, for example, many of the participants were happy to discuss issues like barriers, which they face on a regular basis uh, related to, you know, being being a migrant. But perhaps more importantly, they were interested in learning new skills which could lead to more employment perhaps or better employment possibilities. We also saw uh, that uh, the project helped them to develop critical and creative thinking skills. This slide shows the kind of cycle which we went through, uh, starting from the top uh, left where you see that the migrants were recruited by an NGO which helped us out and then uh, we had a pre-test and then it was followed by a focus group. And then they took photos, the participants took uh, photos, which we then discussed in a photo voice uh, exercise. Throughout the workshops, we were asking the participants for feedback about the workshop uh, itself and about the photos they were taking. Um, the artist and myself, we were keeping journals throughout the workshop so that we could take note of everything which was going on. At the end of the sixth session, we had a kind of uh, fashion show, but we also had a post test because uh, in the beginning we were planning to have six sessions uh, only, but then this was extended uh, eventually. Uh, and then we decided to take some of the things which were produced, like masks and scarves, and give them to local friends of ours who wore them and then put photos of themselves on Facebook so that we could see what kind of feedback we would get. And at the end, we added, as I said uh, a minute ago, some extra sessions in stenciling, and this led to uh, an exhibition, um, in fact, more than one exhibition. I'm going to show you some photos over here. So this was the beginning, a focus group. And as you can see on the table where uh, he is actually drawing, so in the focus group, we told him you can speak, uh, but you can also write your responses and you can also draw your responses. And these were a few of the different responses we got in the in initial uh, focus group. Then we went to photography, so they were taught basic, you know, photographic techniques like composition, light and so on using their mobile phone. These were some of the photos. We had, of course, hundreds of photos in all and we analyzed the photos. I can't uh, speak about the analysis here because we don't have time, but some of the photos show that they had a kind of cultural aspect or even a personal uh, significance. Then we went to uh, the class in screen printing and here this um, my colleague, uh, an artist who specializes in screen printing and she was uh, teaching them here how to uh, screen print and then moving on here we see them uh, the first um, sort of experiments with screen printing on paper in the beginning and this was another one showing uh, one of the results. But then we decided to go a step further and we started printing on uh, fabric. Here you can see these tote bags which were created by the participants. We went into sewing as well and here they are sewing like masks which they produce but also you know scarves. The whole project was documented by another participant. This is a, a person called Major from Eritrea and we trained him in filmmaking and he was documenting the, the whole project. So we taught him how to use uh, his mobile iPhone to take a video and then also uh, basic uh, video editing skills and also interviewing skills. So this video which he produced, which is like a 10 minute video, uh, is basically seen from his own perspective and he is also the narrator in this in this video. And as I said, then we also had this uh, stenciling towards the end, which led to this big kind of teamwork where all the participants basically put their stencils together to create one single three meter tall piece. Some conclusions, uh, the participants views of the project and of socially engaged art in general uh, improved. So we could see that from the pre and the, the post uh, test. The improvement of their artistic skills also helped the participants to become more creative as well and also more confident. And also they understood that, oh, I can use art to make a statement 
or to make a political statement if they wanted to. And when we started to analyze the responses we got about uh, citizenship from the participants, but also from the local uh, participants on Facebook, um, their, their definitions of uh, citizenship had nothing to do with nationality, but it was more about civic engagement. And here I just included this one uh, quote from one of our participants, a suitable citizen is someone who works well, a person with good moral values, a sociable person, someone who works in a team, an active person. So that was the first project. The second project uh, was led by an artist, uh, Christina Borch, visual artist who works on socially engaged projects uh, quite regularly, and it was called Batman Xirian, which means Batman from Xira. Xira is a small town uh, in Malta, which unfortunately has suffered quite a lot in recent years from overdevelopment. So as you can imagine, in this project, we were dealing with this issue with overdevelopment uh, and how public space is sometimes, you know, exploited by private contractors for greed, you know, for money. And we were asking how can residents, uh, because the residents were the main participants in this project, in a town become activists for environmental change and sustainability. And again, we used arts based methods. We also used interviews. The workshops in this case were quite long focus groups. We had an audience survey and also other forms of uh, assessment outcomes. A few I'm, I'm listing over here. Uh, the creative output actually reflects uh, the participants own views because this was a completely you know, participant led project. They also came up with ideas for guerrilla actions. I'll show you a few photos soon, um, which they actually implemented. And the arts-based research produced results that clearly indicated that participants developed skills. As I said earlier with the um, Suitable Citizens project, once they started to develop artistic skills, they learned how to make a kind of statement or political statement using those artistic skills. This is a cycle again, which shows a similar cycle. They were recruited by an NGO starting top uh, left. Um, and then we also chose a community venue because uh, we, felt, we felt it's really important that they feel at home, like we are actually in Xira doing this project. There was a pre-test assessment. There was a focus group uh, with photo voice as well. Um, then they actually started to plan these guerrilla actions. What can we do to make people, you know, aware of that? You know, we're not happy about this. Um, and then after the workshops at the end, they had a post test uh, assessment with participants and also an audience survey with the passers by. And finally, we had this really very beautiful public performance over a weekend in which the public could participate. And I'm going to show you some images. Obviously, in the beginning, uh, we could only begin online for obvious reasons. So that's Christina Boyd, you can see over there. And uh, they were making their statements and showing them on Zoom. Um, and then they could meet eventually. This is the the community venue. You can see Christina there in the middle with the residents who were basically meeting and talking. Sometimes the residents also brought things. In this case, they, they were fishermen, so they brought things which they used to do in the past and perhaps they can't do anymore because of the uh, you know exploitation of the seafront. Um, they, even, they were asked to mention uh, a list of things which they like about their town and also things which they don't like about their town. They also created these journals. So as they were basically, you know, in the workshops talking, uh, they, they would actually add or, you know, text or drawings. They took photos and these photos then led to an analysis, a photo voice session. So here they were asked to take photos of things they like or perhaps things related to the senses, things you like to see or things you like to smell. So restaurants, for example. Um, then this was one of the guerrilla actions, uh, which I mentioned before. So they created these uh, posters, which they hung up, especially on building sites. These were hung really early in the morning so that the builders wouldn't be there. And obviously someone secretly alerted the press so that we would surely have uh, you know, publicity about this. So the press came running, you know, taking photos to have it in the papers. And then this was the performance. And during the performance, members of the public could participate. They were all asked to wear hard hats uh, because it's dangerous to walk around the streets in Xira. You know, stones can fall on your head. So everyone was walking. People were looking at us like, what, what the hell is going on over here? And as the people walked in the streets, then participants would jump out sometimes from behind the wall with placards like money, 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 you know, like uh, so. Uh, to show that oh, this is only about making money. You know, they're taking away our land. They're taking away uh, the places we normally use to enjoy this play, you know, a town with our families. Then 
the participants, uh, sorry, the, the members of the public could go in a Maltese uh, traditional boat in the sea. And when they were out at sea, there was this surprise. Synchronized swimmers came out of the sea and they did a performance. Uh, so this was actually one of the highlights of the event where these synchronized swimmers uh, kind of made this performance for the sake of the members of the, pu of the public. Some conclusions, uh, unfortunately, well, we didn't really change politics <laughs> with this because obviously the building is still going on very, very strong. But I think Batman Zirian was very important because unlike other environmental art we've seen in Malta, this one was over a very long period of time. It was researched, so it combined arts based action with academic research. Um, last point, research shows that um, yes, that you have to really pay attention. I think it is really important to pay attention to what the town means to the people themselves. And in this case, what we noticed is that the seafront is extremely important for the participants. So policy needs to take note of the relevance of open shared spaces in people's lives and also the possibility of using an event like this, like Batman Zirian, to reinforce a sense of community. I will now invite Isabel to speak about the theatre projects which we had in um, Amas. Thank you, Rafael. Um, and from Batman Xirian, which actually had a lot of theatre in it, uh, we will be. I will be speaking about the three uh, theatre experiments, strictly theatre, uh, which we did with three varied communities. Um, the the data we collected was both qualitative and quantitative. Um, the sorry the. We also had three different communities whom we worked with. Um, Opening Doors was a group of variably abled young adults. We had a group of HIV positive people, persons, and uh, six home dwelling senior women. So very varied communities that each experiment we worked with in each experiment. So I will start talking about Isidratatin, which means the fig tree. The target participants uh, for this group were um, person, young adults uh, with learning disabilities with an interest in dance, performance and music. So they already are involved in the arts. The objectives um, was the development of their skills, policy making and change of attitudes in society. So the research questions were, can participation in theatre empower young people with learning difficulties in advocating for greater inclusion and autonomy in society? Can engaging a mixed ability cast and crew in a theatre production on stage and backstage increase awareness of the abilities and capabilities of people with learning difficulties. And lastly, can co-creation in theatre lead to more inclusivity and tolerance in audiences? So Isidro Latin is an inclusive theatre piece. The process was such that through the discussions, movement and creative writing workshops with the director, Tony Attard, the two guest actors who joined the Opening Doors team and the playwright Simone Spiteri, they would come up with a production collectively created. The script and choreography was devised to interpret um, the artist's own dreams as being like the roots of a tree, of a tree that grow. Um, so through that grow under the earth. Through movement and dramatic scenes, the performers shared their own stories, very personal stories, their aspirations with the audience. Each performer's voice comes through the co-creation, which was both powerful and moving to the audiences. The process provided performers with a creative space that empowers them to take ownership of their work and the process. The guest artists integrated through the process. They weren't the protagonists. The protagonists were 
the young people from opening doors. Such experiences are very profound for all the participants, so including the professionals. So the research revealed that the performance promoted an increased understanding of the issues related to the life of people with intellectual disabilities for both participants and the audiences. The participants reported increased self-confidence, feelings of autonomy and happiness, and expressed the need for more mixed ability theater performances of this kind, particular, particularly for young audiences. Participants want to be seen and heard and not remain invisible. So the performance put through the participants' concern about the infantilization of people with intellectual disabilities, the fact that employment or sexuality are not discussed openly. There is this frustration at overprotection and belittlement of serious relationships, which do not allow space for serious conversations. And now I will move on to the next production which we worked on. This was Il Positivi in English. It's the positive people. So um, the objectives were to communicate accurate knowledge about HIV, reduce knowledge gaps and misconceptions, and help audiences empathize with HIV positive people. So the target participants were people living with HIV in Malta. It wasn't the people with HIV who were the actors, but the information was gathered through the conversations with these people. So the objectives were to the development of attitudes, policy making, increasing knowledge around HIV prevention and management. So the research questions were, how can socially engaged arts projects expand knowledge and influence attitudes towards those living with HIV? It's important to say that in Malta, there's still a very strong stigma against, against people who, who have HIV or are HIV positive. How can representation in the arts empower those living with or at risk of HIV in learning about the condition? So these, those were the, quest, the research questions. Il Positivi was inspired by true stories shared by research participants during anonymous interviews conducted as part of the AMAS research project. The play sheds light on six characters, six very diverse characters whose lives have all been affected by HIV. The playwright Simon Bartolo managed to create characters and the riveting story based on the characters and the real life situations of those researched. Anonymity was highly important due to the fact that, as I already said, there is still much ignorance and prejudice about the subject locally, about HIV positive people. The play dealt with important issues and was highly informative in an extremely entertaining way. Few people living with HIV in Malta have publicly disclosed, disclosed their status or speak about the subject, underlining their fear of being alienated or discriminated against for having the condition. This is Tony Attard, the director of the performance, who went into this project heart and soul, literally, and uh, came up with a very good production, which made people think, the audience think. One of the actors is actually an activist and a professional actor. He is the only one who puts his face out in Malta to speak about issues of H HIV positive people, the issues that they face. So research highlighted the effectiveness of theater as a medium to communicate accurate knowledge about HIV, reduce knowledge gaps and misconceptions and help audiences 
empathize with HIV positive people. In this way, it helped demystify HIV and the stigmatization impacting the lives of HIV positive people. So the analysis of the mixed metadata revealed that the arts are perceived to be to be an effective medium to contribute to the promotion of the rights of persons affected with by HIV. So various people in the audience reported they found it extremely emotional. I was in the audience and I saw a lot of people with tears in their eyes at the end of it. The research also showed a very high level of expectations and significant potential for theatre to contribute to the improvement or mitigation of some of the issues that marginalised members of the community face. The study is also expected um, to help develop artistic performances that advocate for the rights of persons living with HIV, which was one of the um, studies objectives. I will now move on to the last uh, of, of our projects. This was a project I was very much involved in. It's called Hakatain, which in English is would be translated in the blink of an eye. So the people I worked with, women, were aged between 65 and 86, and the objectives were um, the development of skills, development of attitudes, increase to increase well-being, and increase inclusion of senior citizens. So the research questions were, how can theatre advocate for the rights of older people? And how can work that is co-created with older people affect their own well-being? And can theatre have an impact on people's attitudes towards ageist discrimination? So these are the six women we worked with. Um, there's Doris from top left, Josephine, Polly, Gloria, Carmena and Grace. One of these six actually passed away since. Uh, these are the six citizens who signed up for the theatre journey through collective theatre processes. The participants were the protagonists in this process and the artist researchers wanted to listen to their stories, their needs, their hopes, their wishes, their regrets. Remember this was during a time of Covid so it was very important to talk about hope. The drama activities offered a space for the participants to tell the stories they wished to share and share their fears and hopes with the facilitators. And there was a scriptwriter taking notes. Eventually, two young male professional actors, uh, sorry, eventually one young actor joined. We, we did try to get more male actors, professional actors to join in, but they were scared during COVID times to join in. We only found one young male actor, not the women. They were not scared at all. OK, so the stigma to combat in this um, experiment was ageism. And here is a snapshot of the of the cycle um, for this project. It was meant to be six weeks. It lasted much longer because we had there was there was COVID lockdown at one point. Um, so but still we did these um, with a break in between for during lockdown when the script was written. So the first two weeks, there were two twice weekly week, uh, weekly meeting. Um, and this was for the data collection for, for the script to recreational dramatic activities uh, such as icebreakers, team building exercises, improvisation and storytelling. The third week, we increased that to um, three days a week um, and then weeks four to six we started meeting daily it was very intensive the way we worked with these people and we became very close to them in fact so every morning we would start off with mindfulness exercises very important for everyone but especially so as you're growing older and all the team would take part including the script writer um, uh, the musician, whenever they weren't doing anything else, they would join. It was also a team building exercise. And these were followed by physical warm up 
and breathing and vocal exercises. We were giving them these skills and they we recommended that they do these daily, even when we didn't meet. Um, and then we moved on to reminiscing. Um, we asked them to bring personal objects that told stories, stories about their past, which they wouldn't mind sharing, um, which they did. And then we also discussed how their life is now. We also shared our stories, how we felt, our opinions, whether we would prefer the past or the present. There was a lot of playing and singing along. These would be like traditional songs, Anna, for example, which is Maltese improvised song. And all these activities and sharing of stories help create a safe, trusting place, which is very important when working with such processes. A space to build a team, a space to experiment. Here, for example, you can see Sean Briffa, who was the professional uh, actor, um, improvising the story he wanted to tell. So literally acting it out. And there's Gloria on the left telling her story about this dress she got when she was 16 and which has accompanied her all through her life with different modifications for different occasions, occasions that she was invited at. Very luckily, she still wears the same size. <laughs> Um, so a script draft was based on what came up during the discussions and using some of the materials, literally their stories, nursery rhymes, the, so the songs they got, the participants brought with them. The morning rehearsals were very long and the breaks became shorter and shorter as they became working breaks during the last three weeks of rehearsal. Out of their own initiative, this really struck us. They also started meeting in the evenings after the morning rehearsals over Zoom to rehearse, all except Carmena, who, who is 86 and doesn't know how to use Zoom, but they would still rehearse with her over the phone. The point of this is that they felt responsible and wanted to make sure that no one would be left behind. There are also memory problems at this age. Um, we became very, very close. As I said, one of the people has passed away since she was going undergoing chemo treatment at the time and we all used to fuss over her especially when in the end um we we ended up having to film the productions because we were not allowed to do them in a theater which is what we wanted i mean theater is done to be made in a theater and not to be filmed but we filmed it specifically in a tv studio for the camera with lots and lots of takes and and then the editing and the post production of course so the positive outcomes, one very important positive outcome um, of this research was the intergenerational aspect. A young actor, a young musician, a young camera crew, practically all male, were a refreshing addition to the group and the process. Everybody would join in, as I said, in the work, in the warm ups and most of the exercises when they were not working on something else. And here in the, in the I think the image speaks for itself, the kind of rapport that was established between the younger um, crew and the actors, the participants. So the intergenerational and mixed gender collaboration was both welcome and beneficial to both the older and the younger generation. The younger generation, they were they were really shocked at some of the stories that they heard, like uh, the difficulties during war, for example and it makes them more sensitive and respectful towards their elders. So a meaningful rapport was established between the whole cast, crew, uh, cast and crew. Discussions sometimes went on after rehearsals. And a close knit, uh, a community of practice was created in the original sense of the term of Lava and Leven Wenger. Um, a group that shares a concern and a passion for something they do and learn how to do better as they interact regularly. So the media, this is a, a quote by Gloria, uh, um, uh, who was one during, during one of the focus groups. Um, she was one of the participants. She says, the media crew were so sweet and so patient with us. They seemed to find simple ways to help us with certain shortcomings, like getting the lines, which we knew so well, 
but kept, kept getting them wrong over and over again. Josette, the director, also. If we made a mistake, she always found the uh, ways of helping us. At no time did she ever lose her patience. I've learned a lot from her. Um, remember, these were people who had never been on, who had done a few skits on stage because they like theatre, but they definitely had never had lights on them and the camera pointed at them. So it was, it, you know, they were really covering new ground here. This is a quotation by Sean Briffa, who, who, is, who was a professional actor. They approached each, each exercise the director gave them with energy and willingness to work. I really enjoyed witnessing taking care of and helping each other in anything that came up. Some had personal issues, other had medical issues. In each case, the rest of the group did what they had to so no one gets left behind. There was this very strong sense of community, so no one gets left behind. Another impact was that mo most of part most participants reported was that they felt that the process had helped them reflect on their own worth, giving them self-confidence and new skills and being happy of being where they are and what have what they have achieved. The participants also reported that the process, which involved mindfulness, meditation and reflective exercises, also gave them more positive attitude towards aging as they practiced gratitude and lived the moment. To enhance group cohesion and teamwork gave them something to look forward to and a desire to, to do more similar experiences. The audience surveys, which Milos will speak about even more, um, next, um, revealed the need for such experiences for seniors and the need for more productions to combat ageism. I will now um, give over to Milos. Sorry. Uh, my name is Milos Reikov uh, and uh, I participated in this study as a research methodologist uh, responsible uh, responsible for uh, design uh, uh, of uh, the research uh, research methodology as well as uh, ethics uh, approvals provision of ethics approvals and final evaluation of uh, uh, collected uh, data. So. Uh, in brief, uh, this presentation will uh, include a brief uh, reminder of the main objectives of the AMAS uh, project, then uh, a summary of, of methodologies that were applied uh, in uh, five uh, testbed studies in Malta, and finally, uh, presentation of integrated uh, results of uh, our uh, studies. Uh, and this section is divided in four uh, groups, uh, outcomes, different uh, types of outcomes uh, related to cognitive, affective and social outcomes, as well as overall evaluation of the uh, all test bed uh, studies. Finally, uh, I will discuss some of limitations of uh, this study and provide a brief concluding uh, remarks. The main objectives, as you are very well aware, to address the marginalized positioning of some uh, European societies, groups and communities, and to apply uh, objective scientific uh, methods in evaluating uh, the outcomes of socially engaged arts. This approach is based on multidisciplinary methodology, as you uh, already noticed, uh, that was art based uh, in this, uh, in the five uh, testbed studies were always applied uh, arts-based methodology that uh, Rafael and Isabel uh, presented, uh, as well as objective uh, scientific methods uh, uh, 
uh, used in uh, sociology and uh, regularly used in sociology and uh, education. We also objective of collection of data and have the new evidence about social engaged art uh, had aimed to uh, create or contribute to new policy frameworks and uh, and to test field test uh, socially engaged art in contributing to social change that was mentioned during uh, introductory presentation uh, presentation uh, today methodology that we apply was methodologies that we apply were very comp complex in addition to several arts based methodologies explained uh, during the uh, previous two uh, section of our collaborative presentation we based our uh, research on secondary data analysis of the existing data related to uh, attendance of uh, different arts event in Malta and Europe. Then we collect, collected data through uh, quasi-experimental studies. Quasi-experimental because we didn't have uh, control groups. We were not able, the nature of research was not uh, like this to allow for uh, the development of control groups. We would not introduce experimental factors or art-based methodologies, so we used a uh, quasi-experimental approach comparing groups uh, at the beginning and the end of uh, the study and for data collections in both the initial and final pre and post uh, uh, evaluations, uh, we collected qualitative and quantitative uh, data, introduced focus groups for qualitative uh, photo voice and several other techniques, as well as uh, surveys, scales uh, and tests of knowledge that uh, Andrea, uh, Professor Carpatti recommended uh, strongly uh, in the designing methodology of uh, AMAS studies. And uh, in this way, we were able to compare, uh, to compare progress that uh, and document progress that happened uh, due to application of arts-based methodology, test-bed experiments, and also we included, in addition to participants involved in creation of arts events, we also included public, because one of the objectives, or the main objectives of uh, AMAS project was to increase awareness and change public attitudes and policies, uh, practices related to discriminated or marginalized social groups. So with such complex methodology, for such co application of such complex methodology, we needed to obtain ethics approval to, uh, that are very rigorous and uh, that was particularly challenging uh, challenging during the COVID time. We needed to obtain, uh, to change our methodologies initially planned for face-to-face -face direct interaction uh, du uh, during collection, data collection, but we needed to uh, modify this to uh, web-based, uh, in most cases, uh, web-based techniques for data collection. In any way, we were able, not always in time, but uh, generally, we completed all studies as planned with min minor uh, modifications and we were able to analyze our data applying uh, techniques for quantitative and qualitative data analysis, descriptive and inferential uh, statistics, as well as thematic analysis, and we are still integrating, uh, integrating, triangulating uh, data obtained from uh, this approach that was based on critical and dialogical mixed method research that uh, we are practicing in uh, our work. As uh, that was mentioned, uh, Rafael and Isabel mentioned, we have a very diverse uh, population or subpopulation social groups that we uh, 
worked with persons living with the HIV. Uh, we also involved migrants, elderly persons, residents affected by or development of uh, their communities, and finally, persons with learning uh, disabilities. A research problem that motivated uh, this uh, study was uh, widely spread discrimination in pre prejudice towards certain social groups that are documented through our studies and also uh, documented in uh, through through analysis our analysis or reanalysis of the existing data uh, related to discrimination in uh, European in the European Union and Malta and as you can see uh, it is widely spread different forms of uh, marginalizations are widely spread, uh, particularly based on uh, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, disability, age, and one of the most recent studies, just completed German study related to discrimination, demonstrate that in fact in Europe we are facing, and not just in Europe, all over the world, we are still facing issues related to uh, discrimination and social inclusion. Just for illustration, just for illustration, according to several thousand of German participants, 90%, almost 90% believe that, that there is racism. Uh, almost uh, 65, two thirds of uh, German population believe that there is institutional, institutional racism. So it is something that is crisis, serious obstacle that arts, as our evaluation shows, can confront and change, influence uh, changing attitudes. So that was our objective to measure, to evaluate how socially engaged art can influence people attitudes uh, toward uh, marginalized groups. And here are our integrated results, better visible on small monitor, but I think the main finding is uh, visible how uh, cognitive outcomes, knowledge and skills of uh, participants had changed uh, during uh, during performance, as well as how public large number we had, I would say, uh, four or five hundred in total uh, participants who accepted to consented and participated in our uh, visitors uh, surveys. Uh, and this number is sufficient for quite reliable uh, conclusions for such small uh, population of Malta. With four, five hundred thousand participants, we can have very reliable conclusions that demonstrate, demonstrate that uh, uh, more than 90 percent of participants uh, increase their understanding, increase their understanding of uh, social issues related discrimination of uh, certain social groups. OK, we also have strong evidence that participants, participants, now I'm talking about small groups that participated uh, in Rafael's uh, screen printing uh, study, immigrants, significantly inc increase their knowledge and skills that improved according to uh, themselves, their employability uh, prospects. As you can see, uh -oh. as you can see, only from 1.7 to 4.3, their evaluation of their general skills uh, was improved. So drastic, drastic improvements, real related knowledge and uh, skills. 
effective outcomes that are especially important that Isabel mentioned, because research, sociological research shows that uh, educational actions and uh, cognitive uh, changes increase knowledge and uh, awareness more frequently suppress expression of prejudice rather than change attitudes. But emotional impact of art is pro, uh, promising value, uh, venue for changing real attitudes of people. And as you can see, we have almost 90% of participants, of uh, visitors who indicated that they felt emotional or very emotional uh, during uh, performances. There were variations, small variations uh, regarding the impact that were influenced, that were influenced by the form of, uh, of uh, artistic events. Something that was important is to, uh, to emphasize that live performances are the most uh, impactful form. We also found and documented that uh, well-being of participants were significantly improved and highly important that most part, uh, visitors believe that uh, social engaged art can influence decision makers and policies related to uh, marginalized group. Overall evaluation demonstrate that almost all, virtually all uh, visitors will visit again uh, similar presentations and also recommend such uh, presentation. Something extremely important in the last slide is that uh, not only not only uh, attitudes and uh, evaluation, positive evaluation of socially engaged uh, arts were uh, noticed among participants, but also very similar uh, among, among uh, members of the public, the visitors. Only one uh, difference is uh, important, and this is related to optimism, that uh, visitors are even more uh, optimistic regarding presentation. Just to mention uh, limitations of this study, relatively small number of participants, direct participants who participated in creation of this study, variety, variations of population, and self-selection of uh, participants in visitor survey that uh, to some extent uh, question our conclusions, but overall uh, I am strongly confident that due to comparability and consistency of results in, results in different groups of participants and different uh, members of society demonstrate that AMAS project was highly successful. Thanks for your attention. Right. And the approach can be a very friendly. So now, super quick. So, uh, <laughs> I'll just talk really quickly about the planning and management of these projects, um, focusing mainly on suitable citizens and Batman Xirian because they were the projects that I was most closely involved with. Um, as you all know, I'm sure planning and managing socially engaged projects is a little bit different from planning and management, managing a normal artistic project because the final outcome is always unknown and you have these variables of the participants, um, and what they might want to do, their unique needs, their availability, their enthusiasm. Um, the aims, I guess, of planning and managing and administration is to support the artist, to make sure that the conditions were right to collect the required data for Milos and for the project as a whole, and also to abide by what the European Commission wants or what the funder wants and what the university needs. 
um, it's sort of a balancing act. There's always a sort of a little bit of tension between the artists, the creativity, the participants, and then the office. So the artist might, you know, wants to buy a particular size and color of uh, these hats that Rachel mentioned. Um, and uh, while the project's office wants to know which are the cheapest hats and if they should be listed as consumables or if they should be listed as, you know, um, fixed assets of the university, which obviously the artist is not interested in. Um, so just a little bit really about like what you don't see. So there's this beautiful image of um, the, you know, the final, the climax of this project, but what you don't see is the people on the ground with the walkie talkies or the, um, the lifeguards off camera, for example, and the Coast Guard or, you know, the, all the permits from the local council, the permits from the COVID, from health authorities, the uh, tour guides, all this stuff that you don't see when you are hopefully enjoying a beautiful project. Just really quickly, I put this circular because I think artists don't really work in silo. They're always thinking and always planning and always conceiving the next project. So you can go from planning to recruitment of participants to procurement to data collection and closing up. But there's a sort of a, the artist keeps going in a way and many of the MS projects did actually most all of them, I think, um, continued in some way or another after the study was done. I put communications up there on its own because it's sort of important to all of these parts, different types of communications. Um, I'm going to like keep keep running. Um, planning obviously started before before I was on board, but you know, in the application stage and um, discussions with the artist, discussion with the stakeholders you know, confirming the scale of the project, depending on budget, depending on ambition, depending on what the artist can do um, factor in in data collection all the time. How much, you know, can we how many participants do we need? What's the minimum? What's the maximum? Recruitment was a really interesting process because there's also almost a double recruitment because the NGOs need to be invested in the project as well, so they need to be almost recruited. And they need to really understand the project, so they need to understand what is, I don't know, performance art, what what will happen in in Xira. So they, they need to be able to know that so that they can then relate that to the participants and, and make sure that the participants are engaged. Um, you know, coordinating times and places. So we had participants with different needs, with children, with different working lives, with um, people whose parents had to accompany them, the elderly in Isabel's projects and um, procurement, literally buying things or hiring people um, within university and European Commission rules is always fun. Um, yeah. You need to think not maybe outside the box, but around the box. So, you know, these boatmen, we had to see how can we get three quotes for six boats, which we did, you know, but it's it's always sort of thinking, going back and forth what the artist needs what the office needs what the you know I remember in Isabel's project at one stage there was, there was a power cut so the cameramen needed to stay longer and we needed to pay them and the project office said but we need proof there's a power cut so you know how what we take a photo in the dark I, I don't know what you know <laughs> in the end we got an email from the energy company to say yes between these hours there was a power cut but these are all the things you know that, that you need staying in budget obviously is, is important um as needs and COVID, you know, expanded everything, we needed more time, everyone needed to be paid more and the explanations going from, you know, from one end of the, the organizational or organogram to the other. Um, data collection was um, obviously sort of the, you know, the, the, the projects, while they were obviously artistic projects, they were also experiments. So we had to consider all sorts of data collection methods you know, whether they were on the phone because of COVID or whether they were on Zoom. Some people preferred to meet outside in person because of COVID again. There were language elements. Some were had to be translated in, from English to Maltese. Some meanings, people with learning difficulties, you know, they had to be able to conceptualize what the questions were. Um, and even practical things like making sure there were enough people to to gather the audience, you know, the pieces of paper from the audience or that there were enough pencils, especially again with COVID, you know, for people to fill in the surveys, all this practical thing and all the processing afterwards and things like this. Um, communications is not only obviously to the outside world, but it's also internal. So again, explaining, making sure the project's office knows what's going on and the artists and everyone is is in sync and everyone un is understanding the same thing the same meaning from the same words, which can't be taken for granted. Um, 
we also did communicate with local national press and you know with the public and um, we had some really good articles in the Times of Malta which we were really happy with on social media we also when we were recruiting we made posters so that the the participants or the potential participants would understand really what was going on and of course with Amas we used social media to communicate to our colleagues and to peers around the world um, and then to close up the project, which is always interesting as well, because the energy somehow you need to keep maybe not the energy up, but you need to keep going to make sure that you store everything, you know, to pay everyone to report to funders um, and to reflect, you know, on what has happened. So, you know, the artist might be exhausted or the participants might go back to their normal lives, but you still need to close up and make sure that everything is sort of recorded and um, and closed properly, as it were. Um, that was, I think, quite fast. Um, you know, so we provided support, I guess. The management is sort of providing administrative support, practical support and also moral support to the artists, to the NGOs, to the participants. And all to sort of to get to reach these aims of the research question, the societal challenges, the artistic integrity of the project and the ethical considerations to make sure we could do, you know, how we are treating the participants to make sure they are looked after. Um, and all that in the context, again, as everyone knows of COVID and um, all these ever changing uh, parameters of what we could do and where we could do it and how and online or offline and things like this. So these are some of just some of the challenges which I'm sure you're all you've all experienced. So. <laughs> All of our hearts. <laughs> yes, and, and well, applause to the whole Malta team. I think it was, it was like the essence of a must that we could see there. All the arts and the charts. Thank you very much. Okay, let's get started, you know what? My name is Miriam. Now you please, please share the screen, Amna. So my short talk. No need this month. I will introduce one of our AMAS experiments. AMAS, AMAS weird linear activity B in the northern most of in Finland in the Sami area. So, this is Vieta. I'm a theater director, performance artist, also a lecturer and art educator. Later, I'll present you the collaborative project called Love Talks. Yes. Mm. So, let's get started. In this picture, you can see the magnificent sub uh, Arctic environment and the Utsjoki village down there, where we were running this project in May 2021. Next, please. It was an art based action research project, which emerged from research interest in place specific and indigenous issues in art teacher education. Awareness of the Sami people's position and history as a minority culture was an essential factor throughout the project. We started to plan the project with the local teachers almost one year before the main activity started. Why weird? Surprisingly, it came out that in one of the languages of indigenous Sami people in northern Sami, Amas means weird, strange, and terror. Therefore, it was selected to be the leading theme for the project. We planned together three art workshops exploring how something strange for somebody can be very familiar for somebody else. The objective of all the three workshops were to deepen and strengthen the students' understanding of their own identity as individuals and as part of the community and society. Next, please. In the art craft workshop, pa uh, participants made labor identity constitutes and uh, 
uh, created images, self images. The relief for us was named from the same tree. Uh, it consisted with 80 wooden pieces, so the whole school community participated. Next, please. In the map workshop, the region of Utsuki has been studied from above. How does a familiar area look uh, from a different perspective? What forms do satellite and map updates looking out? And how does a person's own identity become more detailed in a broader view? Participants from all grades consider themselves in relation to the environment and the community. Next. The present students draw images of the place they had chosen from the satellite maps, and the entity was enriched with various unique individual and community based elements as, as individual community. Next, please. The different elements of the maps discuss about experience in the place and around, alongside the work, both workshops, students there encouraged to discuss, bring out their own opinions, listen to others, and do compromises. Next. In the map works, workshop, the younger participants were included to the the system. Finally, the stories the size but the work was based on experiences of the place, the region, and the history of Utsuki. Next, please. The stories were uh, told using different media methods. Next, please. So, what worked and why? Throughout the process, our challenge was to find a way how to promote active interaction and dialogue between some culture, contemporary art, and encounters through the art in northern multicultural school context. In larger picture, the project was contemplating the role of social justice and decolonial thinking in the context of the art region in Finland and in the context of art teacher education. So, what worked? Joint planning and collaborative work. We managed to create an operating environment, uh, promoting communality, learning and participation. The activity week was the entire school's collaborative effort. Also, opportunity to share stories worked. Art operate as a gateway to self-expression and strengthen individual and community-based identities. Visual methods are good means of expressing past and current current stories of visualizing possibility possible futures and renewing hope as well. Also, dialogue worked. It requires that everybody participates, listens to and hears the thoughts and needs of the others from the first planning stage to the implementation. We started the process one year earlier and have, we have done collaboration with stakeholders in earlier years as well. So, we are invited to start the next program next autumn 2002 in Utsuki. So again, but to find new ways to develop school culture requires a lot of effort and time, willingness, and resources. But most of all, it requires trust. So now I give the floor to Piet, please. Yeah. Okay. So here is in the first slide, you see the beginning project called Love Talks. Here you see two Iraqian refugees, Fateh Ali Mosa and Sabah Mayid, who came to Finland at 2015 living in Rokiemi. Two years later, they were granted asylum. That was so significant to them that they wanted to make something to show their love to Finland and Finnish people. So they got the idea 
of building a small reconstruction of Ishtar Gate from ancient Babylonia, building that indicated in Nebuchadnezzar's love his wife. They asked my help, I did it, and we made it. But it was a long way. Next, please. Yeah, the project, the project started to grow. Beautiful act of gratitude started to grow bigger. The project called Neighborhood and Love Box, it's the rose to the need to practice eating with another person, neighbor, an unknown, or even a member of your own family. To meet, uh, to meet the other person as open a mind with as open a mind as possible without prejudices. Next, please. And this was the uh, initiative goal. Participatory city happening where residents are invited to meet fellow human beings. The Finnish word consists of two words. Rakta meaning love and talko meaning voluntary communal work. We wanted to create safe spaces where people have opportunity to interact with other people. This idea got nice reception both by individuals and by organizations. It all was meant to happen in summer 2020, but as we know, something came up situation was just a check. Next, please. Here is our team. Artists, art students, uh, art students make the video documentation and at, at uh, three workshops before the activity weeks in the autumn 2020. And also, of course, uh, me and Miria, we belong to this to this list. Miria's contribution was substantial. The next piece is it? Yeah. And here is the reality shaped by COVID-19. Here are some photos from the activity we took in the autumn 2020. In the summer 2020, all the trips were cancelled. Big need some party traditionally arranged by the city was cancelled. So the public opening of the gate should have been there the mid summer party with the five people with different cultural backgrounds. Uh, I think next yeah. opening the gate was moved in the beginning of autumn. There was there we also put up an open door art space in one of the shopping halls in the center of Britannia. A big empty commercial apartment we had worked on one concert. On the walls there were hanging products of art workshops kept online before COVID uh, or before this act active week and online because of COVID-19. Next. It, uh, Art space, different artists led workshops. And I was standing outside as a facilitator, calling people in. About visibility, many of the murals drafted in the workshops were painted around the city. The, and the Easter Gate was to be seen the shore one year, eight months. Next. And also uh, the two public newspapers, city newspapers, they were interested along the whole, the whole way. They made interviews with artists and so then the murals were around the city. Some scientific publications was made. The promo video was shown in some occasions. Next, please. And here, what work, what work, and why? Mm. Yeah, the Iris, the Easter Gate workforce. 
we made it visible how big a group of citizens we have come from diverse cultural backgrounds. Also, the gate was standing to shore for one year and eight months, having no vandalism attacking. That's very common in Rovaniemi. And then, so very important fact is that the Iraqi artists they had a strong sense of belonging to the society. They felt responsible of something having importance among the immigrant communities. Also, cooperation with organization worked, and um, in spite of the society being closed, there were online works with elderly people and young adults before the activity weeks. And the results were hanging on the wall of the open art space. And the concept of open art space works by inviting bypassers into the workshop was successful. I was doing that and I, I had to be very precise telling what we are doing and why we are doing. People got interested, they started to discuss, they came into the workshop and and uh, the artists leading the workshops, they were facilitating the work, giving people a sense of doing something important together. Next, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have this possibility to have our presentation online. I will send you these love talks post uh, making. Uh, postcards online as well. As you can see, we have made a huge amount of lovely postcards and I will send them to you now. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. A hands to Miria. Thank you very much, Miria. I am happy that you could uh, deliver your presentation and to round up the Lapland contributions, let me read out a very relevant remark that Melanie Sarantu sent us from Australia, our project manager. She says one issue also forthcoming in the research in Lapland is that many artists consider themselves as on the margins of Finnish society. Due to the marginalized ge geographies of Lapland in the north of Finland, this was questioned in our other partner countries. So the marginalized position of the Finnish artists working in the Arctic, Arctic, we thought they were not really marginalized before we were discussing if Finnish artists can be considered marginalized. Well, I think it's important that they do themselves consider that they are out of reach from um, from the community and as Melanie says artists can also feel themselves marginalized well thanks again for the Eula plant presentations and now can I invite we wave you yes hello oh thank you very much all your hearts belong to us we can see that and Charles University please take the floor and sorry not to not to have questions at this point, but we will all read your chapter in the Amas book. That will be shared and that is shared already in SharePoint. Now we are going to have, of course, please take the floor. And I will tell the people who you are. So the Charles University team is led by Marie Fulkova. Marie is Associate Professor and Senior Investigator for Charles University for the Amas Project. <coughs> we have Jaroslava Raudienska and Alina Jurkova, Jurkova, Senior Researchers. We have Magdalena Novotna, whom we know very well, as she's the author, uh, author of many author of many contributions with Marie. <laughs> and we have Miroslava Chernohova, professor, stakeholder, 
of the OMAS project, we have Kristina Janiszkova and Kristina Rychowa, who are researchers and stakeholders at the same time. And now the floor is yours, please. Uh, which uh, uh, which shows and depicts all all of our uh, experiments. As you can see, we had six experiments. The sixth one was a little bit like invisible because Yaroslava, Yaru, and uh, Alena, Ali are not here. They serve in. Uh, examination board at university and they regret very much they couldn't come. So I'll be talking on behalf of them and I will um, show you uh, and and, uh, and I will tell you something about this experiment number six which has been run in the hospital by those clinical psychologists Yaru and Ali. Okay. So if you want to know something more about other experiments, just go to post a section, use our tablecloth, put your coffee on it and you can move it however you want and read the short descriptions of experiment. Um, more in more detail about experiments with Romani children in the museum with the deaf community, deaf children and teaching art education to the deaf people and so on and so on you will be able to read in uh, in the book where Andrea is I wanted to thank her very much for editing so there are uh, our results case studies all right <laughs> Thank you. So um, this presentation is on non-pharmacological intervention, emotion, pain and quality of life. This uh, sixth experiment has been conducted by, by two ladies, uh, Jaroslava Raudenska and Alena Javurkova, who would like to introduce in the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously sisters, as you can see. And what they say, why we talk, why we would like to talk today about non-pharmacological interventions that can influence emotion, especially distress, anxiety, depression, anger, uh, quality of life and pain and pain. Because we are interested in it. And we are interested in how to influence uh, that all problems already set by a holistic approach towards health and care and to promote overall health by focusing on interactions among, among brain, body, mind and behavior. Another picture of those ladies. Um, Alana, uh, who are we? We are clinical psychologists and psychotherapists who work at the second medical faculty of Charles University and Yusuf University hospitals with somatically ill patients. We teach medical psychology and psychology of health, not only psychologists but also medical students and other medical specialties. I have to say that uh, the first year of our project uh, uh, Amas was very much influenced and negatively influenced by COVID pandemia. Uh, Yara, uh, Yaroslava and Alena had to serve uh, in COVID ward, in COVID department and their department and their project, uh, uh, research project in the first year has been uh, completely ruined by this uh, situation. So they had to start collecting data later on and they're still uh, collecting. But in the meantime, they managed to 
uh, submit three articles and one of them as far as I know has been accepted in a very good journal. So you'll see uh, later on what was happening in their research. And they say also that at the moment uh, we also try to use virtual reality or augmented reality for better coping and distracting from procedural pain in burn department of the third medical school of Charles University. Let's go back to mind body interventions towards improving of health. Commonly used techniques in mind body interventions are, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, mediation, hypnosis, progressive muscle relaxation, or arts therapy. All these approaches intend to reduce anxiety, mood disturbance, pain, and improve quality of life. We would like to talk about art therapy and introduce snoozeland multisensory treatment. Art therapy is one of the mind-body approaches and it is based on engaging the senses and the body in therapy through observing, touching, listening, moving and manipulating materials and it provides unique opportunity to benefit patient, client, people in improving their mental mental. Uh, health. You have heard this um, strange word, snoozelen, uh, snoozelen room. So, what is snoozelen? Snoozelen is a multisensory environment. We would like to introduce New Zealand multisensory environment. It may be used to educate, stimulate, relax, calm, calm or energize as multisensory experience or single sensory focus. Simple by adapting the lighting, uh, atmosphere, sounds and textures. To the needs of the client at the time of use. These environments transcend population, populations with its extraordinary flexibility, wide application and positive outcomes. When we go back to history, you see how New Zealand developed from the late 70s now can be found in over 40 countries around the world. In September 2018, the second medical school at University Hospital Motor, Prague, Czech Republic, opened multisensory room. So it was the first New Zealand environment in the Czech Republic. Applications of Snoozelen. We use it for improving mental health and relaxation in people suffering from pain. In pain conditions, we can concentrate to better quality of life and improving of emotion level and behavioral level. Now you can see already examples of some elements in our multisensory environment at the second medical school. For me, that New Zealand environment has a great magic. And I asked Alana and uh, Yaroslava to put me there after semester, you know. So it would be absolutely relaxing time for us. And maybe, maybe we will get we will get this privilege. But unfortunately, we were not allowed to go to hospital. So 
we cannot to see it um, in in our own eyes, you know. So it's strict, uh, strictly um, prohibited to let people who are not employed in in the ward to go into it. We would like to introduce you our experiments. First, experiment number one, hypothesis. We suppose that the participants who receive active art therapy will show a significantly greater decrease in negative emotions and pain compared with passive receptive art therapy sessions. Assessment was conducted before and after every art therapy session and before and after the program. Here we can see improvements in domain Dis distress, anxiety, anger and pain in the group that performed active art therapy, but we do not see changes in a group with these passive perceptions, perceptions, perceptions of art. I believe that this is a part we don't understand perfectly and I only regret those researchers cannot be here to um, answer your questions and to give you a deeper explanation into into these uh, these tables so if you have any question any anything you want to know just please send your questions to me and i will resend them and you will get the answer if you want to know some more uh, technical details or uh, detailed information about this Experiment number two, hypothesis. It is hypothesized that the participants who receive multisensory distraction session will show a significantly greater decrease in negative emotions and pain compared with passive or receptive art therapy sessions. We did assessment of emotions before and after the art therapy session and before and after program. And again, we can see improvements in domain distress, anxiety, depression, anger and pain in the group that was in New Zealand. But we, we do not see changes in negative emotions and pain in a group with these passive perceptions of art. Experiment number three, hypothesis. It is hypothesized that the participants who receive active non-pharmacological intervention, art or binaural beats relaxation, will show a significantly some decrease in negative emotions and pain. Methods, art therapy, Benora Beats was delivered by a registered psychotherapist in time of hospitalization. Therapy lasted for 40 minutes, one session. Minimum was three art beat therapy sessions. Assessment before and after the art therapy sessions. And here I asked Alena uh, and Tiaroslava, how do you conduct how do you conduct an, ass an assessment? questionnaire, talks, uh, any other kind of communication and recordings, any other methods. And they, <laughs> their answer was very simple. They say standardized psychological questionnaire for assessing, uh, assessing uh, quality of life, anxiety and depression and so on. So uh, it is our uh, future task to um, organize a seminar about these methods because they seem to be very, uh, very precise and very standardized and this is something what we uh, find um, inspirational and valid also for our research in art education effects. And again, 
there was an improvement in distress, anxiety, depression, anger, pain in both groups. Experimental with active art therapy and also in the control group with relaxation through binaural rhymes. The quality of rhyme during hospitalization interventions has not changed. So non-pharmacological interventions can improve negative emotions and pain during hospitalization. And finally, uh, experiment number four. You see that the experiment number six has been subdivided into four parts and this um, sort of uh, surprised me, but this is probably a structure that must be fulfilled to get uh, valid data for further publication in this kind of um, uh, science. Hypothesis. Um, it is hypothesized that the participants who receive active art therapy will show a significant greater decrease, significantly greater decrease in negative emotions and pain compared with cognitive training sessions methods. Art therapy was delivered by registered psychotherapists. Art therapy lasted for 40 minutes, one session. Cognitive training was delivered by a registered clinical neuropsychologist. Minimum was three art therapy sessions. Assessment again before and after art therapy sessions. So we can say there was an improvement in distress and anxiety and, and so on in both groups with active art therapy and also in the control group that underwent cognitive training. So non-pharmacological non interventions can improve negative emotions and pain during hospitalization. Conclusions. Why we would like to talk today about non-pharmacological interventions? Uh, because it works. So I think that this is simply, uh, thank you for your attention. And we shall see what happens in publication. And when it has been published, I will send it to you definitely. And those ladies will be very happy. So any questions, please send them to me. And now I would like to ask Magdalena to continue slightly because our main concern in the project is to um, establish um, links and license that will have their second, third, fourth, and so on life. Simply uh, sustainability of the project. And we will do it through those ladies, those um, important stakeholders. And one of the most important stakeholders, by the way, became the deputy of Minister of Education. She's not here. She's she's in in the in Brussels at the moment, but she's the highest person we are in touch uh, regarding to culture, education, and art education as well. So hopefully she'll be uh, she will stay our friend forever. <laughs> yes. So. Uh, Magdalena, uh, would you tell us something about uh, sustain sustainability through National Gallery? Because we have a new contract of uh, or contract with Christina and her management uh, for further collaboration. And we also have uh, another agreement with the Museum of Decorative Arts, you know, from our previous uh, performances or presentations. And we also plan to uh, continue with uh, this important lady, Kristina Janiskova, who's uh, the main, um, the second main person in <laughs> special need uh, in, in um, uh, taking care about students with special needs and of course through international studies vice dean professor Chernochova. so as you can see we did very much for our future to keep it and finally uh, keep your fingers crossed for us 
uh, we managed to insert cultural competence as one of the main competency into educational framework for the country. It was a tough fight and will be. It will continue. It's not the end. Magdalena. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Uh, I can see that you will start sleeping a little bit. So I uh, try. I try to be short. <laughs> mm, we are thinking more and more about sustainability, about how to uh, use what we have found. Uh, we uh, are happy to uh, working with the National Gallery and other galleries in Czech Republic and also with uh, other stakeholders. Christina Janiszkova, she's uh, a person, important person in our faculty who is caring about students with uh, special needs, for example. So uh, Marie uh, presented to you one of these six experiments. I will just quickly go through uh, four other experiments just by presenting you uh, concept maps like results and outcomes. The first the pilot study uh, was in the museum, not in National Gallery, in Umělecko Průmyslové Museum, what is very traditional, uh, classical uh, institution with uh, old uh, <coughs> old collections of uh, design and, uh, and so on. Mm, in COVID, we worked with uh, people, uh, different kind of people, elderly people, uh, families, and different people uh, communicating by emails, by phones uh, on the first uh, lockdown, just on the spring 2020. Uh, the map can uh, show you that how the beauty and the collective experience, aesthetic experience and communicating experience is important. In the situation when families was divided in several different places and how the, um, the memories and the stories which are sharing and which are to share can be uh, experience together and can be, how I can say, positive for all these uh, parts, all these partners, all these peoples. So you can see beauty, sharing, place and family maybe. Uh, then with uh, deaf pupils, we could uh, enter to the museum and we uh, did a common program for group of deaf people, their teachers, deaf pupils, age, huh, age 10 to 15, 10 to 14, with uh, their uh, teachers, their school assistants and the interpreters in the museum. And the question was uh, how uh, or why the deaf pupils cannot visit the museum because the situation is deaf pupils go never to the museum with their teachers uh, and they are, they never visit and the question was why and how to uh, manage the situation. All these activities was very complicated as Margarita uh, presented for Malta uh, <coughs> situations, it means teachers from the school wasn't okay or wasn't persuade, persuaded that uh, visit and executed the program is okay. Why? Because, for example, because pupils started to draw nude uh, bodies. <laughs> so, uh, second reason, uh, curators or uh, educators could not directly communicate with uh, deaf teachers. Why? 
because uh, pupils coming to the exhibition could not uh, understand what is uh, written on these uh, tables. Why? Because for them, for Czech deaf people, writing Czech is like a foreign language. They can sign, but they cannot well understand written Czech. Wow. <laughs> and the, we met many, many situations which was very, um, very new for us, uh, being uh, hearing uh, majority hearing population. Yeah. Those people there who have their own sign and own living community and cultures. This is a specific culture for them. Mm. And we are actually in the position of handicapped people because we are not able to talk and to, to speak their own language. And this is a very important shift in understanding of these people, not like being handicapped, but being different with their own culture, actually to consider them as a subculture. It's a new strand in understanding in social sciences as well. And the politics is still very much behind in you know, this. Mm -hmm. this under, yeah, underestimating was uh, one, maybe first of these political <laughs> issues, cultural and un underestimating. So you can see this concept map. Uh, you can see the emancipation in the center, the need, uh, the big need, number one, uh, of emancipation of this, uh, this um, communities, these groups on different uh, levels and different situation. You can see space as a really, uh, really, really important things because one uh, of these obstacles in the gallery was uh, the space of the exhibition, which was limited and uh, interpreters with pupils could not find a big space to communicate, uh, to be visible to can move uh, hands and so on because we were in the exhibition of glass <laughs> which was like <laughs> uh, like very um, like fear to destroy something or to okay and communication of course tradu traduction of Czech language Czech sign language mm, the museum professional language and so on and artifacts and trust and distrust of course in uh, both communities uh, deaf and uh, hearing majority uh, the distrust for example of several teachers from the school uh, in the situation of uh, being visited by the team of hearing uh, professionals from the university and so on and so on. <clears throat> the third uh, experiment, you can see another concept map, uh, which is result of the experiment number three, uh, made with the Roma pupils from uh, pra one of Prague uh, inclusive schools. Uh, here it was much more pupils, let's say 100 pupils from several classes. And you can see in the, in the center there is no emancipation. It's much more about care, about care of pupils, about care of teachers, <laughs> about care in the society. Of course, you can see the dialogue and the communication. Yeah. Uh, you can see the touch, the direct, not space, not distance, but the direct touch of, uh, of all these participants. And of course, the pride, like uh, being proud of doing something. So the obstacles in these cases, the situation was uh, very similar. It means uh, groups of uh, pupils were coming into the gallery to the same exhibition of Czech class. 
Andrea. Did you you no, sign? Okay, okay. Thank you. And the uh, last and fourth uh, experiment, it was uh, a group of uh, special needs university students. Uh, I have uh, Christina here who helped uh, me very much and worked uh, with me and with uh, our nine students, which are different special needs uh, in uh, COVID, uh, of course, growing up the group of uh, mental uh, mental problem uh, indicating students and you can see shyness you can see isolation you can see frustration and uh, the question of these <clears throat> open form workshops were to how to find the uh, central points themes uh, which are super important for uh, our students. Of course, you can see trust, you can see meeting and you can see responsibility. And I would like to say because uh, there's still silence about the Ukrainian situation. We've got hundreds and hundreds thousand of refugees and our uh, university supports accepting them and we'll be having them since uh, in September at school. Thousand and thousand children. So this is another uh, another hard reality what happens and we can learn a lot from the project. So we have to be prepared and uh, lots of our activities through Erasmus, uh, uh, well, sorry, Horizon MS uh, helped us to um, maybe articulate the main concepts and main uh, main strategies how to work with them. So I just wanted to mention this uh, situation. Just two slides from Christina and then it'll be really quick. Very interesting ones, right? And this beautiful table plan you can see in the poster room below the projects. What a nice idea. Yes. Well, I'll try to be really brief. Um, I'm here as a um, as a stakeholder of this interesting project. When my colleagues told me that they are part of the project, we were really happy at the faculty because uh, I think we share the same thinking, the faculty. Um, our Faculty of Education or overall Charles University in Practic Republic has always been very open to everyone. So it means to students with any kind of difference, which means students with visual impairment or physical impairment, autism, hearing problems, learning difficulties, some psychological issues or somatic illnesses, but as well to students who are from foreign countries, who are parents at the same time who raise their kids and have no time for school. Also for students in some kind of crisis or just bad life situation. And over time we found out that we can't do this agenda alone to have only one or two workers at the faculty. And over time we spread the support to different workplaces. You can see them in here. It's not all of them. There are some more, for example. Um, OK, there are some more. I'll be brief. And so this moment, what we do is that we make a special network around every student with special needs or specific needs. The situation of every student is unique. It's always different. So we make the support the way the student needs it. And so you can see it in here in this picture that we always try to make it the way the student needs it. And I'm really happy I can be here because um, what I didn't hear but felt from all the speakers in here is that sharing is caring and the same thing is what we think at our faculty. So this is all for me. Thank you very much for this time and I'll be 
really looking forward to continue the efforts made in this project, which is really brilliant. Thank you all for your work. Okay. We have some minutes for questions. One, two. I thought somebody's getting photos. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you have questions? Anyone? My uh, my question would be to to the whole group. Sustainability. You see, this is our reviewers' major issue. If the AMAS, that's a quite a well-funded project, by the way, finishes, what remains? Is does anything? Uh, go on, or or it will be finished and over. Yes, Maybe. who is going to answer? Okay, yeah, um, I think it is the biggest problem or uh, thing which must be done in every international project and also national. Yeah, I was involved in several international projects and with pro when, when project ends and money and also sometimes interest of uh, of many people who, who who promised we will support you but what i can tell about this project i think um, the project came in time when many things are in very good atmosphere politically for example because uh, maybe you know in the Czech Republic now we have um, uh, we, we are working on revision of on curriculum and as Maria said that now it seems that uh, cultural competency will be a uh, the eighth competency, key competency uh, as a part of curriculum, compulsory curriculum in school. So it's one way how we can we can many ideas start to implement through curriculum, not in some lessons of art. Yeah, or so yeah, concept. yeah. But uh, this, this could be uh, answered by my colleagues better. But what I can promise that the Faculty of Education is very well, the management and also departments are very well informed about what have uh, have been done and what is uh, what will be do uh, next month. And because uh, I know next year it is uh, the end of this project yeah. and the atmosphere and the uh, idea to collaborate with this team and also in another topic which relates to this is very big with from department of um, for example special education for from department of psychology from department of uh, languages etc etc and so i um, i think uh, because i'm a member of management of the faculty i think that it's a good atmosphere and good and <laughs> good stars <laughs> uh, and, uh, that um, that it will be uh, implemented in the life of our faculty at least of the faculty yeah and also what about it what was said that we have a um, special center uh, to support um, uh, students with special needs we, we are all also we have also support for international incoming students so uh, we uh, we collaborate very much and everything works together like uh, like gears yeah so I, I at this moment we can promise that many things will continue with our uh, local money and uh, human human resources that is a good sustainability case yours because if um, if the results of a project get into teacher education or special needs care education then they will be sustainable the young people learn about it go out to the field grab our book and and hopefully they'll they'll just continue so I think yes we are all teacher trainers every university Right, and let me give you a personal note. Yaromir mm Ujdil, -hmm. is this name well known? Okay, 40 years ago, <laughs> I got to know this lovely professor 
are from the Czech Republic. And, and he helped me a lot in getting into art education with his connections and with the splendid books that he shared. So I'm very happy to greet you here now after so many decades and have a cooperation <laughs> with the Czech. Fine. Anyway, other questions? If not, then thank you very much. And thank you. thanks again. Thanks for coming. And the reason why we are only here together, the AMAS group, is because it's teaching time. So teachers are at school, but we will share every presentation as a film, as a video, plus the presentations themselves with the open audience. It will be on the AMAS website and also uh, on the Hungarian site uh, with short Hungarian summaries. So now let's see whom we have from the Portuguese group. Please come forward. And this is the group from there. We don't see our lovely colleagues, Teresa Eka and Angela Saldana, but we have our artists. And it is much, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Abel Andrade, Carlos Souza. Juliana Ferreira, Carla Julio. Who is here? Who is going to present? I'm Abel. You are Abel. I'm Juliana. Juliana, lovely. Yeah. So you all are going to speak now yes. and show videos. So the floor is yours. All the four members are here. Thank you. As indicated in the program. May the force be with you. <laughs> yes. So thank you everyone for having us. Unfortunately, uh, um, our coordinators and um, the research team cannot come, but uh, I don't know if it's good or not. They trust us, the, the, the presentation. So um, as the Professor Carpati said, I am Juliana, Abel and Carlos. Uh, we are the artists from project, three of the artists and Carla, a uh, skate holder. Uh, so uh, in Portugal, we work with um, four groups. And as, uh, as I was saying, uh, the team of researchers and uh, coordinators was Angela Saldanha, Celia Ferreira, Raquel Valsa and Teresa Essa. And um, besides us three, uh, we had um, Dori Negro, João Valente and Rosa Rufino as artists, conducing the and Celia. <laughs> um, as the um, uh, important data, um, we start uh, the, the pilot uh, in 2019 with the one of the skate holders, ASOL. Um, the, 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 the project continues in 2021 uh, in the field with 162 participants from different vulnerable communities, four researchers, six artists, uh, 12 health social workers and four social care organizations as skate holders. Um, and uh, we uh, have uh, um, also, we have also uh, some partners who, who help in the, this the development. So in um, four cases, the four experiments, the activities were planned during meetings uh, between researchers, artists and skate holders. Um, all together and informal group conversations with the rest of the participants. Uh, artists acted as facilitators uh, exploring artistic, artistic process such as photography, crafts and design, printing, video, performance and uh, I think is an important part of the project visits to museums. Local mediators, uh, health workers and social workers uh, were key elements uh, to help artists understand the participants with verbal and physical difficulties uh, and help in the workshops. They, they were uh, always presented. So, Felix. Hello. Um, so, um, I prepared uh, a, a, a speech because uh, often I wonder a lot when I'm speaking without having well, problem. No, but now I won't. I will have this screen. So 
I will start now. So I was no, I'm joking. So uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here in the name of uh, all of us. Thank you so much of Hamas and the, the rest of the organization. So regarding San Felix. Um, mm, OK, so to give you a little background about myself, uh, my life is divided between film, photography, music, uh, Aikido and being a father of a six month child called Romeo. So it's a lot now, so I don't sleep at all for six months never sleep no sleep even today i was sleeping at the hotel and i woke up because oh where is romeo no no romeo i'm alone okay having that in mind i worked with three groups and each group was very different in its own way with some families group i worked with them with the help of carla and rosemary that's not here with video interviews and later with more activity activities not related to video the path was well Curious. Uh, well, uh, with Asol, I interacted with them by playing folk music with Joan Valente and Rosa, and they sang and danced, and it was quite re rewarding to see them happy, learning new ways to interact with this newfound music and dance. With Vitor Fonch, I worked with an artist called Dori Negro, and my main role was to be a musician and a videographer, creating and interacting with Dori and the group that was assigned to us. The process was quite different from all three, but from what I've learned is that the sense of community and building connections throughout time, through heart, one week or three months, is what, in, what it is what's important for them. Everyone's synergy through video, music, performance, meditation, and most important, food, were non-linear processes. Most of the time was, and still is, trial and error and sometimes it worked sometimes it didn't i kept asking myself why and speaking a lot with angela i think you all know who is angela is the coordinator from portugal um, i understood that creating bonds is far more important than the actual results of the creative process i also realized that the path that art created is what matters not so much the end result of things so, art was the way to create trust and empathy between every individual in the group. The time provided for the study was just enough, in my opinion, especially with the group from the unemployed people from Gaia, the Son Felis group, but the others as well. I wish I had more time with them, only at the end I felt that we could start to create. I'm saying this because um, COVID covid blocked a lot of things people were afraid to be with each other they were they were always well very um they were with fear at the beginning so it did it, it didn't help but now well about the son Felix group we had the privilege of having the stakeholder Chana carlo julio and she's going to share her point of view that for me is quite representative of the importance of this, of this experiment. Her cooperation and perspective, perspective was unique and immensely important because um, she filled the, the gap between me as an artist and between a group of people that never saw me before. So she helped me a lot to um, to learn how to be a part of the group instead of being like we are here. I'm speaking and you are listening. We all became uh, a group. Uh, sort of a group, but yes, we, we, we sort of, yeah. So, Carla. Good luck. He <laughs> <laughs> tell this because me, my English is very bad. Oh, by the way, Carla is not fluent in English, but okay. uh, the, the initial plan was me to translate everything that she was saying, but luckily we are not going to do that. So. Yet, but I won't make that. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the whole organization in uh, Budapest. I like to be here. Uh, I thanks to uh, Angela Saldanha, the project coordinator in Portugal, for the opportunity to participate in such an interesting uh, project as this one. 
I'm also grateful for being here with you today. My name is Carla Julio. I'm a clinical psychology. I have also been working with social and community psychology for the past uh, 12, uh, 12 years ago. I'm a company families that benefits from the social insertion income. Um, I'm talking about people with various social and economical problems, employed with low incomes, unable to meet their uh, monthly expense. Many of them look working, um, lost working uh, habits or never have them. They use to, uh, to that to lifestyle. Many children of functionation with imitation follow the same patterns in, from the parents. Uh, for these reasons, there are uh, often households in which none of them works. OK, it's very difficult to work with this population. Um, the project was without any doubt very valuable for them and for me too. Uh, at the beginning, they resist to join the project and to get involved in this activity. However, talk to the sections, it was possible to observe this commitment to grow. Abel, OK, <laughs> was crucial to the achievement of such positive results. Uh, as the manager to create empathy and closeness with the, with the participants, that's not easy in this kind of population because if you don't have empathy uh, it is very very difficult to make something um, okay thank you abel as a technical and psycho uh, psychologist i managed to observe these people from different perspectives i know i have many new tools to diagnostic social issues that will help me outline new forms of interventions I was delighted to see people. I have been following for years, visiting Salve's Museum after great insistence and see their amazing face. I remember in the, in the visit to Salve, uh, tell them there are, was a big world out there if they are open to do it. I told them that uh, they could go with their children to house on uh, uh, three days admissions because uh, you have no, no money. OK, uh, it, it rates to realize uh, that they were enthusiastic about that idea. Uh, bonds were created and sense of community started to rise within two those people so similar and so different at the same time. At a certain point, they wanting to bring their children to the sections to share with them and what were they doing. OK, a real process of inter uh, help, uh, inter help to begin, even with the few research they have. And after all the sections that they talked. Now uh, is COVID. <laughs> no, uh, it's not, she, she no, 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 <laughs> this is a result of COVID. <laughs> OK, uh, go, yeah. uh, OK, and after all this section uh, that they talk were going to be long and prolonged in the time, pass it too quickly and they want to have more and more. As a psychologist, I believe that this project should continue, I'm sure that it could create the desired change in the participants and medium term in their family. I also believe they would have a better chance to be successful to find a job. They, there were uh, many experiences that the participants would never have been able to experience uh, if this project don't exist. We have uh, almost no resource, no government funds, uh, so we are not able to invest in activities of such high quality. Um, more projects like these are needed to get people out of their comfortable zone where they don't have conscience. This is a discomfort for them. OK, uh, to help them broaden their horizons, 
and make them uh, to uh, there is, to experience different things they cannot have an imagine to appreciate. They are in comfortable in the in their sense of comfort. The this kind of project help people remember what they forgot. They are capable. They have skills, and they are able to change their lives harder to have a more dignified existence. It was with great joy that I saw change in a very short time. Sometimes you work for years, years ago without being able to see any chance with us. Thank you for all and sorry about my English. <laughs> OK, so these were the talks, right? No, we have more. No, no. You have more. Yes, OK, yes, more. I, uh, but because of this intervention, I was going to speak a little more, but now I'm not. So let's see the video that uh, w where this group went to Serral. It's a very well known museum in Porto, uh, dash Portugal, and uh, it was the first time for everyone that they went to see art. We don't have sound. I don't know. Sound. We should have. Hangot kérünk szépen a videóhoz. O vídeo tem aqui a apresentação, não sei. Nem quero mexer muito que é para não. Well. While this video is passing, um, uh, they are making uh, remarks and they are commenting on the sessions that they had. Uh, and uh, oh, it's nice, but with no sound, well, it's just strange. Yeah. Stop. This is another things issue yeah. that we are facing now, that you have to start the voice separately from the image, but we are doing it. Uh, our technician is helping us with it. It is an awkward program. Unfortunately, we had this event facility and not a normal teams for teaching. We should have done that because then it just runs smoothly. Nevertheless, with events, it's a bit more complicated. This is an option. Okay. I should say that being supported by AMA and APC. Take a microphone. Start, 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 yeah. Yes. Um, while he's trying to fix the problem, I should say that being supported by AMAS and APECV or APEC for us um, was essential because it gave us the time to learn and to evolve without having the pressure of this kind of experiments of or projects. The, the There's usually some I'm sort sorry. of there's usually some sort of expectation in uh, presenting uh, things that are. Well, yeah. OK, goodbye. I think let's just see the film yeah. and we will share the videos. As I said, if you allow us to share this yeah. video Not when we video. can the on, the... on the website. Yeah. The, this, the this videos is, are already on the Amas. I'm sorry, but this is blocked. No, it is I blocked now. Frontal. No. You There's can't. Nothing happened. Um, Estamos todos amigos, eu acho. Ao princípio é assim um bocado. Tínhamos todos vergonha de falar na câmara e tudo, mas depois pronto. Agora tornámos-nos todos amigos. Para mim, o currículo em vídeo foi uma novidade, apesar Dá alguma dificuldade da minha parte, gostei. Também gostei muito da interação com as pessoas, porque acho que é sempre mais uma 
mais valia nós conhecermos gente nova e, e fazermos novas amizades, uh, eu, para mim, acho que foi positivo. Ao princípio, vou ser muito sincera, não gostava, mas depois comecei a gostar. É diferente, eu sou muito calada, muito reservada. Mas comecei a conhecer as pessoas, agora gosto de ver. Faz-me bem, sinto aquele ambiente, sinto-me bem. Pessoalmente, fico mais, mais enriquecido. Pessoalmente, e estou a gostar mesmo. É, o que é pena é que há, há poucas iniciativas destas. Sim, nestas sessões, aquilo que foi mais importante, digamos assim, é o convívio, ou seja, nós convivemos mais, aprendemos mais, saímos de casa, isso é, é um contexto fácil, digamos assim, para quem está muito em casa, pois é, é o abrir os horizontes, digamos assim. Sorry, um, I should say that some people that spoke in this video, for example, one of them was um, victim of domestic violence for several, several years. And um, in one of the conversations that we're having on the sessions, um, and she was the one that was the most quiet, for example. Uh, she simply started talking and sharing Uh, her experience and, to, and it was very, um, I, I really didn't know how to react because she was sharing that uh, her husband uh, beat her and uh, her kids and she tried to leave the house and and it, it's very interesting when you start to have a conversation about, okay, now uh, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to do some pictures to have in my resume or to put you know, on Facebook or on LinkedIn, that sort of thing. and. The conversation went to I'm I was abused for 10 years or 12 years by my husband, and and it, it's it, 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 it's a it's a very odd circle. These kind of sessions, it's very rewarding, but it it was very uh, intense sometimes. But sorry, it's just, it's just a, a little appointment. You go. So as, as we said at the beginning, uh, Amas Project in Portugal runs in uh, four different places, four different experiences with four different groups. Uh, Abel works alone in São Félix, me and Carlos work in Paradinha and uh, in Vitor Fontes and that's all we work all together. Uh, so the same battles for Vitor Fontes uh, from February to November. 2021, the research team and um, the mediators, uh, an art therapist, a psychologist and a social worker. They were in the sessions with us. Um, I think it's important to, to, to save. Um, when we were uh, ready uh, to start the AMOS project in the field, uh, we had a lockdown. So in with all the groups, the four groups, we start to with the postal art. We send the postcards to them. They reply to us, and the first beginning uh, contact, the first contact was uh, with this uh, with this media. So we did not lost time with the lockdown. We start the um, the the relation, if I can say that, uh, with postcards. Este contacto convosco foi muito, muito bom e, e os trabalhos que, que se fizeram foi uma mais-valia. Eu falo uh, por mim porque estive em contacto com, com a Juliana e com o Carlos e, portanto, quando viram a questão das, das fotografias, o material que, que eles uh, nos acederam foi muito, muito bom. Por mim estão cá todos os dias. Ok. Tanto para nós, técnicos, é uma mais-valia absorver alguma coisa de fora como para eles terem esta injeção de coisas novas.
extremamente interessante poder ver aquele grupo a, a entregar-se a estar disposto a fazer praticamente tudo aquilo que, que lhe era pedido sem estar a questionar. Eu vi uma sinceridade mesmo, mesmo bonita, que vem de dentro, havia disponibilidade. E, e mesmo outras que não querem fazer ou que não têm tanta disposição para algumas atividades estavam super motivados e entusiasmados. E, e portanto, a, mesma, a própria relação entre, entre, entre o grupo foi muito, muito positiva. Eles trabalharam sempre todos juntos. Foi muito feliz. Foi uma semana muito feliz. Uh, for, for your context, um, in São Félix and in Paradinha, we are we were in field months. Uh, here, the difference is um, this is a, um, um, a house, a closed house because of the COVID, um, and we work all together uh, during seven days during all the workshops uh, with the the, the all the artists. It was very intensive. I was just going to say that the music that you were hearing is a Portuguese traditional song called Fado Batido with a very fun dance too. Um, okay, so I think we are going to asshole, yes. Not asshole, it looks like an asshole, but no, it, well, you get the point, sorry. We're going to asshole, it's uh, maybe, I'm sorry for, sorry, sorry, okay. So uh, the data basically is uh, from June 2020, that was the pilot, to October 2021. The research team was Angela Saldanha, Raquel Balsa, Célia Ferreira, Teresa S. The artists invited were Abel Andrade, me, Carlos Souza, Juliana Ferreira, João Valente, the guy that plays the violin with me, and Rosa Rufino, the teacher of the dances. The local stakeholders were Central Centro Correia, That word, they care for adults with mental disabilities at Oliveira de Frates. The local mediators were Pancho Matias and Anja Masling. They are two adorable people that work with them every single day. And they have, um, um, they are, you know, when you, as, do you know when you meet someone that they are really happy? And it's almost annoying because how happy they are. Well, they are like this. They're always very engaging and they always want to help and to do things. It's the, the kind of person that you don't think that exists anymore. So uh, they, they uh, have the arts uh, outside. Uh, it's the family, the house, yeah, exactly. and the total depression people. Yeah, um, so I have a small text regarding um, this. I saw, can I read it or do you want to pass for the video and that's done? Because I know we're running late. Well, I wrote it, but I can I can summarize it. I also have, I'm joking when I say I, wrote, I have a very dark sense of humor. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, so. Um, Basically, uh, uh, all my text is very personal for me. So basically, when I went to Assol and when I went to Vitor Font, um, I, I was, um, my, rea my reality was questioned because I had a sister that had cerebral uh, palsy when I was very, very young. And um, um, when I went there, I, as a grown up, né, uh, I, I had the sense that now I could help and I I could interact and I could do things with them. So it was very um, rewarding for me, uh, this experience and APEC and uh, AMAS provided it. So uh, I just thank you <laughs> for that. So the video, yeah. It's another tradition. Proporcionar mais mundos às pessoas e, e é isso que nós sentimos com, com, com isto, com, com a massa e com o papel. 
conseguimos proporcionar mais coisas além, além do que nós fazemos e do que nós sabemos e do que nós temos connosco para ensinar. As palavras do Carlos e da Juliana no início, quando falaram dos, dos sentimentos que geram nas pessoas mais do que as ações, é isso que nós, muitas vezes, quando participamos deste projeto, é isso que nós queremos. Nós notamos que as pessoas estão a ganhar qualquer coisa, estão, estão diferentes. Os olhos brilham mais, ficam mais contentes. É sempre uma, uma alegria quando vem alguém de fora a trabalhar com eles. Nós todos aprendemos, que conseguimos em conjunto partilhar assim, muito bons momentos e ficar com boas memórias para a longa de vida de nós todos. By the way, I'm, all, I'm always telling you the songs because I'm in the band that is playing the tunes behind the videos. Yeah, so I know them and they completely butchered the song. No, I'm joking. No, it's fine. So if you have any questions, you can answer, you can question. But now I have to introduce you to Juliana because she's going to speak about Paradinha. Yeah. So uh, Paradinha was the, the, the last group and uh, Paradinha City. Uh, how, how it comes for a city? This is not working. Oh yes, it is. But maybe I was uh, not close. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, Paradinha is a, um, a neighborhood, a social neighborhood, um, but is a, a ghetto. Uh, the shape is uh, in U. You you enter and go out in the the same line. And per city is the name. The mostly the kids. Uh, um, uh, ask the, the, the neighborhood, para city, paradinha, the, para, paradinha is um, her own city, para city. So the project has to, to name para city. Um, it, uh, it, um, it runs from July to November 2021 uh, with, with the same problems of COVID um, with uh, Angela and Raquel and the research team. Uh, me and Carlos, uh, Celia and Teresa from uh, APEC um, also participate as an artist uh, with some workshops. Um, the local street holder uh, uh, works every day inside the neighborhood. Um, they, they receive this community um, in all terms, uh, juridical terms, health terms, uh, educational terms. They help the community in everything they, they need. Uh, they they receive as as logistic. We have uh, to run the, this local center community. Uh, we have uh, coordinators, socio sociologists, social educators, uh, in all the um, the um, the issues the community needs help. Um, as uh, as the, the workshops, uh, we work uh, ceramic, typography, silk screen, photography, textile arts. And of course, the visits to to, to museums. Um, we had a, a way more than these numbers in Pardinha, but this was the most um, frequent um, people that came to the the, the workshops. Um, the one more time, the activities were designed according to the conversation with the participants. Um, and um, and uh, at this uh, um, visit to a local museum who becomes in a, um, an, an idea, and fortunately we can do that, of a final exhibition of the, the, the artistic products that came from the AMAS experience. Uh, it runs, it opens in February of this year and still runs until now. Um, I can read something about the Paradinha. The invitation to participate in the AMAS project came because 
both Carlos and I worked in the social neighborhood of Pardinha since 2018, developing the artistic project Paradart. Our experience and above all our insolvency with this group allowed us to develop a mass sessions with this uh, usually marginalized Roma community. Um, uh, Carlos uh, has uh, two books. Uh, one is from Parasit. This experience is a, a book and a catalog for the from this division. And uh, the Paradart book is like uh, a synthesis of our experience from last three editions, uh, four years working in Paradinha. It's like um, an activity book also because we had um, um, how to do uh, um, the activities that we made with the, the group. You can see it. This is a, a real personal perspective, but is how is how I feel about Paradinha. Returning to Paradinha uh, is always an exercise in perseverance, but above all in love. Love in all its possibilities. Affection, union, hurt, intention, care, hug, concern, soul, tenderness, adventure, company, but also disappointment, fear and frustration. Paradinha is much more than a social neighborhood. Paradinha is people, children, the street and smiles, everyday courage to move forward and be willing to accept challenges. Paradinha, Paradinha sorry, uh, drew on me with the strength of a tattoo, a resilience that was difficult to erase and disguise. I will always be in Paradinha with these keys, kids who are a little bit mine and now with the support, motivation and the accompaniment of adults who are parents, cousins, parents, grandparents uh, or uh, don't even have children but are always showing up for there to see what happens. Being able to return to Paradinha with an international supported project was a different experience in the sense that this whole adventure will now have many eyes on my kids and on, on their experiences and learn with us, with me and Carlos. We soon understood that this analysis will also lead to further development in terms of research and registration, and that will easily be susceptible topic for invitations and participations, participations in events and actions. Um, about uh, the Paracity book, um, we ask, uh, um, like please, uh, to Amas and the coordinators, Angela and uh, Teresa, to make this book, because uh, in my point of view and Carlos, this is our kind to sustainability. Like Professor Capati said, this is an evidence that can provide uh, our experience for tomorrow and next year and the next. This is our way to see that uh, th this experience, what we made this year, can pass for other people to, to see, to show it, and probably if they want to continue. Is our personal um, way to see that. This is a small video of final for, for the city. No, it's just photo. <laughs> yes, this should be run while I speak. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is the in the opening of the exhibition and the, the kids community. Um, we made a lot of um, of um, artistic project um, objects and ceramic. And this is the video. Achamos que, que, foi, que é positivo, eles, eles também sentimos que podem alargar os horizontes através da, das expressões, das atividades artísticas, culturais, 
e, e que os permite também expressar-se, partilhar a sua, a sua forma de ver a realidade. E torna-os mais criativos, mais autónomos. Foi isso, no fundo, que nós sentimos. museus, as exposições, mostrar-lhes outras realidades e para nós foi bastante gratificante perceber que pudemos contribuir com mais qualquer coisa, com o de mostrar onde nós vivemos e o que eles podem tirar da própria cidade. Algumas pessoas, adultos, que também não se relacionavam grande coisa cá fora, depois das atividades acabavam por ficar um bocado lá fora. Então, mas isto foi assim, correu assim, eu estou e, e, e como é, o que é que achaste? Então, isto, isto como é que se faz? Houve ali também alguma conversação a propósito do trabalho que em alguns casos não havia. So, if you want to take a picture, this is the link for the ebook of Paracity. Uh, in this link. Oh no! Please stop taking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th this is the 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 shape of the neighborhood. Yeah. The shape. Yeah. There, there's a thing that uh, uh, I said at the beginning of the the project uh, that um, Angela and Teresa they they. Guardaram? Kept. They kept this information uh, till the end. I said them that uh, every people, uh, everyone that goes to the to the neighborhood, they come. The, the address is here. This is the the the, the 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 national road, and they came from here, and go out from here. Take and the mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, um, this is the national road, and the people goes inside the neighborhood like this and go out like this. And uh, since the beginning, me and Carlos, we are always doing this movement: stop here to the center community, and when we go out, we go and do this way. Um, and uh, we learn that we learn that uh, this simple action. Um, makes that the people can see us today, tomorrow, and the next day, and then they uh, recognize us and see us that we are inside with him, not are going and uh, very fast going out. Uh, in this QR code, uh, you have all the narratives from Portugal, from these um, the four projects and also the, the pilot. You have photos, videos, all the information in this link. Thank you very much. This was the presentation that make us feel, that made us feel the arts, the arts based immersion. OK, because we keep on talking about it and show pretty di diagrams, but you shared the fado. I wish I had diagrams to show. Yeah, OK, OK. I'm joking. It's OK, it's fine. Uh, I think the Fado music that you shared, it made us feel the atmosphere and it made us also realize that it doesn't take too much to make people happy. Just go there, share your art, look into their eyes and talk. And as you said, I will never forget that. You have to choose another way to go through the community, not only use the highway all the time, but look, but show them that you are one of them. So I thank you personally very much for that. Coming from a little country town in Hungary, I can appreciate your care for the country people. And with this, I open, open the road to questions. Yes, please. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, uh, because you underlined in your first presentation, then after in your last as well, the, the importance of the museum visits. And I was just in, like interested, like, why is it so like, how, how does it add to the, to the artistic process? 
And okay. uh, muito obrigada pelas apresentações. Não <laughs> tens uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, at, at the beginning, um, when we received the, um, the invitation to Hamas, um, mostly Carlos, um, he wants to do only visits to museums. Um, why? Why the, the importance? Um, Quer explicar? Eu traduzo. Por que é que era importante ir ao museu? Sim, posso explicar. Uh, rápido. Do, do, dois ou três tópicos. Um, sorry, my English. Sorry, my English, mas vou falar em português. Uh, minha... Sim, tópicos. Um, a, a nossa relação de queremos levar os participantes aos museus é muitas vezes a necessidade de podermos mostrar o, o, o que a cidade tem, o que o país tem, a pessoas que muitas vezes não têm o interesse de irem ver o, a história de Portugal, a história da cidade. Uh, Basicamente, o, a, aquilo que nos tem como sociedade, que é a nossa história, a nossa cultura, a nossa forma de sermos, tal e qual como a sociedade que eles têm. É um grupo, é um, uma sociedade uh, minoritária, mas que tem muita cultura, muita riqueza cultural dentro deles. E nós, dentro de nós, pensamos que também é necessário levarmos a nossa cultura a cultura deles. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, the, the, the importance to, to take the, the, the group to the museum is because uh, the museum, not uh, uh, contemporary, um, religious museum, all the museums, and they have part of its history, the history of the communities, of the societies of that place. And the, the intention to take the, this special group, Paradinha, to the museum is to show them that, uh, um, that they are another cultures, not only the, the Roma culture, but uh, the, the other cultures represented in the museums or, or the geology, the biology, the other, uh, the, the other uh, studied cultures. Um, in this particular uh, case, um, Paradinha uh, goes to the museum and um, Carlos was, was uh, uh, speaking about um, relation in between the, society, the, the major society and the minority society. Uh, they, the, the, the Roma community, they feel marginalized, but uh, they unconsciously, they marginalized uh, themselves um, um, alone. Why? They belong to the city. They can go to the museum. They don't need us to take them to the museum. They can go by themselves, take the children, they go to the museum and see the city and uh, show in this particular where we have the, the exhibition, the story of the city. Uh, it was very funny and nice to hear that uh, that was uh, um, a couple that uh, the, the, the fathers um, lived in the city uh, uh, years ago. And he was speaking to the, to the wife, I was living here, that now uh, after there was an hospital and now is a museum, the story of the, 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 okay, the measures, okay, okay, and now is police. <laughs> the, the, the story was not about our society in Viseu, uh, was them story also. They live it here, then for life they go to the neighborhood. So, in resuming this, the, the importance to go to museum is that uh, they are uh, they are from the Viseu society. We are only one society. We 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 can uh, produce uh, object artists. We can uh, make workshops. We can go to museums because we are because we are all uh, equals. That's the importance to go to museum. É uma forma. É uma forma de podermos também mostrar que nós artistas, quando nos pomos no museu e quando criamos as atividades para, para os miúdos, eles próprios também são os artistas. E quando os transportamos a, os trabalhos deles para o museu, para as galerias, é uma forma de os integrar na própria sociedade, de os ter no meio da elite, basicamente, porque quando falamos em arte, estamos a falar em elite, estamos a falar em... Uh, um, going to the museum at the beginning of the experiment, 
um, leads to the workshops and then to the final exhibition. And the final exhibition is like the, the, the sheriffs in top of the, the cake because uh, um, the, the, the participants are artists. They are exhibiting uh, the work they made in this project to the other people. They are like uh, é dar-lhes a importância que muitas vezes eles pensam que não têm. Excelente. Excelente. This is a good bridge to the the visits tomorrow. When you are going to first visit a museum of of modern art, contemporary art, the Ludwig Collection, that is at the verge of the one of the biggest Roma ghettos in Budapest. They can go into the museum, the Roma people, but if Zofia Somogiro Honsi hasn't organized the project for their teachers and then for their children too, I don't think they would. Why would they? They think museums are for other people, for the whites, basically. Yes, and I wonder what sort of dress shall I wear? One of the teachers asked in a museum, am I OK to go there? Yeah. So so now they feel at home. You will you will hear Jofi and you can read Jofi's uh, chapter in the Amas book about it. And then in the afternoon you go to to see the National Gallery where uh, Jofia Shepshey and Jofia Albrecht um, designed an experiment for children with learning problems. They are the last to go to a museum, definitely. And, uh, and they went there and they realized that you can be creative in a museum. You don't just go and see, but you can also do something. As in your project, be an artist, yeah. be an artist and, and, and share your work. So I, I think the projects have this beautiful intricate inner connection. Righty, righty, any other questions? Yes, please. Thank you very much for that. So I think the videos, which are amazing, helped really immerse us into all the energy and the music that you created. Thank you. I mean, am I, I'm bursting with ideas, um, having seen the images, and I'm very curious. I don't know if you have the time to do this, but can you, for example, explain to us what the cinema reels, how those were used? <laughs> the, the reels, the huge reels with the tape? Reel to reel? You, ha you had them in the photo. Uh, Carlos. With the, with the hearts and the shadows? No, no, the reels, the tape. The, oh, OK, uh, OK. Yeah, no, and, and, and the motorbike ex, um, uh, exercise seems weird. really thrilling. And it seems like you really used all the arts in, in your project. OK, is... um, in, in Vitor Fons, as, uh, thank you, Isabel. Um, as uh, uh, we said, um, in Vitor Fons was, a, was um, a seven weeks project, uh, very intensive. And uh, um, we artists were working all together at the same time with the, the different groups. Um, and I think you were speaking about here. That's the image. Okay. image so we'll, we'll be the 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 no, I don't know I'm sorry, we have one more. We have one more talk to go before we get okay. lunch. Just to respond so. to you. That, yes, um, I think you were asking about Vitor Fons. We had the um, old machines projecting and um, the, the participants were um, playing with shadows. And uh, after that, we are um, photographing the, the movements. And we are doing a stop motion animation. Is the is the, é uma forma de a evolução total. Hoje em dia pegamos o telemóvel, tiramos fotografias, fazemos o que queremos. Uh, antigamente, bom, antigamente, quando temos televisão, quando temos algum entretenimento, tínhamos de ter algum poder económico. Esse poder económico 
no, no, no. Was he saying that uh, they attempted to create uh, the, 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 the um, it was an attempt to recreate a super eight uh, instead of doing all digital because in, in our days it's quite easy. They showed the process of capturing frame by frame and creating something with that. Uh, it's it's very condensed regarding what you said. But... Super eight yeah, reels. Super eight. Uh, all the yeah, all the old tape. Old tape. Yeah, yeah. A, um, analogic um, video, and um, yeah, and uh, we are projecting. Um, Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin, yeah. Tom and Jerry, this kind of movies, and for them was uh, uh, um, understand how, how how the idea of Carlos is uh, um, to show them how we become. Um, uh, from the beginning until the, um, the digital um, photographs and the instant photographs. So he, he explained them that there's a pellicula, a tape, a vintage tape that we have to revelate and from the, uh, many years until now. That was the process. Thank you very much. Let's give a big hand to the APEC you say? APEC group. And yes. And the next one, be patient, because the next one is connecting to what we have seen. The Paco group will show a video about their work. And Carolina Guiteres Novoa cannot be with us, neither can Silvia Remotti, the two protagonists of the Paco project. Uh, well, Caro is expecting a child and Sylvia has a baby, which is nice in Amas. We are quite <laughs> we are quite OK in terms of the next generation. So now we ask our kind technician to start Carolina Guiteres Novoa's presentation. And Caro, if you are here with us uh, online, then be sure we are now going to look at your work. Hello everyone, I am Carolina Gutierrez and today I'm presenting on behalf of Paco Design Collaborative. We are the partners from Italy and we are really sorry that we couldn't be present with you today. So from December 2020 until September 2021, we carry out a series of uh, participatory photography workshops that were called Daimyo Yoki, which means through my eyes. And they were aimed at vulnerable young people. So we were able to involve a total of 62 participants in direct collaboration with a foundation that already worked with vulnerable families in, in Italy, which is called the Tree of Life. And also we involve seven local photographers. Each workshop <laughs> consisted of five sessions, starting with an introduction to analog photography, with the aim of closing the process with a public photographic exhibition in the neighborhood. To this end, we went through sessions of reflection and selection of the developed and printed photograph. What was interesting uh, about our approach involving and working in direct collaboration with a foundation and also with the seven local photographers is that we could have a multidisciplinary approach to the process where every professional was able to to complement with the other, to learn from the other, to exchange knowledge and to enrich at the end uh, the experience for the for these young people. Our aim was to understand how an art approach, in this case photography, could be a means to empower uh, these young people 
exercise their critical thinking and make them understand that they are able, that they have the power to become agents of positive change in their communities. So now I, I will leave you with uh, some of our stakeholders. You will listen to, to some of the photographers and also some of the educators that collaborated with us uh, during this, this last year. Daimeyoki workshops were carried out in five marginalized neighborhoods where our partner, the Tree of Life, has a headquarter. <laughs> Ciao, io sono Manuela e sono il coordinatore del progetto Varcare la Soglia nella città di Catanzaro. E mi trovo per l'esattezza nella zona sud della città, nel quartiere di Aranceto, un quartiere multietnico. Vivono infatti in questa zona famiglie straniere, famiglie italiane e famiglie di etnia rom. Uh, siamo operativi dal 2016 come progetto di contrasto alla povertà. Il laboratorio dei miei occhi uh, è arrivato dal mio punto di vista in un momento davvero ideale perché? Perché comunque stavamo vivendo uh, la seconda, il secondo lockdown e um, i bambini erano davvero stremati dalla pandemia ed erano davvero molto molto stanchi della chiusura, soffrivano tantissimo della distanza e um, del fatto um, di non poter frequentare quotidianamente il centro sociale e quindi tutte le attività che generalmente noi proponiamo dal lunedì al venerdì in orario pomeridiano. E il laboratorio di fotografia è stata una ventata da, di aria fresca. E, I bambini hanno colto subito la proposta di prendere parte alle attività ed è, stata davvero, uh, è stato davvero un percorso molto molto sentito su, su un piano emotivo. È stata un'occasione di, di riscoperta del territorio, del quartiere, è stato un momento di relazione, è stato un momento di, di scambio ed è stata anche un'occasione di conoscenza perché i nostri bimbi non avevano mai visto una macchina fotografica tradizionale classica e quindi anche essersi uh, confrontati con uno strumento no nuovo li ha comunque mh, attivati. Credo che uh, l'esperienza del laboratorio dei miei occhi sia stata significativa anche perché ha dato ai bambini la possibilità di eh, vedere la realtà attraverso i loro occhi. E I momenti di tour del quartiere, i momenti anche di condivisione e di scambio in base alle immagini che loro stessi avevano prodotto attraverso lo strumento fotografico, ha permesso loro anche di esprimersi in una forma differente di poter dare libero sfogo non solo alla creatività ma anche al loro punto di vista. Sono rimasta davvero molto colpita quando in uno dei nostri incontri uno dei bambini ha avuto modo di esprimersi in merito alla situazione che vive quotidianamente in questo quartiere, che chiaramente è un quartiere che ha tante difficoltà, c'è degrado, ma che al tempo stesso però rispecchia pienamente la volontà di tanta gente come questa bambina, minima rappresentanza, di voler darsi da fare, di poter cambiare qualcosa e quindi lo strumento fotografico è diventata un'occasione per permettere agli altri anche di vedere attraverso i suoi occhi. E un abbraccio a tutti.
sono Gabriele Lopez e insieme a Paco e l'albero della vita ho seguito il progetto Baggio dai miei occhi. Eh, è stata un'esperienza molto molto interessante, eh, devo dire una delle più sincere e eh, interessanti fatte negli ultimi, negli ultimi anni. Eh, che cosa ha funzionato, che cosa mi è piaciuto di questa, di questa esperienza è stato sinceramente il, principalmente eh, l'aver dedicato alla fotografia uno scopo più nobile eh, quindi discostandoci da quello che era la tecnica con dei mezzi molto semplici eravamo in lockdown, non potevamo trovarci, non potevamo uscire assieme quindi abbiamo eh, fatto in modo che le ragazze e i ragazzi utilizzassero i loro cellulari le, le, le piccole cose che avevano a disposizione quindi con delle minime nozioni di tecnica sulla luce e un pochino di composizione eh, abbiamo spinto eh, questi giovani ragazzi a eh, interpretare il loro quartiere quindi a non eh, subirlo e passarci attraverso senza osservarlo ma piuttosto a eh, imparare a dare una, un loro punto di vista e eh, ad apprezzare a trovare il bello eh, nelle, nel quotidiano nelle cose, nelle cose di ogni giorno eh, ha funzionato perché appunto la fotografia è stata la scusa per parlare d'altro come, come spesso accade è stata la scusa per eh, scoprire meglio la realtà che ci circonda eh, e la cosa più bella è stata senz'altro l'occasione della mostra finale in cui finalmente eravamo più liberi e i ragazzi sono potuti incontrare spesso per la prima volta e quelle piccole conversazioni, piccole amicizie che faticavano a nascere attraverso lo schermo erano sfociate in, in questa gioia, in questa bellissima occasione di incontro che c'è stata quando abbiamo fatto una semplice affissione sotto un muro libero della città di Milano e quindi questa è stata la soddisfazione più grande, vedere che attraverso la fotografia sono nate delle amicizie, sono nate delle, delle possibilità eh, e la fotografia dovrebbe essere proprio questo, al di là del, del, della valenza artistica o commerciale che, possa, che può avere ogni giorno, eh, era bello appunto, vedere come la fotografia sia stata ponte per, per una consapevolezza e per la scienza, per, 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 scienza, per, per, per la comprensione di, di come eh, ci sia, cioè, sia sempre una possibilità, ci sia sempre una della luce anche nei periodi magari più, più bui o come sia magari la scusa per entrare nella vita di altre persone o in altri mondi ecco, la fotocamera può essere un po' questo e niente, quindi ringrazio ancora tutti quelli che hanno collaborato a questo progetto a chi l'ha organizzato, a chi l'ha creato è stata una bellissima esperienza che sarebbe davvero bello anche ripetere ciao a tutti e provare a proporre delle idee diverse. Possiamo ragionarle per genere, ci sono dei ritratti, dei paesaggi. Bravi ragazzi, bravi. C'è pure il ghetto. Nella mia c'è anche Obama. Siamo Giorgia e Maria e siamo nella storia di Bancare la Foglia a Genova. L'anno scorso abbiamo partecipato a questo progetto di Dai miei occhi che ha coinvolto un gruppo di otto ragazzi delle scuole medie. Abbiamo potuto osservare eh, che i ragazzi erano entusiasti di partecipare a questo progetto in quanto hanno avuto la possibilità di toccare con mano dei materiali mai usati in casa loro. E considerati belli e molto preziosi. Sono ragazzi che vivono in contesti di povertà e di privazione, ma attraverso questo progetto hanno avuto la possibilità di cimentarsi in un'esperienza nuova. Dalla fine del progetto abbiamo realizzato una mostra nel quartiere del Campasso, che è la zona in cui ci troviamo. E questo quartiere è particolarmente degradato, povero di stimoli, e questo è stato un aspetto molto interessante per la realizzazione della mostra, perché i ragazzi hanno potuto avere un rimando direttamente dal proprio territorio e dagli abitanti dello, dello stesso. E questo è stato sicuramente un aspetto molto interessante e, e stimolante per loro. Questa qua è ancora una foglia di quartiere, ma non può dire se se la fai capire. Come entriamo con la licenza? Come la facciamo? Direi di sì. Ok. Eh,
non la trovo giusto. Ciao, sono Andrea Campesi. Ciao, sono Valentina Testieri. Insieme facciamo parte di Baco About Photographs, un'associazione che ha base a Palermo. Ci occupiamo di fotografia analogica, curiamo mostre, pubblicazioni e siamo stati molto felici di aver fatto parte del progetto Dai miei occhi come maestri per i bambini eh, dello Zen. Il lavoro ci ha arricchito immensamente e cioè, siamo stati appunto molto felici di aver fatto parte del progetto. E... Un progetto, un progetto molto importante, eh, Palermo eh, come altre città, eh, le periferie di Palermo soffrono di una povertà educativa importante e molti bambini non hanno luoghi, spazi, eh, possibilità eh, di partecipare a iniziative eh, in cui gli è concesso esprimere eh, le proprie opinioni, quindi sviluppare in qualche modo un, un senso critico. E, Tramite questo corso di fotografia invece li abbiamo visti settimane dopo settimane riuscire sempre ad, ad aprirsi di più e la fotografia li ha aiutati in questo, è stato un, sicuramente un mezzo e non un fine, in particolare la fotografia analogica, eh, in quanto il contatto fisico con, con l'immagine, eh, vederle sui tavoli, scambiarsele eh, e, e commentarle li ha, li ha aiutati molto in, nel, nel processo appunto di, di esprimere le le proprie opinioni e li ha aiutati a sviluppare in qualche modo un'intelligenza un un emotiva. E, è stato bello, eh, veramente bello ascoltarli eh, e, e vedere appunto come tramite, tramite la fotografia riuscissero a, a tirare fuori concetti, e pensieri, opinioni e un senso critico anche su, sull'ambiente che li circonda, quindi prendere in qualche modo coscienza della, della, loro, della loro condizione. Uh, di vivere in un, uh, in un posto che potrebbe essere molto meglio e loro ce l'hanno fatto capire uh, con, le loro, con le loro idee. Quello che ho fotografato, perché le immagini entrano da qui. Che mi ha detto? Che questo fotografo che si chiama Liv De Lander ha trovato noti insoliti per rappresentarsi, quindi si è fotografato nella sua. Allora, il progetto AMAS eh, ci ha permesso lo scorso anno di coinvolgere un gruppo dei nostri bambini del nostro laboratorio di potenziamento didattico in questo percorso fotografico che ha insegnato loro un modo diverso di fare fotografia in analogico per loro assolutamente sconosciuto visto che comunque insomma, sono eh, tutti molto giovani e sono molto più abituati a eh, fotografare con i telecomini. E, quando poi ci si è spostati, è stata loro data loro una consegna di eh, fotografare il loro quartiere, raccontare appunto il loro quartiere dal loro punto di vista, eh, è emersa anche una difficoltà, perché il contesto in cui i nostri bambini vivono giornalmente è un contesto molto deprivato, eh, conosciuto proprio perché eh, non ha mh, grandi insomma, bellezze. Eh, molti di loro hanno avuto difficoltà a fotografare, tant'è che le foto che sono, sono state fatte sono state fatte fuori dal quartiere o dentro casa, eh, quindi in un contesto molto più ristretto, quindi hanno fotografato l'animale, eh, insomma, eh, il loro, la, la, il loro animale di casa, piuttosto che altri spazi della casa. Mm, quando poi è stata fatta appunto una riflessione condivisa delle foto che eh, sono, state, sono state prodotte eh, e questo è, è, è venuto fuori appunto in maniera molto evidente. Eh, I bambini, eh, per quanto non siano abituati a, eh, a vedere appunto il, il bello, eh, hanno proprio, eh, si sono sentiti come eh, un po' in imbarazzo rispetto a questa consegna, proprio perché dal loro punto di vista nel loro quartiere non ci sono grandi bellezze da fotografare. Sicuramente il progetto ha lasciato una domanda anche nella loro mente che poi è emersa anche eh, in seguito mh, rispetto al fatto che eh, bisogna assolutamente fare qualcosa perché quel bello venga fuori. Quindi grazie a Piazzetta Massa. <ride>
How can an approach of an artistic discipline such as photography to young people in vulnerable situations help them become positive agents of change in their communities? We believe that it's uh, this mix of uh, theoretical and practical activities. Um, so we combine um, an active participation, giving them the responsibility of this um, public exhibition that closed each of the laboratories in each city, and also inviting them to these maker activities. So put hands on experience, um, taking photographies, uh, selecting what to capture, then uh, receiving the developed uh, film and uh, selecting them and reflecting on them being critical on uh, what were the intentions, the decisions behind uh, each photography, um, promoted this continuous learning in these digital natives that are not used to um, stop and reflect on what they are doing. So uh, inviting them to participate to this analog uh, process could actually exercise their, their awareness. So, um, also, um, I wanted to, to talk about the, this multidisciplinary approach and how this combination was um, successful to, to align the, um, the objectives of the, of the research with uh, educational objectives. So the discipline of design gave uh, a structure. Uh, it is structured the process with its objectives. The discipline of pedagogy um, guide the learning and push the meaning making of uh, the participants on their work. The discipline of photography um, provide the, the young people new tools for, for expression. So some of the educational achievements um, were the following. The power of an object. The fact that uh, every participant had the same tools, the same uh, camera um, to participate and, and develop the activities that were proposed, uh, fostered a democratic participation. The power of waiting. The fact that they had to wait one or even two weeks to see the results of their efforts, to, to see the developed film of the pictures that they have been uh, taking, uh, enhance their responsibility because they have to come to the to the workshop to see the results and also their patience. Um, the power of uh, active participation promoted their commitment and also their respect because as they were involved in every single activity, made them understand that uh, actually if they follow um, a process um, and they respect that process that is proposed, they will be able to, to arrive to a result. Um, the power of reflection. The fact that uh, they have to stop and think about what they have done, what were their intentions, what were the, the um, decisions that they have made when they took some of their pictures to them being able to give, in, give it a meaning and communicate this to their peers, then to build a joint narration for the final exhibition, um, really put in practice their critical thinking and raise their self-awareness, like why am I doing what I'm doing and what, what is this that I am saying, what um, I'm communicating, what I want to communicate. Um, so these are some of our results uh, that you will have the chance to, to deepen in the, in the symposium's book. Thank you.
was a beautiful, beautiful presentation. And I'm so happy to tell you that in the book, there are two chapters by by Paco explaining the whole project and the book is beautiful because Carolina Quites Nova designed it. So yes, and thanks for that. Caru, the authors appreciate your work. Here are the authors. So now, now we have a chance to catch up with time. If you are managed to eat your sandwiches in 30 minutes, three zero then we will be on time to be back here at 2 30 in 30 minutes and keep on listening to talks i hope they will be worth it please and look at the exhibitions there is the lapland exhibition on the wall and there are video films on the big screen and there is a hungarian artwork also hanging just enjoy it So the show must go on, you know, you know that. And the show will definitely go on with Associate Professor Dr. Eplény, Anna Eplényi, who has organized a spatial development, skills development workshop for the socially handicapped children's teachers and tutors, mentors. And Anna is famous for leading a fascinating workshop for children and youth, which is called the Geek Workshop. <coughs> Geek is for children and youth and art. And this is, yes, this used to be in the Buddha castle for 30 years, 40, whichever, yes, mm -hmm. there. And now it had to move, right? Temporary. February, you will no, move. temporary. That temporary, and then you can move back. This is such a fascinating workshop and we always wanted your skills to go to the teachers and we are very happy that they get them. So please start your presentation. Uh, thank you. Before I start, I want to introduce myself. I'm a landscape architect and art teacher, associate professor at the Mata University, Agriculture University. And meanwhile, I always uh, was longing to do some more art. So I finished the bachelor in uh, art teaching and at the landscape faculty I'm doing artistic projects with students drawing sketching modeling uh, I even wrote a book on garden history teaching for kids interactive uh, booklets so I, I really work with this artistic part of landscape architecture this is a current uh, research on landscape and terrain modeling I'm doing from the Land Hungarian Academy of uh, Arts so this studio, which you can see the logo, we and the Hungarian Association of Art Teachers, we participated in this AMAS project for, for Andrea. Um, this visual studio was established in 75, 45 years ago. In that time, there was no museum pedagogy at all. <laughs> no art pedagogy. Just in the schools, you had to draw paprikas and tomatoes in a rhythm, or you had to do one cube. That was the art education. And this uh, Ar Arpad Sabados, who became the, the dean of the Fine Art University in Budapest, he established that studio because he wanted to have a place which was free of thoughts and ideas for the kids working together in this experience of, of art uh, and teach them about problems of contemporary um, art. I'm doing, I'm mentioning contemporary for the 70s, yeah? So <clears throat> it was really the, the only open-minded uh, studio in the whole capital, which was not that conservative in, in art teaching. And I participated in that for 20 years, every Wednesday afternoon, a session for, with my uh, kids who came like once a week. And we do something what they cannot do at the kindergarten. In the kindergarten, they have an A4 sheet, and they have pencil or pen. That's it. Sorry to say in 2022, that is for the kindergarten, for, unfortunately. But we were doing something else, which was common together, action, paint, muddy, dirty. So here you can see some of the uh, aims of our pedagogy is a very friendly, take it easy mood, uh, a place which you are happy when you enter, 
uh, up where where the, the privacy and the social interactions are important and I'm the leader and the, the participants are, we are like equal friends. This is not a teacher session, I'm not teacher and this is not the task of today. Yeah, in each study. Today's task, kids, is that you have to do that. And then they all, what I have to do. So we rather have a, a thematic session for a year, for example, one year session could be Mary Poppins and the surrealism art, or could be um, something about colors. So we have a session, a thematic for the year, but uh, every time is a bit flexible according to how the kids are developing and what we want to reach. And we ask or we try to ask artistic problems. For example, this morning I came from a session where I had this Mary Poppins topic of London doors and how the London houses look like and then they matched the papers and they had to walk in the London street and they were continuing each other artwork. So there is a, an, an artistic problem and the kids have to find their visual answers. So that's why we have no expected result. This is not a do it yourself five minute craft. This is how to do and this is how to finish. And these are the steps to reach that object. We, we rather want them to stay in the process of the art. So enjoy the process and the result is not that important. Uh, every session starts with a, a very f fascinating problem. Imagine yourself being uh, backside of the moon and what do you see or, or you know, there's a situation or um, a problem. Imagine yourself exploring a cave. We are the explorers. Now we step into a cave. And nobody knows like, OK, you know how the princess looks like and what is the rainbow and what is, um, you know, smiley faces because that's all over us. But a cave is something new. You don't exactly know, but of course you have a suggestion or a weather, a very bad weather. Imagine yourself uh, in an island. Yeah, they don't know, but they have a little gap or, or guesses how that could be so a tale, a, a wonder or a, something amusement. They never, uh, we never give them ready made materials or pre, pre uh, prepared materials, what you can buy in the hobby shops. Yeah, everything is, is made um, from basic materials or recycled or bric a bracs. We want to emphasize the sensory experiences and lot of group activity or activity in, in pairs. They with extreme size, extreme uh, characters, and the process, as I mentioned before, that is uh, important. Today's word is for the parents. I want to buy it. I want to take with me home. That's mine. That's mine. And with the process, or if you do a group work, this um, result, this object, what I can take home is not that important anymore, but you try to lose yourself in the activity. And I think that's a crucial point of today's kids if they want to give every day a present. Yeah, I know yeah, her <laughs> every day, two presents at least or three. And why you get anything? Everything's for the weekend. Another one. So we use um, all our senses, hands, legs uh, for the uh, activities. We construct, deconstruct, reconstruct or transform things. We enjoy uh, expression, symbols, metaphors, idioms. Um, yeah, which are not so easy to understand for the first sight. And we try to add drama, play, music. Although I am not a musician, I'm not a drama teacher, but I have some colleagues who are more trained in that way. I'm more in the garden history and landscape, but they are more, for example, in dancing. So each teacher puts an extracurricular feature of, of them. And we really prefer collage, montage, and some kind of integrative materials and uh, temporary installation in open spaces. In 2013, two mates, um, two architects joined our group. We are a 15 teacher in our group and they brought themselves the, the experience of architectural study programs, the building, constructing models, 3D models. So we established a new program which was based on spatial thinking. Dora is doing a PhD now at the MoMA University on, on that way how can we develop the spatial experience because we realized that not only the Lego play <laughs> is successful because it is about building but many kids who have a, um, 
who are afraid of drawing because they cannot draw an, a nice horse. They cannot draw a nice princess. Yeah, they saw it that it is so nice in the ice world or was it frozen, yeah? Or oh, I, I cannot draw. But on the other side, when you give them some 3D problem, they can are very they are very good with it in modeling, which is usually non-figurative. So we the, the we realized that that really modeling and the way of developing these 3D actions are maybe more important than developing the artistic nice drawing skills. Sometimes uh, parents call me, I, I use studio for um, teaching the kids how to draw nicely. I said, well, no, we are not. How old is she? Well, age of 13. OK, that's the point when you should start to draw from reality. But until 13, please do not try to teach them how to make a skeleton or a jar. Just let them work from their fantasy. On the anniversary, Arpad Sabados was still alive. Unfortunately, he died uh, three years ago, but we had a big uh, exhibition at the Fuga Architectural Center. And on that day, we um, came out with our first group on the spatial thinking. I shortly introduce you the, the chapters of this. The first chapter of that book was about maps, plans, um, shifts in scale of the maps. Here, this is a highway uh, spaghetti junction exercise, for example. The second chapter deals with terrain modeling, earth relief, earth, earth sculptures, um, which is a new new thing, I think, even for Hungarian people at all. What is that? The next one is landscape elements, so basic features of landscape, weather, wind. This is, for example, an ice ice activity on melting ice, floating and melting ice cubes on, on sea. Or on the other side is a tornado and the dynamic of a tornado. <clears throat> the first, the fourth chapter was about uh, floating space, spaces which interwoven with each other, mirroring spaces. The fifth chapter deals with uh, networks. So transparent structures, airy transparent structures where you have a light and shade structures. And the last one is the, we said shoe box, but I don't like this shoe box. Uh, so enclosed box spaces. So for each chapter, we collected five, six exercises relating to that abstract, abstract expression of space. Not that house and flat and city and street, which I think, okay, they are, could be fine, but a little bit too boring nowadays. So difficult to break out from those roles as you have the, um, I explained this morning on the school, I explained about what are the differences between Budapest houses and London houses and how the London doors are, but each Hungarian kids did, you know, this very simple house with chimney. So it's really difficult to broke up, uh, break up those barriers. And next month, the translation of this book will come out in English language with an e-digital uh, books, so uh, I can share you later with with um, Andrea. I think the link if you are interested. Uh, this book was uh, awarded with an extra prize on this Golden Cube Award of Architects. Is Dora and Rita are our maids. So later we find out when we get chance to go to countryside schools and kindergartens that these uh, exercises do work and I could do this exercise with 30 absolutely unknown kids in 45 minutes anywhere in, in Hungary. So we did many, uh, many times that kind of sessions when we had the financial background for the travel and for the materials. It was a big experience also mainly for the ladies who were teaching there. You know, they were get shocked when they saw the knives. Uh, or the knives to cut out soaps or the thick or these scissors, uh, very sharp scissors. Oh my God, what's going to happen? Oh, are you going to use this? Needles, needles. Oh my God, for the ice, ice uh, floating things, we use needles. Well, the kids will hurt themselves. Or maybe for the first time they will hurt, but then they want to learn how, how that this work. So we established this training program and that was a part of this AMAS uh, program two years ago, no, one year ago, that uh, with 20 teachers, we could uh, manage this training program. We took um, art teachers, kindergarten teachers, from mainly from Budapest and from the east side of uh, Hungary, um, 
in these 18 participants took part in the 60 hours workshop. 60 hours is a very long workshop. Yeah, you have to be there six, seven days or the whole day and do a lot of activity because we were really strict with that. Uh, 35 activities were, were done. The first topic was about, and not repeating myself, but just uh, remind you that for the first one was about uh, maps and plans and uh, this shift on scale. Every time I gave a presentation, or my colleagues, they gave a presentation on that here, for example, maps, and you can see Fermer or Aldorfer or Leonardo or contemporary artists. So a lot of new information how you can use maps or what features maps um, can have, at attributes, contemporary artists, um, the, the filtering, the symbols, the labels. So that was the first session. The second session was this terrain modeling, the surface, the relief, Charles Jenks, for example, Isamo Noguchi, Lawrence Harprin, uh, topographic names of landforms, landscape places, so everything which can be related, like a big mind map, opening your attention to, to these. The third chapter is non-figurative spatial installation, so the 20th century sculpture and art, land art, kinetic art. The fourth one is the architecture of flora and fauna, because uh, when you think about fauna and, and uh, animals, how can animals construct something, you know, nest, in any case, that um, draws the, um, that is interesting for the kids, yeah? So if you can combine with a, a scientific, scientific attribute. And the last one was contemporary architecture, because that is what was specially asked for us to teach them that contemporary architecture is now what we live in and they should understand a little bit better. So we did the 35 exercise. I'm not going to tell you all, but just raising you seven. And these are here now the teacher's solution. The first one was a Tarzan house or a tree house, canopy house. First, we do a painting with oil pastels from our hand, establishing a wood or tree. And then you have to build up something on this wood that is immediately destroying all the classical house roof chimney. Yeah? because you can have swings and ladders, and how would you place items on a on a trunk? So um, the mix style is oil pastel and balsa wood and some very tiny, elegant wood uh, pieces. The second one is a combination of them. When you really do it in 3D, at the bottom you can see plaster, plaster in sand. So you have sand for uh, six, seven centimeters and then plaster. You put in certain long standing sticks, you wait for 10 minutes, the sand comes out, you elevate, and then you have a heavy bottom, yeah? And it, it half kilogram at the bottom, so you can really construct in the upper part and it will not collapse and not uh, turn to the side. And it's a playground or could be a playground. Every time with the teachers, we were thinking about how you can link this technique this problem, this technique with the ideas of kids, for example, in, in social difficulties, because playground is, for example, useful everywhere, everywhere they wish to swing or to have a play uh, equipment. <clears throat> the next one is an um, exercise first, a collage exercise on play sculptures of the 70s. In America, there were a lot of, lots of nice play forms designed by sculptors and artists and not about just uh, playground studios or play equipment studios or artists made them. So first they designed a montage and then after this exercise that you get familiar with the forms, it was just black white copies and they had to cut out and, and place them next to each other. But after that comes the clay activity from white clay, which is a play for form, a play um, ice ice melting form or a ski form or a ramp for how do you say this board board uh, sorry I don't know the name of the skate skateboard sorry yeah skateboard zone for example so you can link it depends on which which group you have five years girl or 18 years boy and then you change your uh, uh, way of ex explanation but you can use these little figures from Lego or kinder um, 
ice and they said, OK, this is a playground for your little um, Lego feature. Huh? And then you imagine yourself being in that scale while you are doing a very non forgerative and easy exercise from clay because clay is a difficult thing to make sculpture for. Uh, actually, I think plays are important for kids. Arpad Sabadur said that every object, what you do for yourself, you will like it much more than when you buy it. So this is a very simple game for a ball, finding the hole inside of that sheet. You know, you have to balance it until you get to that point. And that is made now from, from wood, wooden sticks, and then you can add very nice painting, shames. Um, you can, this is here four different types, but if you have it with one group, you can tell each of it, yeah? <clears throat> and the seventh exercise is a collage or assemblage, I would say assemblage of building materials, what you can find in your household, um, in the papa's uh, old storage, um, elements, plants, section drawings, and how to combine them in a non figurative composition, which is also developing your sense of composing. So this is what we, what really we did uh, with the teacher. Soap, metal, plaster, um, structures of bamboo and paintings. This is here the spaghetti painting. You saw it in the previous slide, the black and white of kids. This is here the painting of, uh, of the teachers, but of course they are much more trained or soap carving at the bottom. Uh, I think some of them are listed, many of them are listed in, in the book, but not, not all. What was important for us that we did collaborative group works as well. For example, here is a map, map art on Google Earth, uh, printing or aquarel group or tempera group. And after the group work was over, they had to transform this into a um, board game. You have to find a rule. What is your, your rule and how you how you transform into a board game. And after each session, we had the feedback. Yeah, we were discussing how would you tell this to kids? How would you tell, how would you evaluate? How would you start this pro problem? Or what can you do after with the objects? For example, this is here ice, ice melting sculptures. OK, they are ready. And then what can you do with them? You can use light to have shade on the wall or you can put them on water. So we were discussing about before and after the project. How can you combine? In the final exhibition, each teacher had about 35 uh, art objects they exhibited for an hour in a pop up exhibition to make the photographs and to see also for themselves how much they uh, they did. I think it could be part of a contemporary exhibition almost. OK, they are art teachers, um, but they were all very su surprised about them themselves. Yeah, how successful and how many things really we we did if we forced uh, them on time. What is the goal of this training? I'm not asking them to copy myself or to copy the exercise of the studio because that's that's not the point that you can you can go home now and then you can copy my exercise. No, the point is that you can find out an own exercise in maps or in terrain modeling. Maybe you are a surfer, yeah, you're doing surf, windsurfing, and then you have some experience about the waves of the water. So please bring yourself in the, the topic and try to make um, each group, in each five of the group, you have to find out an own exercise. So we had more uh, Zoom discussions. You can see here, for example, Kati showed her that this is what I like, this is what I found, but I don't really know what to do. Uh, I want to use stones. So we discussed together which activity for which year, for which style would be the best. I think that was the mo most uh, effective and most successful part of this whole training program. It was the three Zoom discussion, what we actually, we also recorded. Here are B, B hostels hotels, so ecologic towers. That was an idea and then how you can create from that something else, so how the materials are. So we had these Zoom sessions and then you can see here now examples of the students, yeah, who were the teachers, how what they have handed in finally. The endlessness of Kelta, knot forms, mountains and the technique is also described, so you have to find out the technique, the inspiration, a description, Description. You have to make it, yeah, and then you have to document yourself and write down. It was about 15 page per person, so they need, did a, a nice exercise 
um, maybe it was inspired by Calder or a, a landform or a map. Here it's just visual uh, uh, visual material because we cannot go now into deep. Yes, but you can see that is a mixture. I like very much this way of text and picture very closely together. I don't like this appendix style of pictures at the end. <laughs> No, because we are inspiring ourselves from the reality and, and from the um, photographs of scientific and architectural elements. So 14 page, 17 page. Here, for example, this final material is a um, <clears throat> concrete, what you can, uh, is a soft concrete brick. And then he found uh, cave houses for that. I think the best idea comes if you match the problem and the material the best way together yeah the best material to express that and i made a questionnaire a feedback questionnaire of course that was in hungarian so i just will note some of the um, the findings but for me that was not enough to ask you okay how was you satisfied yeah one to five okay uh, how would you satisfy the teachers okay one to five no i wanted to really understand what happened in them so how in which uh, of your skills developed the most what you expected and how was the which was the most exciting topic which was the most difficult to understand or how would you, what was your greatest experience and really the, the teachers took a lot of time to uh, answer to our questions how did you accept yourself yeah, while doing these so they did really gave us nice answers. For example, one important that why you came here or what you have learned the most is the new ideas, the fantasy, the new materials and the new facts and the knowledge, not the old things of an art teacher like color or perspective or 3D skills, but really the, 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 the new inspiration. Or for example, another question was which difficult, which topic was the most difficult to understand and you see here the yellow got 50%, uh, which was the non-figurative art. And I think that's the, an important point why the teachers are so much afraid of teaching contemporary art, because they cannot link it with things. They cannot link with the horse, with the princess, with the house, what to link with. And they rather avoid it and then use money and, you know, Dali, because you can link it with your dreams, link it with something. So we really pressure put the pressure on, on 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 abstract things and maybe because all of the abstract things have a have a symbol or a reference to our everyday life so you can always link it uh, somehow and to be braver in that field of of uh, abstract expressions in in art and finally uh, if you should evaluate yourself how much you have developed during this uh, whole training program the 80% said they developed 30, this was the maximum, 30% 30, um, um, 30 richer than, than before. So absolute or 20. Yeah, the, the green one, which I was not developing at all, didn't get any points. So they really get new inspiration. And finally, that is the last slide, um, which was um, one of the quotation that uh, when we did the exercise, I was sure that I couldn't do it. Yeah, Before the exercise, I thought I won't be able to do it because I never done such things. But meanwhile doing, I realized that I can. Yeah? So the action, the process of doing made me more um, sure about that I can achieve that point or I can do it. So to overcome on ourselves and overcome our own obstacles, uh, that was one of the biggest. And now I understand why the parents, the parents bring the kids to us in the last 45 years. And they always say, oh, you make such good things with my kids. I said, what, what, what exactly? I don't know, but but he changed a lot since they, they participate in these sessions. She's not afraid anymore. She is more brave. She's more brave in, in, in drawing and she don't care about anymore what the boys are telling about her drawing, uh, more relaxed. So a lot of social and, and psychological change happened during these sessions with the kids, but uh, we, we are not doing a research with numeric uh, numbers on what exactly, but uh, this is the point, I think, that they can overcome on their own problems and their own um, fears and um, difficulties and, and their studio, which is like an atelier and very open-minded and very free, helps in that process. So that's why I th think 
that is the best way and not to work in a clean room. Today's task is, dear kids, that we're going to paint. And then they are in our shop. So thank you very much. I hope I could uh, explain all this, what we did. <laughs> Sorry for uh, the mistakes. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I think Anna got her personality through. So you have an idea how this workshop is functioning. And I'm so happy that with Amas, we could share your expertise and those of your colleagues, prize winning designers to teachers of children in need. And now please questions. Yes. Please, what is the name of your book? Like tick. Yeah, yeah, the title no, I'm uh, the, uh, that one. Time means landscape, tear means space, and tar means collection. Okay. But it's funny in Hungarian, you know, it, in English it will be landscape space repository. <laughs> Not funny at all. <laughs> Thank you. And my second question, uh, you spoke about um, visits of uh, kindergartens and about reactions of uh, teachers of those uh, children. Do you work also with these teachers to discuss with them how? Uh, well, this was like a one session, you know, when, when you just go to a place and then you have suddenly do something. Mm -hmm. yeah, but of course, these kindergarten were at least open for us. But uh, after they saw the results, they are very happy. They just haven't thought before that it's going to work. Yeah. So OK, thank you. Teachers, but Anna and associates work with normal primary and secondary school mm -hmm. teachers. Yeah, so here in this in this training program with Amas, it was uh, actually high, high, um, high school. Teachers. Secondary, so secondary. Uh, yes. Yeah, from from the year four to ten. Mm -hmm. I mean, great, great. Sorry, great, great. Yes. So at the age of the children whom these teachers teach are ten to 18, 15, 15. 17, 18. Right. So so that's what that's whom they offered this workshop. I found it. In Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, another question. Thank you for your brilliant presentation. We are from the Czech Republic and we found a lot of uh, uh, things we have in common in uh, uh, regarding the didactic, mm -hmm. uh, didactic uh, um, ways of uh, approaches. It reminds because there's a, we indicated there's a strong uh, still strong influence of Bauhausian didactics in the Czech uh, Republic, and this is what 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 is why your examples are so close to us. Do you recognize also this way of modernistic thinking also in uh, in the task, in assignments, in in the structure of? of graduation of the tasks and, and so on. I never thought about that before. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I never thought about that, but Arpad Chab Sabadosh, when he established that, I think his aims were, were th that kind of thinking together and doing something together, not the, the result, but the experience of being and doing it. That that was his idea and we have to follow that these aims. So I'm following actually his aims in that way, but I never thought about uh, this Bauhaus and um, we have the university here, the MoMA University, which is the Bauhaus University, and they have the similar kind of teaching uh, studios. Yes, yes. I have. I try to do it in the landscape faculty, but you can believe uh, they are, I'm not having so much followers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And how do you cope with uh, with contemporary art forms like postmodern, contemporary, contemporary, ve very contemporary art forms, uh, which are different? No, I don't think so. No. Yeah, you 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 haven't tried to change something like. Uh, um, well, in in this kind of of new languages of art. Changing everything. I think it was misunderstood. Yeah. Okay. You work with contemporary 
gallery in Athens. Yeah, actually, we are. We were in a national gallery, but we were not allowed to use the pictures, or we are not really using the. Um, we are not doing museum pedagogy because we are not mm -hmm. allowed to do. Oh, we are not trained on that, so we'd rather stay in our room and do. But tomorrow, you will see the gallery where okay. we have been. But anyway, we try to, you know, use f not not the museum um, space. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, we we rather use projecting images from wherever. Oh yes, thank you, thank okay. you so much. But what me get I'm sorry. Um, thank you for your presentation. I like uh the way you are representing, and you mentioned some very important things, like there is no task, or you should lose yourself in activity and therefore you um, designed the art teacher training program. But there's one important question I, I'm thinking about because it's the same like um, in Austria. How could we implement this way of thinking and this way of teaching into the regular teacher training program? Because it should be implemented because it's really important for the children on secondary, primary or ele elementary school. <clears throat> Did you get an idea? I'm thinking about it with colleagues, I think approximately since years. <laughs> Very difficult. You know, when my child brings home an A3 copy of a mandala and they have been coloring mandalas from, from September to now, every weekend, every afternoon, mm -hmm. it's very, and I offer my, my help to do a free session in here for the teachers, a training for free for a one day. No, sorry, we don't, uh, we are not interested. So it's difficult to break because they always think about the simplest solution and everything for a teacher which takes more energy, not every teacher, but the majority, which is extra energy, extra material, extra mess. Yeah, no. Um, so uh, somehow the experience of the kids, the smile on their face, that could be the only one thing how you can win. <laughs> Our students have to pass an exam before they could start with the study. And once upon a time, I think approximately uh, two years ago, we got a collection of, Andrea, please could me help? Could you help me? I, I don't remember the English term, Traumfänger. Uh -huh. ah, dream catchers, yes. We got a collection of several dream catchers and everybody said to us, oh, we did it in school. And we said, mm -hmm. and what else are you doing in school in art courses? And yeah, that's it. No, but now I'm in the secur secur uh, I'm secretary of the Hungarian Art Association. So I try to our teacher, art sorry, teacher. the Art Teacher Association, so I try to influence <laughs> them. And also the books go a long way. So the books go a long way and your books, like this creation experience repository or collection, which sounds in Hungarian very poetic, and well, they get to the teachers. And also we have a teacher community. My research group doesn't work. Um, my teachers group has a teacher community which, uh, which consists of 780 teachers. <coughs> and they meet every month. And Anna was there as speaking about the Heek workshop. And however, only like 80 or 60 coaches <laughs> come to one session. Everybody gets the presentations and the background documents. Every single soul from this 780 teachers. And I see that they are using it. It's a slow process, <laughs> but if it's free and readily available, you can always go there and grab. Then you are mm. introducing change. Thank you very much, Anna. Thanks a lot. For Thank you. <clears throat> and sorry that I have to leave it at 3.30 because I have to pick up the kids, the other kids. <laughs> yes, a mother of three, which is great. 
Okay, so now comes. Now comes uh, our colleague from Leeds, the University of Leeds. And uh, and and now comes a very different presentation from those we have heard before. Ki Wung Nam, researcher from the university, is going to discuss us, the community, the AMAS partnership, right? So you, you are going to show us how we function. So this is, okay, let's hope it, we are doing it good, but um, it rarely happens really that we are self-reflecting. We are just very busy getting all the bills ready for financial inspection and whatever. And 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 I'm I welcome Kim and the whole uh, group of the University of Leeds are working on making us conscious about our results. And here we go with the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Gil, and I'm from University of Leeds, and it's very glad to be here in, in, in the Budapest. And first of all, I think I have to apologize to bringing the English weather to, the, to this beautiful Budapest because instead of bringing Tang and Paul, because there are some kind of technical issues with, to bringing them to, to the Budapest. So I'm kind of... Um, so and the, as you see, the the title is slightly changed because I, I I'm, I was kind of we were kind of discussing, but up until yesterday with Tong Tang and Paul about how we present the, this our research outcome our with our partners, and also we uh, we decide to focus on what we have found from the data analysis we we have. So we instead of the uh, sticking with the the original uh, title of the, our presentation, so I will change the the title for exploring the communication skill and strategy uh, for when establishing the long term relationship with the socially engaged art project, and um, because it it is not uh, it is perfect time to kind of listen to some of the kind of theoretical presentation. So I rather have the kind of small small emotion translator uh, on the on the on the right side of the presentation so that you can hear you can see what I have found. Um, so this is our Oh. Good. Actually, I think I need to. I need to share the screen. Um, so, um, so Liz is investigating the, the kind of relationship between the, our stakeholder and our researchers and through the lens of dialogical correspondence. And correspondence means, simply means the interactive. So how we can interact with our, our partners, including in, internal and the external partners. And also we are focused on the researcher's perspective. So because we, our participants, so all of us, and someone, someone from someone from AMA's project, as well as the other pro project partners that we have in the lease. So, um, so what it come up with the, uh, some of the research question that uh, concerning with the out outcome of our, our our data analysis. So how does communication plays a role within the complex context with the wicked problem? The wicked problem is kind of really entangled the situation between the stakeholder and, the, and also the because we have so much 
kind of stakeholder involved in the project. So we have to be kind of really conscious of their kind of relationship. And also, in what way where we can uh, design led methodology can dismantle the and understand the communication strategy and visualize those kind of complex relationship. So uh, we our current finding is heavily on the communication strategy between the stakeholders. So the method we are use we use is bespoke the also ethnographic tool for the data collection, and it is developed by the Dr. Paul Wilson, and it is published on the, the other papers. And also we have ten participatory workshops using the Miro, and and and, the, and also the Microsoft Teams, and we have total twenty one researchers from uh, fifteen from the Amis project and six from the other partners, and we use the the, the code. POM metrics. And POM metrics is a people, objective, and method metrics developed by the Paul Wilson. And we also use the thematic analysis and also the data visualization. And we also use the Miro as the space we explore the communication strategy. But I we we do understand because the Marie is express her kind of frustration by you when using the Miro because Miro is an online platform for the whiteboard. So one of one of our our focus on kind of parallel uh, research for the in 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 terms of the AMS project is to kind of developing how, how we can deliver uh, as we as we much we do on the offline into the, into the online. So the auto ethnographic tool means the kind of it, it is kind of mapping with the the, the 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 tool that we use for the auto ethnographic tool is kind of try to not our researchers to kind of try to think about what you have done for the in terms of the building the relationship with your external partners. So it is combining and connecting and interweaving theories and it is also experienced the reflections and discourse and memories and imagination. So this is kind of notching our uh, our researchers. So it also has the four distinctive paces so including association and build up and continuation and transformation. And it will be it will be explained a little bit further in the next slide. So uh, for in terms of the initial findings that I have to examine what we can find from the in data from our partners. So we analyze the data from the Italy and Hungary or to try to examine what we can find further for the for the initial finding. So as you can see on the GIS file, the the kind of stakeholder map it became really, really complex and it is more kind of they they they're kind of strong bond together and it is also changing. I mean um, it depends on what the roles of the stakeholder for each stage. So for example the, the partners means the partners from the other country and the researchers is uh, the AMS researchers and participants are open the external part external participants and gatekeeper is as you know the the one who are who support or to kind of connecting with the, with the researchers to the research target and the artist is kind of plays a really critical role in the AMS project they are some they are played as an artist external stakeholder but they sometimes become our key members of the AMS project So uh, before going further for what we have uh, uh, what we have discussed for the data analysis, I'd like to mention the notion of the correspondence. And the notion of correspondence is simply give and take. So it is so it is defined by the ingle, but it is simply means the being there with your partner and then share what you think, and then it is kind of building some of the constructive relationship with your partners. And also the, the roles and expectations of the individual and organizations are different and they also change in, changed as the time by. So this also kind of uh, apply for the POM metrics the poll develops. So it is kind of applied for the, the data analysis. So what we have found for the uh, initial finding, 
And the, the art, the on art, by, art based social research is uh, entail the transformations of top law among the stakeholders. Sometimes they just become an observer and sometimes they just key, they, they become a key member of the activity. And also the, the as I said, the, the network is getting really, really complex. And like, like for example, they, the situation changed and need changed and sometimes stakeholders are joining and leaving and those kind of environmental changes also making the, those kind of relationships really, really complex. So what do we have found for the for first, for the initial uh, data analysis is three key partnership essentials of knowing each other and knowing their skills and knowing the necessity of the flexibility. So while I'm kind of trying to understand what is happening between within ourselves and within our partners, and we I came up with the ideas of uh, this kind of uh, kind of condensed sentence. Um, so our researchers, uh, we uh, by knowing by knowing each other, the researchers are strengthening their skills to tackle their social challenges, which require the flexibility in collaboration. So it is uh, so the, the, the guy is kind of a little bit uh, busy at the moment because we have to analyze the data and, and the, we I, I scaled up the, the data for the whole set. So it is about um, 20, 21 people and things and so all the different things and it took uh, quite a lot, a lot of time, but um, kind of, I tried to mapping the as simple as possible. The, but this is not actually that simple, but I'm kind of trying to um, categorize the passages from our participants uh, by, by categorized by the knowing each other and skills and being flexible. And then the arrow is actually drawn by what, what depends on what the, our participants say during the during the interview. So, uh, so the digits is kind of a little bit smaller than the, the previous one because we uh, we categorize the what they have mentioned. So the I kind of cut grouped uh, the the passages into three different categories. And then we, for example, the knowing each other helps the understanding their values and personal relationship, and identify the opportunities and respect their cultures. And the the alien color for. for that the, the, for example, there is some kind of blue one um, on, on the knowing each other. It's actually below, originally, I thought that would be belong to the skills, but it is actually by reviewing the actual interviews with our participants, it became the, the, the our participants are really mentioned that they're about the understanding their value. So I'm kind of trying to move around for this specific activity to categorize as, as correctly as possible. So this is the whole picture of what we have discussed in the mirror board. Um, I don't think Maria really liked it, is, but um, a mirror, but mirror. I mean, because you know, mirror is kind of newly introduced the online platform, and there is many things to be improved. And there, is, like I said, that is one of our objective to as an outcome of the the MS project. So we have some of the master students working on how they can uh, facilitate the kind of easier use of the this kind of online platform and how the facilitator, the researchers like us can manage to uh, perform the online uh, platform or uh, online workshop as easier as possible. So. So as you, uh, as I can kind of looking a little bit further for what we what I have discussed and um, what I have uh, found during the uh, data analysis. What I have found is we have the three different categories, like I said, the knowing each other and skills and, and flexibility. And I found that the knowing each other is the core of the, our relationship. So we have to we have to know each other in, not in the personal life and also the professional life that we know. For example, we I know someone from the Paco and he I know I, I know more, uh, some of you know the Fabrizio from the Paco and I know he is fan of AC Milan and he really makes good pizzas and and I, those kind of things that really help us to build up some kind of 
fundamental the, the relationship. Well, in, even if we are developing the kind of uh, professional relationship with them. So it, they're kind of interacting each other. And then actually the, the very outer layer is the, I call it being flexible, but being flexible is also related to the challenges. And because of the challenges sometimes often needs to be being flexible. So So what the so what the kind of partnership essential the knowing each other's skills and that what what how they work in our data analysis is if you can see on the kind of left top corner so you can see uh, different colors about and I color code it the, the each activity so the yellow one uh, means the the kind of challenges that we have, we need to that needs to the that needs the flexibility. And the red one is the kind of knowing each other, the core ability of the relationship. And the, the blue one is the kind of um, the skill set that needs to tackle the yellow challenges, the yellow circles challenges. So each, each stage has their, their own challenges and skill set and their core abilities of the researchers. So we, I also uh, analyze the, I also draw the tree map in order to understand how our researchers, our partners are mentioned for kind of specific uh, activity or specific skill set need required by each stage. So I also throw through some tree maps. So it, it kind of kind of resonate to, to the kind of or, original research question that I had. So how the communication used to tackle the wicked challenges of socially engaged art? So in, in the different stages of partnership, so if we if we are looking back to the uh, the whole of data set, I found that the, the individual communication skills are critical, especially for the association page, um, like like for in person meetings and emails and phone phone calls are really really critical at the first stage of the of the partnership, like like kickoff meetings. One of our partners are mentioned the significance of the kickoff meeting that we have in protocol at the first and, and also the early collaboration is also very uh, uh, critical for the whole project. So one of our partners uh, mentioned that the uh, for her the physical presence is real so you have to be in there and you have to interact with the person physically so that uh, because of the COVID situation, they, it, they cannot connect and interact with the with the partners in person. So it is big obstacle uh, for us to, and it is kind of preventing the building kind of trust world with the, with their partners. So the association page, it is really really critical to be meet them in person and call them in person so that you can understand your partners as much as you can. And, the, and the secondly, the communication skills are diversified and enriched in the build up and continuation page and communication skills are diversified into the, the bureaucratic and the academic and communities and public domains and it has to be tailor made because to and it is it, the, those kind of strategies have to be planned. Uh, very early stages of the page, but it is actually executed between within the stages of build up and continuation page. So one of our partners also mentioned that they, they, they uh, she wants to kind of reach the as as broader audience as possible so that they can build some of the kind of uh, the community that share their knowledges and experience with the with this project so that they can intervene the policy making process in the later. So it, especially for the transformation page, uh, it is transformation page is, is kind of tipping point for the long term relationship. So individual level of communication is dominance and like like uh, what the, like that we have at this moment. So kind of we meet meet uh, meet together and then share what we have come up and then we can share some of the really good idea for the next project. And many part by doing so, the many partners are emotionally bond with the stakeholder at the end of the project. So that we can extend to the further relationship with our partner. 
So the, um, this is kind of uh, the, uh, the this is young partner. This is actually from Brazil and for the other partners. And then she uh, actually uh, mentioned that the marginalized community, and then they came to see her presentation in in her school, and she mentioned that it was the most kind of extremely important life moment of her, of her life because she, her research target is actually visited to listen to what they have done. And the, she also want to help them further. So she keep introducing the research type, the marginalized group for another, another for her student so that they can keep uh, benefiting from uh, the her students. So they can keep the students are uh, keep publishing the paper and the marginalized group having keep uh, further solutions of how can how they can tackle their so, challenges in their societies. So that that really is our kind of future work in from our side. So we are kind of to try to develop the MOOC out of this the, what we have found so far, and we also investigate the. And we, we I think we also need to investigate the external partners' perspective because we are currently focused on. Uh, ourselves. I mean, we are focused on the researchers' perspective, and it has to be extended to the external partner, so that we can, even if we see that it is the, this is kind of right uh, solution for the partners, and then when if, if our external partner doesn't see any value of our proposal, then there will be make, don't make sense. So, I think we have to extend our researches. I mean, at least have to be at least uh, extend our research to the external partner. And by doing so, I mean, it is also uh, important to kind of understand how to consolidate the various views of the, our stakeholder into the one uh, one solution to maximize the project outcome and from the online or, and also the offline platform. And we also plan to kind of systemic uh, analysis for this whole journey by using the service blueprint and also the customer journey map because the in terms of the customer journey map, we have to put our research target for the as a customer so that we can understand uh, we can uh, specify the solution for our partners. So um, I, I, I would like to conclude the uh, uh, the kind of the, my presentation with the uh, uh, famous uh, quote from William Shakespeare. I think I, I personally believe that it, even if we are working as a professional, we need to be friends with each other. We need to be friends so that we can develop, we can successfully deliver the project outcome for this one and then continue for the next one. So he said that the friend is the one that you know who you, that the friend is the one they know you you as you are, and also they understand where you have been, and also accept the, the what you have become, and also the the end the, the still gently allow you to grow. So, like I said, they know each other and knowing their skill and being flexible to challenge to tackle the challenges and and the goals and challenges for them is really, really important. So, uh, thank you very much for your attention and um, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions and comments, then I will really happy to answer that. Thank you. It's nice to hear that we have to be friends to work successfully together. And actually, I deeply believe in that. And now we are taking the questions for Key. Yep. Yes. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. Very interesting. Thank you again. Uh, we we just sorry for talking so much because it was about about what you told us. <laughs> um, uh, there was a slide with um, try, uh, such yeah. a net, and one of those peaks were uh, gatekeepers. Could you tell us something about about this position? Who are gatekeepers? What was their role? How how they function in the system? Um. 
Yeah, it was uh, like was, very. Yes, that, that that's one. it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. So, okay. um, basically, uh, what what I had analyzed for that specific one is if our puppy are mentioned, so if they if she. Okay, I will stay close to the to the microphone. And uh, if they mention their relationship with the, like for example, artist and participant, if there is no mention between them, then we I don't draw the line. But if they say there will be a strong relationship with the gatekeeper and artist, then we still we I draw the the bold line. So it is kind of uh, I because I kind of classify each passages from the participant, I mean our participant, and then if they mention the specific relationship between um, the gatekeeper, for example, gatekeeper and the artist, and then they, I draw the line. And if there is some kind of questionable relationship, then I draw the dotted line. And if there is the, uh, the, if, the he, if she or she mentioned that the relationship, but it, it is not strong enough to build that uh, relationship. I just draw the little bit thinner line, so that the uh, the border, the border, and is the the thickness of the border is kind of uh, the strength of these two kind of two stakeholders within within that map. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us who is the gatekeeper in Amas? Um, gatekeeper is uh, for. Um, I think I can. I can because we we are all the AMS project and we yes. I can tell. And the gatekeeper, for example, for the for the, for the barcode perspective, I mean they have the photographer, but the photographer is not directly connected with the Paco. There is a photographer's association. So are kind of linking those kind of photographer for each reason. So the, the photographer's association is the gatekeeper who connect with the Paco with the each photographer. So the, the gatekeeper is kind of playing a role as kind of connecting Paco with the with the photographer, and that also happened to the another partners as well. So gatekeeper is key role to kind of you know sometimes you know um, we have another project. Uh, we had uh, the Leeds had the previous project called Party, and it is also done with the the Paco as well. And one of the key uh, gatekeeper for the Party project is uh, the organization called uh, San Institute because the uh, the, that uh, that project, the the marginalized group in Africa, is our our target, but the, we cannot connect with the the marginalized group di directly because they are all spread up the the whole whole of the Africa. So we have the institute who support that marginalized group, and then those kind of th that institute is play the key gatekeeper for the project so they can collect they can can gather some people from the from the sun tribe so that they can educate the, those kind of marginalized people so that they have some kind of specialized education center who educate those kind of marginalized group so that uh, gate the gatekeeper is a key play the key role so those kind of people we call the gatekeeper Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 is what we have found for the data analysis. Because sometimes gatekeeper plays so important for the for the project, so they become the researchers for the for the project. So I'm kind of keeping keep uh, giving you the same example for the for the for the one that we done for the Africa. The the uh, the, the gatekeeper for kind of connect the sun. Uh, I mean the sun try for the that education and the institute played so critical for our research. So they are one of our researchers. And what I think um, because I, I leave, I have to leave well that project because I have to complete my PhD and then I don't I have no idea what the rest of the projects have done. But anyway, they, uh, they also have some kind of researchers, uh, San, San student, as the key researchers of our project as well. So in that case, our gatekeeper 
become one of our own researchers for the project. So that is happening for every kind of socially engaged art project, which requires the kind of uh, networking uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what about the person from the administration management? Yep, there, there is. Um, I Back, think background persons in. Uh, I think that you know, that is. Um, I would say that uh, the admi administrative uh, staff, like uh, like the financial um, and financial mm -hmm. officer for the whole um, mm -hmm. uh, project officers and from the university, the whole university, and then. I wouldn't say that they are gatekeeper, but because they are not connecting the other people from the uh, to include that for the yeah, project. Yeah, but they influence the distribution yes. of funds, yes. which is very important, sometimes crucial for the project. Yes, that's that, that's the way that because that uh, that is uh, what I define. I'm, I'm, I would say that those kind of people will be, um, I would say, the partners initially. But they become the researchers. I mean, the partners. Uh, I, although I said the partners is from the another institution, but partners also means the the internal partners, like like you said. So they they become sometimes they become researchers. So it's like if they they uh, they do some kind of same research, like like Melanie did for the mm -hmm. ASM project. She's managing the project, but at, mm -hmm. at the meantime, she also publishes some of the relevant papers out of our project. So she is also partnered. In the meantime, she also the researchers of Amy's project. Yeah, thank you so much. Any other questions? I have the microphone. Use it if you have other questions. If not, then thank you very much, Ki. Thank you for your contribution. And in case Diedrich Show now is watching us, I hope he is. We have known each other with Diedrich for 40 years, 4-0. Yes, we met at the very first conference we, both of us, ever visited from INSEA. It was in 1982. And then Diedrich Schoenau, myself and Peter Hermans, another interesting evaluation specialist, we found out that we wanted two things, reform INSEA, International Society for Education through Art. We thought it was very old fashioned. It did not cater for the needs of young, ambitious researchers like ourselves. And second, to introduce in art education accountability. Well, I wonder if we managed, but Diedrich actually became president of INSEA. I became vice president and Peter Hermans became secretary. And there we were. It's always horrible when you get what you want. Yes, this is always. Oh, Diedrich is here. Lovely, lovely. You can see him. Yes. So, oh, uh, yes, you we were there. We were standing there and it was it was quite fascinating to realize some of our aims. Now I'm going to talk a little about with a keen eye on the on the clock about yes Carpati Amas about our objectives did we achieve them because with Sophie Lindstrom and her associates a very ambitious literature review project with more than 10,000 documents was performed and it turned out that previous projects were not really accountable. They just uh, focused on visual, um, visual arts, fine arts, and not all of them had enough stakeholders involved and sustainability was also questionable. OK, so once we had these results and many more that you can see in, in her publications, then uh, then we, we could. OK, right. then we could could be very ambitious and see if we can do it better. I wonder if we can, but 
it is the time now that we can see what worked in our project. That is just one of the views that you have, my view, and it is based on the book that I edited with your kind collaboration. And I've, I chose a quote from Benjamin Franklin. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I will learn. I find it quite fascinating from Benjamin, who used to be a craftsman before he became the first president of the United States. He used to be a carpenter, an electrician, whatever. So working with hands. What we actually performed was involvement because the Amos testbed had 35 experiments in total with 14 stakeholder workshops. That's quite impressive, isn't it? 35 experiments performed. Yes, so here are our aims that I'm not going to read you. I'm just, I'm just telling you the most essential feature. So our first aim was capturing, assessing and harnessing, taming the societal impact of the arts. We wanted to see what works. We wanted to show how it works and we wanted to keep it on working. So we wanted to build national local strategies, activate communication networks, reach out beyond the traditional spaces. You could see wonderful. Everything is a place. Rivering. Was it rivering? Yes. OK, so we are everywhere in the landscape and we wanted to use definitely use digital technologies because for an unknown reason, disadvantaged arts projects did not benefit from visual digital technologies. So here is the Amas book that I'm going to base my short presentation on. It looks very good and it has images from Paco, from, from Malta and from APEC. Yes, Portugal and shows different age groups, different activities all the three showing the power of the arts and here are the different chapters and visual arts for social inclusion. So we documented all our projects, a selection of 27 out of 35 because the pilots were not always documented. But the Amas book is about 300 pages and it's a good read reviewed by three international experts, one of whom we luckily have here, Professor Stadzaha from Austria, and, and we have uh, Dirk Schoenau from the CETO Netherlands consultant online. So it's a reviewed, peer-reviewed, language-reviewed, whatever, collection of what we think worked. But we went a step further. We also compiled an assessment document uh, about the different methods that visual arts education has been and will be assessed, hopefully. We looked at models of holistic assessment in studio practice, so we did not want to single out certain cognitive skills or affective um, skill sets, or we did not only preach about motivation, how marvelous it is in our projects. But we actually looked at, um, at a history a little bit in this document from how art education assessment started. It started rigidly like hell, as you can see with the, um, with the, on the image, and it ended with interactive, digital, online, collaborative, whatever, assessment practices. So we collected all sorts of assessment features, even a, this heat map that shows how you feel in the beginning or during your museum session. And of course, when you look at pictures like that, you can say, oh, they did a marvelous project. Everybody was happy. So what? And you could hear the Malta team telling, so what? Proving 
the types of skills that were developed during the project, the before and after states that were manifest. And also you can see, you can read in the book about a mathematics and art project. Math and art, why? Because most of the kids from disadvantaged families end up being jobless out of every part of society because they go, do not go through in mathematics, physics and science in general. So we spiced it up with arts and even girls could attain good results. Uh, you can read it about, about it in detail in the book. So let's go on with our aims. We wanted to create sustainable projects that will go on after the termination of funding. And here I chose as an example the theatre projects. I don't know why, but I think if you consolidate a method that is embedded in a practice of drama education that is already there. So art, visual art education, music education is there. Drama education, however, is also popular. So in terms of literature education, you will find drama. History educators are using drama. So I think sustainability is when you are bringing in new genres, you don't just get children paint and draw, but you are exploring very, very different paths. Sustainable is a project when stakeholders like it. So that's why the Miro board used here by the University of Lapland team, um, looking at what stakeholders want, what they need, what they can, and discussing it with them and getting stakeholders scribble on different pieces of paper and just finding out what these researchers want to get them swallow. The biggest problem in research and practice is that there is no bridge. We are shouting from the two parts of a river looking for a bridge. So the stakeholder involvement sessions in a mass, they are the bridge or they may be. And of course, what I also find very sustainable is going out and reaching the population where you find them. Also from Lapland, the Nordic projects, when they went there and Satu was lying in the, in the snow and, and, and just wearing a, an old belt coming from another family tradition. So, OK, when you don't preach from your capital city or from a posh university lecture hall, but if you, when you go there, get cold, lie in the snow, then you have the chance of being sustainable. That at least this is how I think. Redu reducing isolation was an AMAS aim. So on top of my every slide, you can see an AMAS objective. Reducing isolation among women, children, minority groups, whoever, from peripheral EU regions through participation in the arts. And here I have as examples, the two Hungarian museum projects. Why? I've, I've told you to, uh, today before, you have you see the museum building out of your ghetto dwelling. It's standing there. It's the symbol of a culture you cannot reach out to. And then one day you hear from your art teacher that tomorrow we're going to go there and you are not happy at all. But OK, it's school time, so you do go to the museum, the National Gallery or the Ludwig Museum. And there you are, and it turns out it's fun. And the barrier is broken. You are immersing, immersing yourself in a culture that's called high culture, high above your head. And now you are inside. And both Hungarian projects, you can see, kids working in the studios of the museums and lying on the floor midst of expensive artwork. You're just there sitting, lying, whatever. Isn't it nice? So both projects have teachers manuals. Teachers manuals that are sent for free to the teachers and tell them, invite them to go in. And they have teacher training courses too. 
educating women and children through arts-based approaches. These are self-portraits of, uh, of the Roma cultural influencers that they made at the end of their course because we wanted to, uh, wanted to empower those most in need. And if you're a marginalized group traveling around like, like the Roma do, in the United Kingdom, when I first went to a university, there was a door saying traveler research. And I volunteered. I said, yes, I'm coming from Hungary. I was in my 20s. I think I'm a traveler. So is this, is this the place where? No, no, this is the Roma because they tra travel. I didn't know. The Roma are forced to settle in my country. So I realized that, yes, there is Roma research. It should be there, but we have to get to know who they are, really. And as I, I can see in Paco, going to ghetto children, actually, I was there, Catanzaro, Palermo, Naples. I was with a cameraman who happened to be my son, be my son 190 centimeters, very muscular. And the Paco girl said, well done. This is how you go to these schools. And we went there and there was beauty. There was beauty and freedom and expression and whatever. But getting there through those houses, oh Jesus, that was tough. So empowering means you go to disadvantaged populations like you can see the APEC image also with the elderly. For me, an elderly, by the way, 60 plus, the most, the biggest experience was that we are a marginalized minority. And yes, thinking twice, I think we are. Whenever I enter a, an office, the clerk says, do you have an internet access? thinking I'm deaf and I am a computer illiterate. It always happens. So yes, yes, all the girls like this one on the bottom of my of my slide, we are a marginalized community. It's lovely that we are getting that. Marginalized communities appear on the web. And here are Roma uh, online presents slides. We did a huge study. We studied 14,000 Roma images on Instagram. We have a crawling, um, a gathering software for that. And these are the negative ones you can see on the left. And the positive ones are not much better, I see, because they are so, they are happy, happy, and we drink, yes, we dance, yes, and then we get aggressive. So this is, this is the Roma presence on the internet, not just in Hungary, which is funny because we did the crawler software experiment in Europe in general. And our Roma influencer girls are filling in photographs of a different nature, just, just to get the image on Instagram a bit more varied. So yes, yes, we are doing dealing with disadvantaged minorities, changing the seen. And here we go back to Paco, where I said I, I witnessed and I find it utterly fascinating for one, for uh, where Carolina told us a lot about it. I emphasize one aspect, the exhibition. Their works were shown to the community. If you are having an art studio exercise, being happy with the kids in the schoolroom or outside somewhere, the parents won't care. But once you are exhibited in a house of culture and the mayor or somebody important, of course, politicians love it, go there to get photographed with the, with the kids who, who were empowered and enhanced. I think then there is a bridge being built. Of course, we wanted to go further and we wanted to, a mass objective again, decolonize institutions and enable communication and implement policies. For months and months, we toiled over the Amas policy white paper with uh, Sofia Lindstrom and Carolina Guterres Nova again. And here are all the others, uh, other co-authors, Melanie Sarantu, of course, involved and several other people from the partnership. 
White papers are short normally. The Amas book is more than 300 pages. The white paper is about 30. So we hope and in the end there are suggestions. And here are some of the suggestions, diversification of funding, assessment of the outcomes of projects. So we have quite, quite lovely suggestions here in the white paper. And of course, it is always good to see that suggestions for stakeholders and poli policy makers are based on findings not from the top of our heads, not wishful thinking. That's what one of the policymakers told me. Oh, Andrea, another way, white paper. Ah, you are, what do you want from us? I said, nothing. We just want to tell you what you should do based on research. So the big difference from pre amas arts-based interventions and post amas ones that we have evidence. We, what we say is true at least for us, with the limitations that we always give, small groups, not representative, whatever. All right, we want participatory and intersectional governance in decision making. How wonderful that everybody, everything is being decided above our heads and broad and social participation because we, we show you that it works. How can you do it? People can say from a mass and we show you how we can do it. The policy roadmaps booklet is a, a wonderful selection of, of not selection really, all the partners are involved. It shows you what has been done and where you should go on country by country. No such collection exists. People always hand in proposals saying nothing has been done in my country in this field. You cannot tell that anymore because we have the policy roadmap booklet, booklet and I especially love the United Kingdom part by uh, Dr. Tang Tang and Dr. Paul Wilson and Associates because it is so concrete. It has wonderful infographics about where you start and where to where you go next and what is available in in the United Kingdom and what not for art based social interventions. Just look at this lovely way of uh, showing infographics that they developed. And of course, you can evaluate and develop new policy frameworks as it was or aim in amass using arts to overcome social challenges. Social challenges are with us and now they are increasing. Now that I speak, 600, 650,000 refugees from Ukraine have entered our country and about 370,000 stayed. In a country of 9.5 million inhabitants, that's a new full lot. And they speak a Slavic language and Hungarian is not. We are a finno ugric language. Just imagine a kid being faced with Hungarian, Kösönöm, Jónapot and things. So we have these, these migrants or asylum seekers, refugees, and Amas can help them get integrated and and everything is there. Everything is shared and documented. That's my favorite in the middle because it looks like a Mayakovsky brochure from 1919, just after the Russian Revolution. Do you know what happened then? The greatest artists alive, many of them lived actually in Soviet Russia, not for long, by the way, poor Mayakovsky is, a, is an example. In 1921, he was already executed. But in 1919, he was publishing brochures like that, along with Kandinsky, Larionov, Goncharova, and all the others, artists who cared for social change. And that's why I love this documents of social engaged art booklet by Vela and Sarantu editors um, and all the others, the invisibility daughters. How nice the invisible invisibles. That's the title of the journal 
but that's the title of our groups and they had a special issue and there was multi review of educational special issue and once again our lovely book so we did publish and let me uh, let me end with the virtual exhibitions of course every presentation will be shared and this presentation was conceived viewing the european Union officials that will hold us accountable. And with this presentation, I wanted to show that we actually did it. We did not only give empty promises, but we did everything that was within our reach. And here is the title of the book that we will not go public as yet, because I still have to find a publisher. The one I approached did not want to publish after half a year of pondering around the issue um, with no reason given. Oh, well, uh, this publisher said that it's too educational and they are an art publishing company. So it's, uh, now I'm going to approach the educational publishing houses and Corvinus University has the funds from Amas to print it, so it will be printed no matter what. And you are getting copies and you can give it as a thing to your stakeholders to hold the stake, to hold the books in their hands and look at them and say, oh great, I, you, I am on the title page. And, and, and I thought I didn't count. And now I am a title on a type page of a big thick book. I think it's marvelous, isn't it? So it will be published. The complete volume is available on SharePoint without an ISBN number. Because once I'm asking for an ISBN number, then it's over. Then I cannot offer it to a publisher. Then it's published. So I'm getting it on SharePoint only with the kind permission of, of Satu Miatinen, our chief investigator, and keep it there for a couple of months in the hope of having a publisher. Then you're getting emails about it and an ISBN number. To conclude, now it's just 23 minutes. Bravo, Andrea. I did not over speak. I think we managed something quite substantial. We developed and evaluated 35 projects. Great. And as we could see from the Leeds presentation before me, we remained friends. We still smile at each other. So we are also an ample proof that arts are good for social cohesion. Seven different countries, one united Amas partnership. At the end of this, this um, Symposium, we are going to toast on it with champagne. Right here, we deserve it. Thank you very much for your collaboration. <laughs> Thank you. You are very kind. You are very kind. Thanks. Now we have the round table. The round table will be kind of funny. We have the moderator here, that is Dr. Liz Joe, uh, postdoctoral researcher from the University of Boras, Sweden, so Clarence Joe, uh, who will be commemorated as the major author of the white paper. And this will be online. We have Professor Marion Stalta from the University of Graz an art educator, an architect, an environmental culture specialist. We are very happy that you are with, with us. Schönau and Stauzerhaar and also Emil Gaul, whose contribution I'm going to read um, on, on the day of today for the reviewers of the Amas book. And I am very grateful and proud that these three outstanding art educators with a publication list that is really amazing. You uh, graced our book with your reviews. They actually reviewed all of us and we reworked. I must tell you, we took your reviews seriously and we actually reviewed our chapters. Dietrich is here. Oh, hello, hello. That's wonderful. 
thank you for, for inviting me. And thank you so much, Andrea, and the, the team here at Corvinus. It's been a long and wonderful day. Uh, so I, uh, during all these presentations, uh, I prepared for this uh, moderating role by preparing a few questions for, for the reviewers. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, I tried to prepare a few questions for for the uh, reviewers. Uh, so, I maybe that's the way to to, to go. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I can answer your question. Yes, of course. <laughs> but of course, I think what everyone here is interested in is. From your perspective as a reviewer of this book, what do you think has worked? Um, I'm full of ideas. I'm full of pictures. It was it is a pleasure to be here to see your presentations and to get a clue about the things you've did and you will do in future. For me, I got, um, I think, a small insight in that what you have done the last years. It's impressive. I congratulate everybody because I took some notes in my book um, and that was what you see here is and uh, these are remarks I won't forget. I will find it um, now and what I think uh, what has worked is to be in touch, to work with several groups, um, to do in the last year a lot of projects um, which are sustainable, I think so, which will last in the, ne the next time or you will be multiplicators for the people, for the participants. I think that will work. Were there any aspects of the MS project as a whole that you found problematic? That you did you find that there were some promises we made that weren't fulfilled? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. What I've learned today, if we are thinking about marginalized groups, I have never thought about children who got no um, deep art education. I always thought, OK, these are, I think, more or less poor children, children who live in ghettos or something like that. But I never thought about elderly people or students who will get no art education. It opens my mind and that is good. That is um, something I think that does not belong only to me, it does belong to, I think, other people too. And that's a good thing. What could be problematic? Maybe what I've learned in um, projects with which I did the last years, um, we should never promise something. And I think what I've never seen in your presentation, you haven't promised something. You did something with the participants and that's the best thing. That's a great remark. And now we are going to listen to your mouse track. And then we move on to asking questions. Yep. Do you have one? Yes, of course. Finally, I will read what Andrew had to say. Yes. yes. Uh, did any uh, did any uh, results uh, surprise you? Were there any aha moment reading the book? <laughs> <laughs> what surprises me? Me surprises several things, over, but one of them is the. Um, please um, excuse me if I. I can't say the exact name of the project and the uh, project leaders, but the project with the unemployed people, it impresses me a lot because the CVs they did, that they worked out with your help, they were impressive. That's wonderful. Now we are hearing Dietrich. Yeah. Yes. And so. Ah, can I have the microphone so that Diedrich would hear me clearly? Yeah. Diedrich, um, Jofie is going to forward your slides. Just tell her, go on. 
to go on yes, when you are correct. finished. Yep. OK, yep. so that's how you can proceed yep. with the slides. OK, okay. so Diedrich Schoenau, consultant from the CETO, the Dutch testing agency, educational testing service and ex-president of the International Society for Education through Art. The floor is yours. OK, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. OK, uh, maybe you were surprising who GM was. Well, this was not John Malkovich, but it was me. And I was very sorry, and I'm still very sorry, that I am not able to take part in your conference there in Budapest. Just yesterday, my wife had a little accident, and I really was urged to stay here. She's fine by now, so there is no real problem at this moment, but I'm glad that I'm still around here to support her. Anyway, uh, being not present, uh, I had just understood today by one of the presenters that physical presence is real, but although virtually I hope to contribute something to this uh, meeting. Uh, this is not my, well, actually this is the second Amas Symposium, but this is it the first Amas Symposium for me? So that's why it's saying the first Amas Symposium. The next one, please. <clears throat> yes. Okay, when we are talking about margins, we're talking also about pictures. The next one, please. But here we look at the margins, but what's in the picture? The next one, please. Who is in charge of the picture? That was the question I had when I was talking and thinking about margins. Because margins are marginal, but they are essentially essential also to, let's say, making the picture more beautiful. So the next one, please. So I think anyone who is in charge of the picture is also in charge of the margins. And from the point of view of this project, looking at the margins, we really have to think also about the bigger picture. And those who are in, let's say, in positions to be fine who is in the margin, although they often do not so consciously or intentionally, but practically people in the margin have to relate to those in the picture. The next one, please. I was thinking, of course, about marginalization, and this project brought quite a series of margins in my mind and also into the projects, being these cultural margins or geographical marginalization being at the borders of Europe, for instance, intellectual marginalization, who is considered to be, let's say, in the picture, and who are those, intellectually speaking, in the margin. Physical disabled people have been mentioned as well. Political marginalization is another aspect. Psychological marginalization is more related to how do you yourself uh, uh, think of yourself as a person at the margin or not. And of course, social marginalization. So there are a lot of marginalizations, and that is maybe also the, not the problem, but also the consequences of this uh, project that you are addressing a lot of different issues that often very much relate to one another because geographical marginalization can lead to cultural marginalization and can lead to political marginalization and so on. The next one, please. So the, ma the main question is, of course, and it also goes for us here meeting in Budapest. Are you in the picture or next one, please? Are you in the margin? And looking at what I've heard today, listening to what I've heard today and reading the book, I have read the contributions to the book. Uh, next one, please. This is more or less my conclusion. Whenever you are looking at marginality, you, you will understand and then generally feel that you are yourself in some respects also a marginal person, although maybe you are not aware of it, but sometimes you're outside the picture and into the margins. And that's not always wrong. Let's put it that way. It can also be a very good position to stay because then people are not really looking at you and that just sometimes can give you a very good feeling of freedom. The next one, please. So experiencing marginality. Next one. Can be negative, 
that's normally the first reaction being at the margin is not good. But you can also say it's positive, exactly. And that gives you the possibility to say, OK, being marginal is also a kind of being unique as a group, as a person with regard to what is considered normal. The next one. It goes also the possibility of meeting people from other margins or from the main picture and the picture meet, meeting people in the margins and that can help to enrich people. So being marginal can also be very helpful for those who are in the picture. Next one, please. So, accepting marginality from both sides, that's to say, those in the picture accept that there are people in the margins, gives an obligation. So there is a moral obligation as well in being marginal to really take care of those in the margin, and that goes specifically for those in the picture. Next one, yes. Then you discover, hopefully, that of course we all share common interests, and that is part of our, let's say, European tradition, and I think that's a very important aspect of this project, I'll come back to that later, that this common interest is really addressing the notion of democracy, that you are, are really given the freedom and to uh, uh, discuss issues and make them known to others, and also have your own voice heard, that you can do the things you think are relevant, and that you can think the things that you are, the things that you think relevant. And finally, addressing marginality. And that has been done in this project in very different ways, in a very surprising and a very moving way sometimes, because it shows that if you address the marginality, either from within the margins or from within the picture, it helps to empower people. And empowerment is helpful for everybody. Okay, next one, please. Now I return. Now I turn to the, the project itself, the Hamas project, and I will discuss three main aspects: the purpose, its content, and the project as project. As to the purpose, next one. Next one, please. Oh, I already did it. Yeah, yes. No, the next one. Oh, that's it. Yes. Um, I think the, the purpose of the project, first of all, is giving a voice to marginal persons and groups, but not only a voice, but also making them powerful to empower their opportunities and to really give them ways and meanings to, to really make themselves heard and to participate in this greater picture. Next one, please. So empowering marginal persons and groups is the second step. It's not only let, let, let's hear to them, but also let's help them. Let's help those people become uh, what they are and appreciate and uh, also uh, evaluate what they are contributing to our society at large. Third one, please. And I think that's the most important thing. It's not only empowering the marginal people and the person. Just think of you in those of the picture. Well, of course, when you are not only looking at marginal people and persons, you also have to adjust the view of those in the pitch who are not in the margin because they have to have a to generate a good look and a good appreciation of those in the margins, not being some groups outside society, but very much in society. Next one, please. And of course, that's essential in this project. You use art as a tool to make all this happen. Next one, please. I already said it's in a European context, when especially you are talking about democracy, which is a consequence or one of the, let's say, key values of Europe uh, that also, well, challenges us, but also uh, urges us to have different perspectives. And that should be honored, really taken care of. Next one, please. And to have this common insights in what's happening is, I think, also very essential for a project like this. And finally, it has already been discussed by Andrea, 
forward to the, the final wordings of those uh, papers. The next one, please. Is of course to change policy, at least to have influence on policy, and to have also, let's say, changes in the attitudes of everybody in the picture. When I look at the content, next one, please. First, we have this issue of marginality. I already discussed it, and I think maybe when you are going on with a project like this, um, generally speaking, you can say there are three types of marginality, and maybe it's better, or at least more effective, it's the better word, to concentrate on either the sociological point of view, that is, a group is considered marginal because they are not part of the let's say the picture, the main group, it's either a physical or mental, personal, individual issue that is happening to the person and who the person that cannot, well, that you cannot take being the personal, it's befallen to that person, that was the word I was looking for. And the third one is the social marginalization that is not related to the group, but you become part of a group because you are getting older or you are losing your job uh, or you are whatever marginalized during your lifetime but uh, it's not it's not related firstly of all to your sociological position or to your physical or mental uh, restrictions or possibilities next one please <coughs> The second issue I think was very interesting, very important also to ask what, what will happen in the future with a project like this. Uh, I found several art forms, theatre, visual arts and photography, and also interestingly film, video. Uh, the good thing, uh, well of course you are comparing different types of art, and the main question I have then is of course, which art form is more effective or what makes art form more effective with regard to a specific type of marginality or addressing this marginality. Um, I just make one remark on the visual art aspect of topography because there I thought very interesting intriguing notion of the slowness taking your time to make analog photography which I think is, is a very good one because in these modern days we live very much in a very speeded up society. But I think taking your time is essential in art. And I think learning to take your time, for instance, by using photography in the old analog way, is giving you the opportunity to really think, how am I going to give form to what I want to communicate, which is what all is all uh, art is all about. The next slide, please. Another issue that came to my mind and I wondered uh, is, of course, the difference in educational settings. It can be in school, it can be in a museum, it can be out of school, and it can also be one or another type of community art. And I think each educational setting demands for its own initiatives, its own maybe if you own art forms or at least approaches. So you are mixing quite an enormous diversity in educational sit settings and art forms, which makes it difficult to say, OK, what was effective in what way? Because there is a little comparison. It's either theater, theater in out of school, visual in a museum, uh, or you're working in nature, but then kind of doing a kind of uh, performance like activities so there's an enormous diversity which makes it difficult for people outside this project to really understand why this diversity in settings and why this diversity in art forms and what does it prove and the last one please well that has to do with research and of course this is from my point of view, a very essential one, because this is the argument to have this project, to do research. And the main question you have to ask yourself is what works and why? And this is typically a research question. Actually, what we have been doing is social research, using art as a tool. 
I'm not going to discuss the difference between social research and art research, but actually I want to just posit my point of view that what you have been doing is social research and for very good reasons and with good results. Actually. But doing research, the first question is, normally speaking, what is your theory? And uh, maybe next time, maybe more time should be given to the theory behind what you are doing, because many choices are made, but it's not very clear why. Doing good research has much to do with validity, reliability, and generalizability. And the main problem with a project like this is it has a period of work, but how sure are you that it will be the same when you do it again next year or when you have a follow up? Another issue in project like this is um, that's an, a general problem in art education, uh, I think, is that we are not very keen in formulating a H0 hypothesis. What does happen when we do not change anything in the situation? So we can really compare one situation with the other. Because, of course, when you are acting with people and doing works in art, uh, artistic forms, you will certainly see changes and improvements. But it's very difficult to say, is this the result of the art or is this the result of social attention? Or is this the result of being together? Or is this the result because you give more time, etc.? So from the artistic point of view, I think this is a very important issue because then you can prove that it is art that makes it possible. And then I come to another uh, aspect uh, that maybe also should be taken into account. Can you reach the same goal with other activities with, that are not art? That's to say, for instance, to have building activities or to have sports activities or to have, let's say, totally different activities and compare them and see what ways are more effective uh, either at a practical level and at emotional level, and also with regard to how people look at themselves. So doing research is also seeing what's happening now before you really can say, OK, when I'm going to have an intervention, what is the result and what has been really changed? I also indicated here questionnaires, interviews and observations, the instruments. And it has been uh, brought forward, especially by Milos Rykov, who really gave attention to that aspect uh, of how can we, let's say, quantify quantitative information. The only thing I think in the future that really needs more attention is, are we using the same type of questionnaires and are we analyzing the interviews in the same way so we really can compare observations made in one country or in one situation with observations in another situation. Of course, this leaves open how to score all these observations to make it quantitative, but at least you have to start with the good questions in the first place and share them together. Then, of course, that will result also in a kind of assessment and saying, OK, now we have all this information, how are we coming to a conclusion? Because it's research. You have to arrive at a conclusion and demonstrate the way you did it has been effective, has been less effective, could be more effective compared to other situations. And finally, and that's a general observation, of course, is what have all participants learned from this project. And I think that is an important one, and I was very impressed also by the presentation of leads and also papers. That is what can a project learn about the project itself. And I think it's a very interesting approach that should be advertised more and more. Uh, and is a very, I think, interesting contribution, an unexpected contribution from my point of view, of this project that started with the arts came up with a very interesting idea about how the project learn about a project. OK, next one, please. OK, okay. so to summarize. Coming back to my starting point, is there a contrast between those in the margin and those in the picture? No, 
Yes, because we can all be in the margin and we are sometimes in the picture and the other way around. And I think this contrast should not be seen as kind of, of negative. At least it should be seen as a kind of uh, challenge to all really say, OK, marginalization is as it has also something to tell those in the picture. Second one. Maybe you should concentrate next time on one type of marginality instead of all these marginality. I was impressed by the fact that uh, Roma were investigated, I think, in four countries. And I'm actually looking forward to what makes these four approaches to the Roma culture different or comparable in these four projects. Then you can also start at the European level to communicate and say, OK, with regards to the Roma, it might work better in this country or in that country, or it might work everywhere. I already, the next one please, indicated the issue that you start with good reasons with the art, but how does it relate to non-art interventions? That's a general question, and uh, maybe you can expect such a question or such a remark from those who have paid for this project. The next one, I already mentioned that too, the diversity in art forms is uh, making it difficult. You can, of course, compare all the art forms, but you there are so many different variety, variables there that maybe next time better concentrate on one art form or at least comparison of two. Next one. The variety of tools. Maybe it should be also thought about that there are more common methods a kind of really agreement on what are the type of tools we are using to get the research results. Instead of one intervention, which is, let's say, normal, and which is happening often, I personally would prefer also to have parallel interventions. Two things at the same time, same aspect, but in different ways, in different countries, etc. so that you really can start comparing. Only having one intervention is you cannot compare it. That's to say you cannot see what's the result of the intervention with regard to what all the uh, other factors that are influencing the intervention are also contributing to the result. And finally, I hope that this project will, will have a follow up. And it has been already mentioned by some. It's for one project in most most cases you have done several projects that generate the first one generated the next one. I think in art education and in projects like this, we are in the need of a longitudinal approach, long term effects, because you can do something, but is it still working after half a year or two years? So this kind of sustainability is also uh, dependent on, on in getting insight in how long does it sustain. OK. Well, this was a, a, a saying I found in one of the projects, and I think this is a very good one. So it's not about our disabilities here or our, let's say, marginality. It's about us as individuals. And that brings me to the final slide. Thank you. Uh, no, Sophie, you are welcome to bring uh, Tijik also. Tijik, you stay with us, right? Yes, yes, yes sure. sure. Just can, can, questions can be asked. So, Sophie will ask you, and Marion, more questions. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think I only have comments, uh, very academically typical of me, uh, that we have a lot of, 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 we have a lot of thoughts in common, and it was very, very, very interesting to listen in to your, to your presentations, uh, especially these things about the often unspoken theories of change that are present in these. Uh, projects, uh, for example, the connection between emotion and uh, knowledge gain, uh, which is not uh, which is not spoken, but it's there as an idea that emotion will lead to knowledge gain, and knowledge gain will lead to behavioral uh, uh, differences uh, or changes. 
of course, uh, to be the party pooper as the so sociologist, we also know uh, <laughs> that there is a, a, a distressing lack of connection between knowledge and action behavior, uh, which is uh, exemplified by the climate uh, change, for example, and our inabilities to change our behaviors, uh, despite the very, very, very uh, obvious knowledge about what is happening. Uh, also, that the issue of um, uh, marginalization as having an origin, uh, which might actually be those who are in the picture. Uh, that for I think, for example, Malta was very uh, the Malta experiments and, and the test beds that art was used as a way to speak about political issues. Uh, and that these people are not marginalizing themselves. They are not responsible for their position. They are be being marginalized by something and someone. So uh, it would be very interesting for me, at least, if is there a possibility for to use the arts as a method to target racists, for example, instead of those who are uh, uh, facing racism? Would it be possible to target those who are exploiting land instead of those who are reacting to the exploitation of land. Uh, th these are like just interesting questions to think about what is possible to do. Uh, and also, uh, I guess uh, this model that you were presenting, like on the right side, we have the Amas, what we have done and, and, and the kind of uh, character of, of our project and that uh, a, a, a future project to think about maybe using one art form on one form of marginalization, uh, which could then be done parallel in different nations and then be much more comparable. And maybe also in contrast to non art forms, because I found it also very interesting in this presentation from Portugal about uh, the unemployed and where they were talking about, well, what mattered to me was coming together doesn't that mean that maybe the arts wasn't that important? Maybe they could have come together via sports or via cooking or via just, I don't know, watching, doing something. So what is the, how can we pinpoint the exact meaning of what the arts is doing here? Or, or, or could we accept that maybe the arts is just one possible tool for achieving? these things uh, and also uh, are, are we are we are we comfortable with the idea of the arts as a tool are we can I add something yes, yes. Um, what I thought about while you're speaking Diderik is um, we are talking about communication and what you did with your project or what you do is a cross-cultural communication because you are working with uh, marginalized groups, but these groups are not only from the same country. The group are immigrants and other people. So that's a kind of cross -common cultural communication. And we, and we learned a lot uh, of the projects, like um, sometimes it's a communication problem, like in the project uh, which you mentioned with the deaf people. I did not know, maybe it's in Austria the same, I will uh, ask a colleague of mine, that um, the skill to understand the written language is not the same as the skill to understand the sign language. A neighbor of mine, he's deaf, he's the whole family staff and we, we communicated um, like sign language as I could, as my skills are, but they also could speak and it was really a pleasure to talk with them because I learned a lot. But that is something um, we learned from these projects. We need art as a kind of communication tool, as I can say it like that, and therefore we um, got a lot of new things we did not know before, but what I miss in the um, articles, if I can say that in this way, is the mention to these things. Maybe these are not the first goals you would like to have, but these are also results you got. And sometimes 
um, the conclusion was a summary of the projects, but sometimes you could add these things, what you are pointed out, what you have found out while doing the project. Unexpected outcomes. Yeah, unexpected outcomes. Yes, yeah. that's the right term. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, yeah, that's the good thing we should not forget by um, analyzing our projects by doing the research, by doing um, the design for the next project, like Diderik mentioned, to do not only one project, to um, do it once more with other groups maybe or in other regions. Well, I, I just want to address, to, to stress or to, to emphasize that uh, this project was very worthwhile thanks to this diversity. And uh, I think it's very good. But of course, this is a diversity that's interesting for the researchers and let's hope for the politicians, but not for the participants. And maybe also less for the researchers in practice for the next case because either they are going forward with their own let's say group marginalized groups of people uh, or they go on with the same type of, of art but i think it might be also interesting to to think about the next project that focuses all the participants on things that are not used to do and then say okay but now we have been doing this with your group and that's very familiar but now compare it with what's happening elsewhere and exchange your experience and try to introduce it in other uh, situations. So that's why I hope for a follow-up is, let's say, more focusing on either type of groups of marginality and and or are for to be used. In, in relation to that, Dirk, uh, what parts of this project do you believe is the most generalizable to other contexts? Oops. <laughs> That's a difficult question. They have, they have, I have come around about uh, 30 or so different projects and they, they all have a very interesting, each of them is, is interesting in itself and can be of worth to others. Uh, it depends a little bit on, on how active you can be and also how effective the art form can be. Uh, the safe answer to your question is that I, I think the deletes it approach is, is interesting for, uh, let's say, audience or uh, outside this community. And the other ones, I think it's more difficult to say, well, this is the best project or this is the most informative one. They all have their own value. That, that makes it problematic to say and also to conclude which one is the best way to do. Would you like to say something about that? Mm, I have um, add three questions by hearing your presentations and um, I would like to share this with you. Um, if you're planning uh, the project, if you're doing the design, um, I think there's a kind of expectation, expectation what you would like to do with the participants. Um, but did you ask or did you get a, an idea what the participants would expect from you, from your project? And the final question, did that fit together? Have you analyzed this in a deep way? I think that would be um, very interesting because you give um, these groups the possibility to be visible by, by exhibition, by um, working in the street, by do mural um, art projects and so on. Now they could not hide anymore because everybody could see what, what they do, what they have done. But um, referring to the expectations, is there a gap between that what you would like to have and what you got? I think that's an excellent question, especially in relation to some of the results that uh, the participants were uh, expressing uh, unease uh, 
oh, I, I didn't like this in the beginning, or oh, I felt shame. Uh, Are there surprises? That, that, shall we open the door? Okay, so the questions targeted our expectations about the project, or, or the question was, was it in line with what the others wanted, the stakeholders? Did they want what we were doing with them? Or did we push our, some of our, our projects on them and then they realized that they liked it? But so how were the expectations, ours and those of our stakeholders? Who would like to answer? Please. Yeah. Who wants to say something? OK, lovely. We have an APEC answer. Uh, I guess uh, in our case, the, the answer is simple. Uh, because we didn't uh, do nothing and not planning nothing before speaking with them, with the stakeholders, and um, I think more important with the, the participants. In all groups, uh, there was um, a first work uh, that we had in, in the PowerPoint that was speak, only speak and listen to them. To, to understand what kind of things they want to do or they would like to do or even if they don't have um, how to say um, things that they want uh, they want to do but don't know how um, how can we artists and the team and research team how can we help them to to find um, a way to get the that um, that skill or that uh, only the experience to do something. I think uh, in the the general four projects from Portugal, I think uh, this was the the easy way because we listened to them before. That's wonderful. So we had needs analysis in many projects. And that's how, for example, in Hungary, I, I'm going to give you to you in a moment. In Hungary, for example, it turned out that the biggest problem that perhaps the arts can help solving was that disadvantaged children are not verbalizers and our educational system is verbal. So and they fail. Well, 80% fail because they don't grasp what are being said on the lessons of mathematics, science and biology, whatever. So the needs analysis said, OK, do something. And scientific visualization was an evident response that we could use. And now to the Charles University. Yes, regarding uh, stakeholders, in the beginning of the project, we asked questions or we indicated that there are gaps in communication, in institutional communication in our faculty, but also in National Gallery, in the Museum of Decorative Arts. And there are no links between those institutions who should collaborate uh, as culture and educational institutions and also on governmental level. So I would like to ask to of our stakeholders if they come to the project with any kind of expectations and if something changed now. Mirka. Just to, uh, to explain for those who are viewing us on the internet, now we have a stakeholder from Charles University who was invited by the chief investigator to respond. If your needs were met. It's quite uh, interesting situation, yeah, because uh, in fact, when uh, at the beginning the project was was several years ago presented to us, we recognized that it's not only about art education, yeah, and uh, because it was at the, also in time of COVID, yeah, so we we uh, we saw how difficult was something to do at this time with such complicated problem. But what was very well explained us that uh, this is a chance to start to solve through art 
art activities. Also something what is very actual in society, in the society, yeah. For example, the Roman, Roma, uh, my, my minority problem, which is very strong in our country. Yeah? So it was uh, uh, very interesting to know that uh, it, it is um, art, art uh, teachers, art uh, teacher educators who and uh, their colleagues who would like to contribute to this. It was a big challenge. We had no idea how to help them, yeah, because it's very, uh, very complicated. But what I can uh, say that um, what they presented later, we could see that it's not only methodology how to to uh, apply teacher education or develop, improve teacher education with some people. But uh, I would like to uh, say that what is uh, today in this meeting very inter interesting for me, but that I also saw in not case of my colleagues, but in general in this project, that maybe the participants who produced very interesting art products, artifacts and, and spent a lot uh, of wonderful time, that maybe that they didn't expect it, that it is a way how to, to solve their problem. Yeah, uh, so the missing strong bridge between two ideas, which maybe is now time to to improve. So not being able to solve their problems. What does it mean? Uh, it means that maybe there were interesting products, activities and uh, time which spent, for example, people who are on the uh, this minorities, but maybe there must be a big step that it really helped them to do something in their life uh, newly or society will find a way how to solve, help them. Yeah, and what about the institution? In my case, I am not afraid because we are a faculty of education and I know that my colleagues on institutional level will be able to implement it in life in teacher education. Yeah, as I told uh, in our session, uh, we know that there are many departments and people who would like to join uh, um, and who would like to contribute after after the project. Yes. Yeah. And introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Miroslava Chernochova and I am from the Department of IT and Technical Education and I uh, many, many years collaborate with people from the Department of Art Education. Excellent. So this was the check answer to uh, what helps and how stakeholders perceive our um, collaboration. And it was this interesting what Christina said that of course, it doesn't change your life. It may change a little, though. Um, valuing yourself and self-assertion, thinking of you as a valuable member of society. It was mentioned by a lot of people here. I think it's it's important somehow. I'm always talking about cognitive development, my favorite hobby horse. But here I actually learned from you how much self-worth may be important for these marginalized groups and here we have the Maltese group to respond. Okay, um, in in the case of Fakatain, um, all of a sudden, um, I didn't choose the group by chance. Um, a friend of mine used to go to this active aging center and she was doing this poetry class with um, a group of elderly people and they like to do theater skits and they were always telling her let's do some theater let's do some theater and she had contacted me and she said would you like to do come and do something with these with these women um, not all the people who eventually joined were in the poetry group but they knew each other and they used to do small things in theater. 
And uh, I think through the ethics protocol that we did, we gave them, we, um, before starting, we made it clear that they could get out of this if they wanted to. Though we pleaded to them by telling them, listen, if you drop out, you will be letting the others down. Um, we went in there basically to give them an experience in theater. We only had the title. It was just the trigger. The title we gave them was a trigger. Um, all of a sudden, it could, I mean, it could refer to anything all of a sudden. In the case of COVID, all of a sudden COVID and, you know, life suddenly ch changes, it stops, um, relatives die. And in the case of people who are seniors, um, uh, one of the people had a stroke, it changed her life completely. One had cancer, it changed her life completely. One lost her partner and son in a matter of six months. That changed her life completely and she had a depression. Um, and which incidentally she spoke to us about and because of that we actually changed the rehearsal time which is not a small change because we had to find another place to work in. And essentially we worked with what they gave us. And they were free to give us what they felt safe sharing. In the case of the seniors, I think they actually liked the, pop the popularity that this gave them. I mean, they, they were speaking on television, national television, interviewed there, and they loved it. I mean, if I show you the interviews, you can see they're all smiles, they're so happy, you know, and everyone in the village now is recognizing them. They became stars. In the case of Positivi, for example, there, um, none of the people who were HIV positive had any inclination to take part, as in perform, because they knew of the stick, they were very conscious of the stigma that people HIV, uh, that society had, uh, how, how society viewed people with HIV. And therefore, uh, and what they wanted was that people became aware that you don't die by kissing somebody. You don't get AIDS by kissing somebody who is HIV positive. They wanted the society to get the knowledge because really and truly, even us, I, I think I learned a lot through Positivi. There were a lot of things I didn't know about HIV positive people and how normal their life could be. And yet they didn't want their, shape, their faces to show. And therefore we got the professional actors. So that's my thought about that. I think Milos had something. Milos um, Rajkov uh, from Malta team. Uh, I was involved mainly in uh, evaluation of uh, test bed studies in uh, Malta and I highly appreciate uh, comments from uh, the previous presentation uh, related to methodology that I would like to answer and clarify our attempts uh, to address some of uh, mentioned uh, issues. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't uh, take notes uh, during your uh, presentations and comments but I think it is good because my answer will uh, last uh, quite long. And uh, thanks to my uh, limited memory, I probably won't answer all your uh, comments. Uh, but first of all, uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, participants uh, opinions about the effects of uh, AMAS uh, case study. Uh, we were uh, concerned, very concerned at the beginning. Uh, and the first impression was concerning. We had, uh, we had uh, a section in all uh, test bed studies relate uh, in initial uh, pre-test, pre-evaluation, uh, examination, data collection uh, about their expectation from socially engaged arts and expectations were very high. 
when we conducted uh, post assessment, there were no improvements. We expected, we wanted to see is uh, can we improve with participation uh, their uh, evaluation of socially engaged arts, but we obtained very similar results, uh, uh, very similar to the initial uh, measurement. After thinking about and discussing as a team uh, about, about uh, results, we concluded that it is basically good that we uh, results that we didn't have significant changes. First of all, the nature of quantitative studies, measurements of attitudes uh, is limited by scales. They cannot go beyond what we needed to uh, uh, use as comparable scales at the beginning and, and at the end. Uh, and basically results are positive. Answer to your comments about participants' uh, expectations and uh, perception post uh, uh, performance, post their participation, I would say was highly positive. Also, regarding your, your comments about uh, reliability and uh, that is the key validity of uh, the, our instruments uh, that we applied, we had this in mind and thought very hard about this and hopefully we came uh, to um, solution acceptable at this level of development of social sciences. We used mixed methods uh, approach and I would add, add something like now uh, to uh, the title that I included integrated uh, mixed method approach that we designed uh, to for all our uh, data collections to have comparable questions in qualitative and quantitative uh, components and also through different segments of populations participants uh, participants, visitors, uh, and also through different case studies, case studies, test bed studies that uh, demonstrate high level of consistency of our findings, as well as comparison between uh, initial, pre, uh, pre assessment, post assessment, and participants. All this we integrated in comparable part. And regarding longitudinal uh, component uh, that you mentioned, that is highly relevant, and longitudinal approach is one of the strongest uh, approaches that provide the strongest evidence in addition to uh, randomized experiments. Uh, to some extent, we had this during the length of our project. Uh, unfortunately, only through qualitative uh, component that could be evaluated and Rachel can say something because we had several uh, repeated uh, performances. For example, in um, opening uh, doors uh, test bed study with uh, participants with learning disabilities, we had through few months uh, three uh, presentation, three, three performances, and then one week or two ago when we uh, had interactions again, the team members, grateful, uh, the lead desk, this, and we had very similar or even more positive uh, reactions from the participants. So I would say there was almost a year were close to a year between the time when they uh, participated uh, initially in the test bed study and then last performance that indicated similarity. So it is what I remember, maybe too much. <laughs> Sorry for this, but I had just attempted to answer your very interesting questions and comments. Thanks for that.
Thank you. Thank you very much for the answer. And now I'm giving it back to Sophia how to proceed. Yes, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, we have 15 more minutes and Vidrik might want to respond. Yes. Do you want to or not? You don't have to. I very much agree with what he is saying. I was very happy that at Malta at least there was a methodologist involved, uh, which makes us all aware that when you are doing this kind of social research, which it is impractical, that you really need to be very systematic on the type of information you are gathering. Because uh, personal impressions or personal opinions, also by participants, are very difficult to, to let's say, uh, understand. You are not really making the translation. If what is it really referring to, and how can I compare it? So there's, there's a translational problem in what the person is saying and what it's really meaning. So it is a very methodological problem uh, that hopefully can be solved by having more methodological approaches and then generate information that is also more understandable for people outside our community to see how effective have your research be. Uh, I would like just to ask, ask something uh, that is extremely important that I think uh, should be included, considered as inclusion in uh, summary or conclusions recommendations for policy makers uh, regarding AMAS and similar social engaged projects, longitudinal approach. Uh, the type or structure of fundings of research study usually don't provide opportunity to researchers to continue work on their work. As you uh, certainly know, everybody here knows, how much time is required to design study, to obtain approvals, to collect data and analyze data. All this require continuous funding. We would be very happy to continue uh, with longer longitudinal studies, but it is something maybe that then can we uh, recommend to policy makers to have in mind uh, longitudinal studies that uh, at the large scale existed in some uh, uh, core studies, uh, key studies uh, say in psychology, sociology, but also let's say in Canada in on lifelong learning, there were four waves of studies that were funded by national agency. So that could be uh, something that uh, inf should inform uh, scientific policy and funding. Yes, and quite luckily we in Hungary have such, and we start publishing right now, namely the Moholy Nagy, Laszlo Moholy Nagy may ring a bell. Uh, the, uh, Moholy Nagy Visual Modules is the name of our project that finished last year, and it is about teaching the uh, visual language of the 21st century. We had four modules for different thematic areas, we had four grades and it was a longitudinal study lasting five years altogether. And now we are starting, uh, starting pop to publish the results of the tests and qualitative measures. So yes, sometimes you have a chance and, and you're very right. This is what we, that we should have more often. And I think, Sophia, it is in our white paper, isn't it? Yes. This is something that we recommend in our white paper. And also as a result uh, of this um, project, we also recommend that if you want to implement social uh, research methodologies into artistic projects, you need someone responsible for that part, which maybe should not be the artist. So they can concentrate on the artistic part of the project and someone else with a different kind of expertise can then do the methodological part. Uh, as you so commendably have done in Malta. We believe that is, is very commendable. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, and, and also this aspect of, of long, long, longitudinal studies, um, because what we, can, what we can sort of measure scientifically 
in these projects does not mean that these are the only effects that exist. They are the ones that we can see with the kinds of methods that we have. But one thing that we cannot measure is, for example, longitudinal in the type of, of maybe 10 years or 20 years. These are things that we cannot measure. So, but that doesn't mean that these effects does not exist. So we mustn't confuse the actual effects with the measured effects. Uh, there are things that we can see and say, but there, there, there are things that we cannot do and see and say. So we mustn't um, confuse reality with methodology. Uh, but uh, Diederik, uh, were there any uh, aspects of this project that surprised you or gave you an aha moment? <laughs> oh, we cannot hear him. He's muted. Can you, uh, can you, uh, yes? Yes, somebody <laughs> muted me. I didn't. <laughs> OK, uh, well, it was, it was very interesting to read all these different papers and each time it was a surprise, the approach taken and the, the subject and also the type of, let's say, marginal groups that were addressed. And I think that that's also the kind of confusing and frustrating aspect that they are all interesting and relevant in themselves. And uh, so I would to continue also to, to add to what has been said just before is that please go on with your, let's say, national or local uh, activities, but make it longitudinal in itself. And uh, that, then we come up with more surprising things in the long term. Do you have any more comments or questions, Maria? No, but uh, by um, reading my remarks, which I did today, um, I would like to mention Portugal once more because um, I think, Christina, you said creating bonds is more important as getting results. But I think this is also a result to um, creating bonds. This is something uh, we recommend to our students when they are going to school. They have to um, build a bond between them and their students, not only to go in there with tasks, but without um, this bond, they can't reach them, I think. So I don't know if you see it like the same, but this one is very important for me, this um, sentence or this argument. Thank you for that. Well, actually, it was me that said that sentence <laughs> of creating uh, bonds. I'm, I'm uh, sorry, but Portugal oh, was oh, no, too. No, well. no, it's, it's the same thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just going to. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to comment on. Oh, again. Hello. Oh, for the internet and everyone on the internet, welcome to a mass conference. I'm Abel. So, okay, we're same from none. Oh, it's quite a compliment to think I'm from Malta, but no, I'm from Portugal. <laughs> Portugal. <laughs> well, um, regarding the group from Gaia, I think that art is a tool, actually, um, because uh, for me to use art as um, a, a, me a mean to do something, first they have to understand what art is. So I have to create a language. It's like, for example, uh, a martial art for you to practice, for example, Aikido or Judo or whatever that you want to practice with another person or a group of people. You first need to establish a form of language. They need to understand that um, you have to move your left foot or your right foot. They need to understand the movement in the space. They have to understand how two people can create a dialogue without saying a word, just movement. They have to learn how to breathe properly and so on. With the Gaia group, that sort of happened because um, uh, when I started with the group, I was full of expectations to create awesome things with them. And then uh, through many conversations with Angela, um, I realized that I was putting my own expectations on the group instead of letting the group be themselves. Because on the first uh, session, I asked them, what, uh, so what do you want to do? And they told me, well, I don't know. 
because it's not expected for a session for the people as a group to decide anything. So it was very awkward because uh, we spend, I don't know, maybe one hour just looking at each other and sharing uh, life experiences and so on. And art was never um, uh, relevant in that session, for example. But even uh, using video or photography, they didn't consider video and photography as an art form. They just saw it as video and as photo, which is quite interesting as well. So they see it as a tool to an end, to create a, a, a Facebook profile or to create a LinkedIn profile or to create um, a, a resume, that sort of thing. And uh, so in this group in particular, I think that art was um, used and abused as a tool. Sorry for the presence, uh, but um, uh, I think it worked because they created bonds with each other. They, they became friends, they, they started to help each other. And for me, that was m more important than they actually understanding what art is. Uh, I think in this group in particular, it was far more important, even if for me, it was very frustrating. <laughs> but uh, as a group, it was really, really great. It was awesome as a group for me. Uh, it was very frustrating because I couldn't uh, started anything and finished anything that I anticipated because now I'm going to do this, that, oh, it's going to be awesome and I'm going to do an exhibition and wow, nope, nothing, absolutely nothing. What sort of group was that? Oh, the group from Gaia, it was the group from São Félix near the beach at uh, in the north region of Portugal. It was a group of people without a job, basically. And uh, it went from, I don't know, people from 30, 40, 50, from the, um, basically it was a group where the people were selected by this lovely person called Carla. And uh, um, as a psychologist, she chose the each person that she saw that, she saw that was more adequate for this kind of experiment and she chose well, uh, but it was uh, a very um, hard thing to do because you really have to put um, everything that you think you know in how to deal with people outside and just uh, be open and be truthful and humble. Other, if you, if you're not, if you go with a with a preconception or a pre-notion that you know how to do a thing, they simply don't care. They ignore you, even if they are in front of you. They they don't even speak with you. At the moment that you become truly honest and uh, you become um, honest also with yourself, and you show that and you share your experience and you share what is not going well and what's going well, they started to open. It's like they blossom as a group and as individuals. And that worked because the, there was trying to take pictures, to film them, meditation. I also did meditation, Aikido. Uh, I tried to do origami, for example. I tried everything. Um, and I think in a sense, it, it did not went so well in the art perspective, but in the sense of creating a sort of a tight group or a community inside a group where the responsible, the, the major responsible was art, it was a success. A success. Hi, it's not success. <laughs> success. As I, I'm, I'm a, sorry, success. That word, yay. <laughs> So, so, it was an awesome experience. That that's what I meant. Uh, I think Carla wants to um, want to. I try. Oh, she, if I okay. can, you translate. Uh, I would like to comment before you start. Okay. 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 Folks, we have fifteen minutes, and then. Champagne. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Uh, I would not. I would not agree with your conclusion that that was not uh, great 
uh, work, uh, I would I believe that it is uh, the approach, uh, the best approach, and maybe one of surprising results uh, from a mass project that we should be flexible. What you were doing basically was flexibility, offering different forms of arts to your participants that uh, they can easier accept rather than following our expectations. What would work? Uh, basically, what you've done uh, is uh, more uh, 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 user-focused uh, user, uh, approach that should be used. That's wonderful, user-focused approach. And perhaps now, Dietrich, you can see why we couldn't evaluate and compare. Because the groups were so different, we could all choose, choose our stakeholder group. We could all choose people we were going to work with. They were different in age, in background, in whatever, in their motivation, okay? So, what we heard, yes, you can, yes, you can. And then I go, go to APEC, the yes. Uh, okay, so we were different, and now we are going to hear psychologist view. I just want to say that most of you say A, B, E, C, V, and it seems like the music. Da, 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 da. A, B, A, C, V. So it's APEC. It's easier okay. to say. APEC. Okay, I try yeah, to talk in English. Uh, these people uh, are people who. Um, or benefits the social answers uh, income, okay? Uh, and Sophia, when you said why, uh, why do, don't cookie or s make anything, this is the, the difference. Uh, you cook, uh, you, you make a lot of sections without another things, but heart, no. You don't have a sex. Um, art is the difference. Uh, I think because it's important for for them make uh, another make something we never make you never ever says uh, and I think this uh, for this key is a success. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good reflection. That's a that was a good reflection. We hear another one from APEC, right? <laughs> APEC the. Yeah. <laughs> so let me try if I can see, uh, I can say everything in um, short words. I am from the same team of from Abel and I'm not uh, agree with him. I'm agreeing with the uh, Mythos, uh, Milos. Why? Because um, um leads uh, leads uh, team the, the the conclusion of leads with key and reforced and reforced uh, from carpati is in the end uh, using art uh, as sophia asked cooking or whatever in the last now we are all friends so the 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 aim was not uh, um, having products or uh, objects, and uh, Abel is not to be, or even in um, a few moments, to be frustrating, because he aims the principal objective. They are all together, they are friends, and they had a great moment. Um, uh, okay, just one more sentence, and then I'll come back. Sim, um, no nosso grupo uh, tivemos a, a situação de muitas vezes falarmos com as pessoas e dizer-vos, perante a, as visitas aos museus, vocês a me estar aqui, a me ser artistas aqui. E eles muitas vezes olhavam para nós e diziam, não, isso é impossível. E quando nós íamos que íamos criar canecas, jarras, azulejos e ainda íamos beber café com eles, com as canecas deles, eles eh, pensavam, não, isso é impossível. Quando montámos a exposição e eles viram que afinal eles são artistas, afinal eles conseguem, afinal é possível, tornamos-nos como uma família, como uma união. 
Um, sound good. Sound good. <laughs> the energy. Uh, uh, Carlos said that uh, the, the the people at the beginning um, they want to do things. They 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 speak uh, with us. They want uh, to to make, for example, for example, uh, ceramic, but they don't believe they can. And Carlos said you can. You probably can have the exhibition, and you can have a mag and drink coffee with ER mag. They say that's not possible, but in the end it was possible. Okay, so this is what we call empowerment in the beautiful papers that we write about our project. <laughs> yeah, I'm just yes, going to yes, make I'm, a... I'm carrying it back to Sophia. Oh, I actually have one. <laughs> yeah. And we are wrapping up, right? Yes, we are. I'm, I'm just going to engage in some shameless self-promotion because I just... Uh, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <sighs> I just finished a paper that I'm going to present at the International Conference of Cultural Policy, where I've I've uh, constructed a theoretical model for understanding the prerequisites for successful participatory arts cultural projects. And it reflects very much of what you're saying already. Like the more you focus on finished products, uh, according to the standards of quality and success of the art world, the, the, the more difficult it's going to be to be successful in participatory practice because your trust in the participants ability to give your project or your institution uh, to give it respectability is going to be very low right uh, but the more you focus on the participants and and their perspectives and their worldviews and their expectations and their understandings and their wants and the more you focus on the process the more successful are you going to be because you're going to see participation as a and in itself, not as a means to to make a successful product, such an, an expedition, an, exp <laughs> an exhibition that needs to be sold through tickets. Because then you, you, you need to limit or control participation because the end product needs to be good according to experts. So you're going to control it in ways that, yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Because you had trust in their ability to bring quality to the project. But if you don't, then uh, I've seen a lot of examples of how you you sort of um, you repeat this value of participation as being very important. And then you control participation in ways that limits influence. I've seen this happen very much in, in, in the Swedish context because you don't have a very low trust. Thank you. Last words from our speakers. Yeah. Marion, what are you taking home from here? <laughs> I'm taking home a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, things I've learned from you and your projects. And it is a pleasure for me to be here to join you at this symposium and to get a clue about what you have done the last time and what you will do in further times. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. And it's a pleasure for me. Thank you. Oh, Idrid doesn't see me. So ah, I'm, I'm you have to unmute. You are muted again. Maybe because I was <laughs> not saying a lot. Uh, I just want to add what Sophia said, and I think that's a very important thing to uh, take away also, is this issue or let's say relationship <clears throat> between art and what artists are doing <clears throat> and art education, what art educators are doing. And I think in the latter case, the process of making people aware of the power of art to express themselves, to give form to meaning, that is what they discover and that's the way to express themselves, not to make big or great art, but to learn to use the instruments like a camera into a tool making photos that matter and uh, you should never make this comparison with artists or what's happening in the art world 
because then you always end up with this kind of situation. Well, it's not what you're doing, but it has no quality. Or it's no level. That's not the discussion we should have. And I, I that's that's one of the issues I'm taking with me now from this meeting is that art education has shown itself here in many, many different projects and in a good way because it really is concentrating on what matters for people in this case in a marginal position but i would say it matters for people on the whole page thank you thank you excellent closing words thank you, thank you everyone thank you thank you panel the round table thank you very much audience authors whoever now we are going to toast for amas and we drink to your health to Diedrich. Thank you very much for being with us. And the session for today is finished, but tomorrow at 10, you are expected at the Ludwig Museum. And the address is in your program. 9.30, oh, sorry, 9.30 then, so that you can go in before the crowd. You're right. So whatever Jofia says, because it's her, her show tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. 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 <laughs>